Once, men turned their thinking over to machines in the hope that this would set them free. But that only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. greatest sci-fi series ever written. The story of Dune spans over the course of 5,000 years in six novels titled Dune, Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, God Emperor of Dune, Heretics of Dune, and Chapter House Dune. In Dune, the essentially superhuman all-female order known as the Bene Gesserit have been active for thousands of years. Through selective breeding, they carefully honed their abilities. The ultimate goal of the Bene Gesserit was to produce the Kwisatz Haderach, the super being of the universe, a male Bene Gesserit with perfect sight of the future and the past. He would be able to look where they could not. And he did come, though not as they expected. The planet Arrakis, also known as Dune, is the only planet in the known universe where the spice melange is found. The spice is a drug that is used throughout the Imperium for various purposes, mainly its geriatric properties. The spice is life and can more than double the human lifespan. In some special people, such as the highly trained Bene Gesserit Reverend Mothers, the spice melange can awaken prescient vision, sight of the future. The spice also heightens awareness and is used by the guild as a means for space travel, gifting them with prescience which they use to navigate. The spice melange is the gasoline of the universe. Without it, all comers throughout the known inhabited galaxies would cease. The spice melange is also highly addictive. Once addicted, one must continue taking the spice or else they will suffer spice withdrawals, which are always fatal. The spice, he said, it's in everything here. The air, the soil, the food, the geriatric spice. It's like the truth sayer drug. It's a poison, she stiffened. His voice lowered and he repeated, a poison so subtle, so insidious, so irreversible, it won't even kill you unless you stop taking it. We can't leave Arrakis, unless we take part of Arrakis with us. Before the events of Dune, the fiefdom of Arrakis rested with the Baron Harkonnen, the sworn enemy of Duke Leto Atreides of the planet Caladan. But when the Emperor of the Imperium, Shaddam Carino IV, felt threatened by the Atreides' influence and potential power, he devised a plan to rid himself of House Atreides. He used the feud between the Harkonnens and the Atreides as cover. After the fiefdom of Arrakis is handed over to House Atreides, which includes Leto, his concubine the Bene Gesserit Lady Jessica, and their son Paul Atreides, as well as the many servants, specialists, and teachers that were in their service, the Harkonnens with the help of the Emperor's Sardaukar soldiers stage a coup, Paul and Jessica manage to escape into the deep desert, and Leto is captured, presumably to be killed. Paul and his mother Jessica must then use their Bene Gesserit training and secret knowledge to survive in the harshest conditions possible, and along the way they gain the support of the Fremen people of the desert. As I said before, the Lady Jessica is a Bene Gesserit. She was trained in the Bene Gesserit way by the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohayim. 
when the Bene Gesserit Order realized that Duke Leto of Caladan required a concubine. They used their considerable influence to make sure the Lady Jessica was chosen. The Atreides bloodline contained genes that were highly important to the sisterhood. Jessica's orders were to bear only daughters to the Duke Leto. Jessica would prove to be insubordinate. Instead, she bore a son and trained him in the Bene Gesserit way, whilst at the same time his father, the Duke, was having him trained as a Mintat. The Mintat are the human computers of the Imperium, capable of incredible feats of calculation in milliseconds. Paul was already the result of millennia of selective breeding at the hand of the Bene Gesserit. This coupled with his training, he was something more than a Bene Gesserit. Much more. By mistake, a generation too soon, the Bene Gesserit had birthed the Kwisatz Haderach, the universe's super being, he who could be in many places at once, he with perfect vision. But there was still uncertainty. To unlock his full potential, Paul would need to be tested by the Truthsayer drum. There is a place where no Truthsayer can see. We are repelled by it, terrorized. It is said a man will come one day and find in the gift of the drug his inward eye. He will look where we cannot, into both feminine and masculine past. Your Kwisatz Haderach? Yes. The one who can be in many places at once. The Kwisatz Haderach. Many men have tried the drug so many, but none has succeeded. They tried and failed? All of them? Oh no! She shook her head. They tried and died. Deep in the desert, as Paul ingests more of the spice than he has ever had, his initial powers awaken. He knows that one day the Fremen people of the desert will look to him as a god. Paul sees a jihad in his name spreading throughout the galaxy like a raging fire, plaguing every inhabited world. The religion of Muad'Dib would spread, leaving millions dead in its wake. Paul knew that he was powerless to stop it. The inevitability of the jihad haunts Paul throughout the series. Paul and Jessica would have never survived in the desert and gone on to liberate the Fremen people and gain vengeance for House Atreides, unseating the Emperor of the Imperium, if not for the planning of the Bene Gesserit Order. The Missionara Protectiva, also called the Bene Gesserit's Black Arm of Superstition, is a special kind of religious engineering created by the Bene Gesserit to sow seeds of superstition in developing cultures throughout the galaxy. The Missionara Protectiva was used by the Sisterhood on Dune centuries before House Atreides gained the fiefdom. They sowed legends telling that the son of a Bene Gesserit woman would lead the Fremen people to true freedom. So when Paul and Jessica arrived, they fit the legends exactly. They were viewed as legendary figures. The Fremen people named Paul Lison al Gaib the voice from the outer world. He would fulfill their ancient prophecy. The Fremen people never knew just how much their myths and legends were influenced by the workings of the Sisterhood. In the end, Paul Atreides would rise to emperor of the known Imperium, marrying the Princess Irulan Carino, daughter of the Emperor Shaddam IV. Jessica, now a reverend mother, chose to return to Caladan, leaving Aaliyah, the child of Duke Leto who was born in the deep desert, behind. Aaliyah was pre-born, breaking into consciousness with all the memories of her ancestors due to her mother's consumption of the Truthsayer drug. To the Bene Gesserit, such a child is an abomination. Aaliyah, in many ways, was more unexpected than even Paul himself. Born of the same genetic lines, 
Aaliyah was supposed to be Jessica's first child, unremarkable but for the precious genes she carried. But the sisterhood never intended for Jessica to be on Arrakis, much less undergo the spice agony while pregnant. The result was a child that could strike fear into the hearts of even the reverend mothers of the Bene Gesserit. That child is an abomination, the old woman said. Her mother deserves a punishment greater than any in history. Death, it cannot come too quickly for that child or the one who spawned her. The old woman pointed a finger at Alia. Get out of my mind! TP? The emperor whispered. He snapped his attention back to Alia. By the Great Mother, you don't understand. Majesty, the old woman said, not telepathy. She is in my mind. She is like the ones before me, the ones who gave me their memories. She stands in my mind. She cannot be there, but she is. What others? The Emperor demanded. What is this nonsense? The old woman straightened, lowered her pointing hand. I have said too much, but the fact remains that this child who is not a child must be destroyed. Long were we warned against such a one and how to prevent such a birth, but one of our own has betrayed us. Though Paul married Irulan, his concubine Chani, a Fremen woman, was his true love. She bears Paul two children, Leto II, named for Paul and Aaliyah's father, and Ganima, whose name meant spoil of war. Leto II would go further than even Paul would, and his influence would echo to the edges of time itself. The Spice Melange is produced by the great sandworms of Arrakis. If they should die, then all spice production would cease. The sandworms are monstrous beings that roam in the deep desert. They attack all rhythmic motions, such as footsteps or the rumbling of spice harvesters. The worm is now beneath the crawler, Kind said. You are about to witness a thing few have seen. Flecks of dust shadowed the sand around the crawler now. The big machine began to tip down to the right. A gigantic sand whirlpool began forming there to the right of the crawler. It moved faster and faster. Sand and dust filled the air now for hundreds of meters around. Then they saw it. A wide hole emerged from the sand. Sunlight flashed from glistening white spokes within it. The hole's diameter was at least twice the length of the crawler, Paul estimated. He watched as the machine slid into that opening in a billow of dust and sand. The hole pulled back. Gods, what a monster, muttered a man beside Paul. In the book Children of Dune, Leto II joins with the sand trout, the protoform of the sand worms, transcending his own humanity. Over the course of 3,500 years, Leto morphs into the God Emperor, the closest thing to a deity that mankind has ever seen. Through the Golden Path, Leto leads humanity to its salvation, preventing Kralizek, the mythic battle at the end of time that both he and his father foresaw. Leto transformed Arrakis. The great worms died, stopping spice production. Space travel was prohibited without the permission of the god Emperor. The Imperium was at peace. All spice was rationed by Leto himself. Leto ruled the universe with a firmer grasp than anyone before him. His powers of prescience far outshined those of his father. His genetic memory allowed him to reach back and see through the eyes of his ancestors. Billions of lives lived in him at all times. With an iron fist, Leto the Tyrant would teach humanity a lesson on stagnation. When I set out, to lead humankind along my golden path. I promised them a lesson that their bones would remember. I know a profound pattern which humans deny with their words even while their actions affirm it. 
They say they seek security and quiet, the condition they call peace. Even as they speak, they create the seeds of turmoil and violence. If they find their quiet security, they squirm in it. How boring they find it. Look at them now. Look at what they do while I record these words. Ha! I give them enduring eons of enforced tranquility, which plods on and on despite their every effort to escape into chaos. Believe me, the memory of Leto's peace shall abide with them forever. They will seek their quiet security thereafter, only with extreme caution and steadfast preparation. When the tyranny of the worm god Emperor Leto finally ended, there was a great scattering. Under the rule of the god Emperor, the people of the Imperium lived peacefully, but not happily. Leto had exposed a deep anxiety that existed within all of humankind, a kind of restlessness deep-rooted within a collected human consciousness. When they were finally allowed to travel throughout the universe freely, humanity spread well beyond the reaches of the Imperium, into the vastness of space, ensuring the survival and the diversity of the species. But Leto had done something else to humanity. He had taken over the Bene Gesserit breeding program, but used it for a different purpose. After generations of trying, Leto created Siona. Only she was blocked from his vision. Leto introduced a no-gene into humanity, and following the famine times preceding Leto's death, this gene was spread out through the reaches of space, ensuring that never again could all of humanity be seen by prescience. Leto foresaw an enemy, the Great Enemy, threatening all of humanity, something that would use prescience to seek out and destroy all of humanity. By breeding this no gene, Leto saved humanity from this threat. At his death, Leto II went back into Arrakis, the individual sand trout of his skin separating and returning to the sands. The new worms that would form from them would each have a piece of the god emperor inside. They would be more intelligent and more terrible than the worms of ancient Arrakis. The events of the last two novels in Frank Herbert's original Dune saga take place 1500 years after the death of the god emperor. At this point, the planet Arrakis which had been terraformed by the god Emperor, has returned to desert. The great sandworms have returned and brought with them a new flow of the spice melange. A new civilization has arisen during the chaos of the famine times and the great scattering. This civilization is made up of three major players. The Ixians, whose no ships have the ability to navigate space without the use of spice melange. Alongside the Bene Tleilax, who have learned to create spice within their axolotl tanks, and who have manufactured a new kind of shape-shifting face dancer, and of course, the ever-evolving Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. And it is also at this time, a millennia and a half after the death of Leto II, that some from the scattering began to return. Among them are the honored Matres, a violent matriarchal order of women who were selectively bred and taught powerful skills of combat and gained power through the sexual control of others, especially men. They seek to control the old empire with violent force and gain Bene Gesserit knowledge lost to them. Certain characteristics along with the military and sexual skills possessed by the honored Matres seems to indicate that they are in fact the result of a combination of the fish speakers who were the female servants of the god Emperor Leto II, and the Bene Gesserit who fled out into the Scattering 1500 years earlier. An honored Matre of the Scattering demanded his presence, a Pawinda of Pawindas, 
Descendants of Talaxu from the Scattering had told him all they could about these terrible women, far more terrible than the reverend mothers of the Bene Gesserit, they said, and more numerous, Waf reminded himself. The honored Matres make several attacks on the Bene Gesserit planets throughout the bounds of the old empire, including Lampadus, a world which contained their most prized school. The Honored Matres eventually even scorched the surface of the planet Arrakis itself, killing every sandworm in existence, except for the one the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood escapes with. The worm they had taken contained a pearl of the god Emperor Leto II's awareness. In response to the destruction caused by the Honored Matres, the Bene Gesserit, now led by Dari Odraid, a descendant of Paul Atreides, continues to develop her plan to defeat the Honored Matres. The Bene Gesserit have shielded their secret planet Chapter House behind a wall of no ships, which cannot be seen by long-range scans, and also could not be penetrated by the powers of prescience. It is here on the planet Chapter House that they, specifically Shiana Brug, begin to breed the sandworms. By drowning the worm they saved from Arrakis in a mixture of spice and water, they force this creature back into its earlier form. It becomes many sand trout, and so the cycle begins again. The Sisterhood terraforms the planet Chapter House to accommodate the worms. Slowly, Chapter House begins to form into a desert planet, a mirror of what Dune had once been. Shiana was a girl born on Arrakis who discovered at a young age that she had the ability to control the desert worms, who each inside contained a pearl of the god Emperor Leto II. Some said she had been the Sand Rider predicted by Leto II eons ago. At this point, the entire Tleilaxu civilization has been mostly destroyed by the Honored Matres. The only remaining survivor is Saitel, who offers up secret Tleilaxu knowledge to the Bene Gesserit in exchange for protection from the Matres. The Bene Gesserit for the first time now have access to the Tleilaxu secret of Gola production, which they use to produce a Gola of Odraid's father, Miles Tegg, the Atreides military leader who was killed a book earlier after unlocking strange abilities. Agola is a kind of clone. On Chapter House, the Bene Gesserit also keep two prisoners on board a no-ship, a Duncan Idaho Gola produced by the Tleilaxu. This Gola has the memories of all previous Duncan Idaho Golas, knowledge stretching back since the time of Leto I. The Bene Gesserit were interested in the God Emperor's fixation on Duncan Idaho, and Mirbella, a former honored Matre, who the Bene Gesserit have taken as a novice. This Duncan Idaho Gola also has a kind of prescient vision. In it he glimpses an older man and woman staring back at him. He is very confused by the visions he is seeing, but does not mention them to the Bene Gesserit. He wonders about the strange man and woman he had seen. It is revealed in the final two novels that the Honored Matres were fleeing an unknown enemy out of the scattering. The enemy was more powerful and had conquered the Honored Matres' own large empire which had formed in the scattering. It is unclear whether or not this is the great enemy that Leto II foresaw, but it was likely a powerful threat to humanity, nonetheless. In the end, Odraid stages an attack on the Honored Matres, striking the planet Gamu. Victory seems near for the Sisterhood, until the Honored Matres release a powerful weapon brought out of the scattering. A weapon of bloodless death. Odraid realizes the trap too late, and is captured. Mirbella, the former honored Matre, who has shared memories with Odraid, pilots a small craft down to the surface. She uses the chaos to her advantage, telling the Matres that she has escaped the Bene Gesserit and possesses all of their secrets. But when she came face to face with the great honored Matre, now Lagno, she uses the Bene Gesserit power of voice to provoke her. Lagno is easily manipulated due to Mirbella's Bene Gesserit training. Your fluency and lies does not hide them, Mirbella said. She swept a scornful gaze across the ones behind Lagno. Like the ones I know in other memory, you are headed for extinction. The problem is you take so infernally long at dying. Inevitable, but oh, the boredom meanwhile, you dare call yourself great honored Matre, returning her attention to Lagno. Everything about you is a cesspool. You have no style. It was too much. Lagno attacked, left foot slashing outward with blinding speed. Mirbella grasped the foot, 
as she would catch a wind-blown leaf, and continuing the flow of it, levered Logno onto a threshing club that ended with her head pulped on the floor. Without pausing, Mirbella pirouetted, let foot almost decapitating the honored Matre who had stood at Logno's right, the right hand crushing the throat of the one who had stood at Logno's left. It was all over in two heartbeats. Mirbella kills the honored Matre leader Logno, and as was their way, the Matres are forced to accept her as their leader, noting her prowess in combat. Mirbella again shares memories with the dying Odraid, solidifying herself as the reverend mother of the Bene Gesserit, as well as the leader of the honored Matres. Not all Bene Gesserit accept Mirbella's ascension, however. Shiana, who has also shared memories with Odraid before leaving Chapter House, escapes into a no-ship where she has brought some of the new worms which were born from the Chapter House desert. She leaves along with Duncan Idaho, Saitel, and Miles Tegg. Mirbella realizes their plans too late and is unable to intervene. In the final chapter of the Dune series, it is revealed that the man and woman glimpsed in prescience by Duncan Idaho are named Daniel and Marty. The two refer to themselves as face dancers, who for thousands of years had been the shape-shifting minions of the Telaxu, capable of absorbing memories and taking the form of other people. They have had such a hard time accepting that face dancers can be independent of them. I don't see why. It's a natural consequence. They gave us the power to absorb the memories and experiences of other people, gather enough of those, and... It's personas we take, Marty. Whatever. The Master should have known we would gather enough of them one day to make our own decisions about our future. The two hint that they observe and are familiar with various groups in the universe, and for some reason are very interested in capturing and studying the passengers of Duncan's no-ship. The role or purpose of these two was never revealed in Frank Herbert's original six Dune novels. Their technology seems to be almost godlike. Duncan too recognizes them as face dancers, and understands that the two belong to no one but themselves. The final novel in Frank Herbert's Dune series ends on a cliffhanger, for Herbert did not live to complete the seventh novel planned for the series. Several questions are left unanswered. What becomes of the merging of the honored Matres and the Bene Gesserit? What are the fates of those escaping on the no-ship? Who are these godlike characters in Chapter House's final chapter? And of course, what exactly chased the honored Matres back into the old empire in the first place? These are merely the events of the Dune Saga. Dune is a humanist book series that is highly concerned with the cycles of governmental systems Dune shows how the masses can be manipulated through religion and social engineering. Dune explores the damage that can be caused by the joining of government and religious faith. Most of all, Dune exposes the cycles of humanity and the constant structure of giving and taking that is present throughout the universe. In this seven-part series, I will explore all six of Frank Herbert's novels in order deeply delving into the themes and the underlying meanings and guiding you through the most intelligent and well thought out sci-fi series ever written. A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. This every sister of the Bene Gesserit knows. To begin your study of the life of Muad'Dib, then take care that you first place him in his time born in the 57th year of the Padishah Emperor, Shaddam IV, and take the most special care that you locate Muad'Dib in his place, the planet Arrakis. Do not be deceived by the fact that he was born on Caladan, 
and lived his first 15 years there. Arrakis, the planet known as Dune, is forever his place. Ten thousand years before the start of Dune, mankind led a crusade, violently expunging all thinking machines from the Imperium. It was called the Butlerian Jihad, and its chief commandment still remains within their OC Bible. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. The target of the Jihad was a machine attitude as much as the machines, Leto said. Humans had set those machines up to usurp our sense of beauty, our necessary selfdom, out of which we make living judgments. Naturally, the machines were destroyed. The punishment thereafter for owning or developing artificial intelligence was immediate death. The fall of thinking machines would mean that humankind would have to depend on itself for all its computing needs. And this is where Mintats come into play. Mintats are the human computers of the Imperium. Their mental abilities are ultimately honed to the point where they have become superior to even the ancient thinking machines. Most of the great houses rely on Mintats. Mintats possessed powerful calculative abilities, as well as incredible memory and powers of perception. These abilities make Mintats highly useful in logistical operations. Also, Mintat abilities can be greatly increased by the taking of Sappho juice, the substance extracted from the roots found on the planet Echis, but the consumption of this chemical leads to addiction. The Mintat were not the only replacement for thinking machines that developed during the turmoil following the Butlerian Jihad. The Bene Gesserit Sisterhood also came to prominence during this time, as well as the Spacing Guild, whose prescient powers granted by the Spice Melange make safe and instantaneous space travel throughout the universe possible. The Galactic Feudal Empire, which would arise after the Butlerian Jihad, would last for many thousands of years until the rise of the God Emperor. At the start of Dune, the human race has scattered throughout the galaxy and populated many planets, each ruled by aristocratic houses who each owe their loyalty to the Imperial House Carino. Emperor Shadom Carino IV now sits the Imperial throne. In this time, the Lancerad was the group that represented all the great houses throughout the galaxy. Within the Lancerad, the High Council ruled and was overseen by the Emperor. At the start of Dune, the Emperor has grown to fear House Atreides. The Duke Leto Atreides had become more and more popular within the Lancerad, and it was said that the talent of Leto's own fighting force was beginning to rival the Emperor's own dreaded Imperial Sardaukar soldiers. The Emperor Shaddam Carino IV decided that he must do away with House Atreides. The feud between the Atreides and the Harkonnens had been going on for centuries. The Emperor would use this to his advantage. The planet Arrakis was currently lorded over by the genius and despicable Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. With the help of the Baron, the Emperor created a plan designed to trap and eliminate House Atreides. The fiefdom of the desert planet Arrakis, the source of the Spice Melange, had been given over to the Duke Leto Atreides. But the gift was poisoned, and House Atreides expected as much. The Duke Leto Atreides lived the majority of his life on the paradise world of Caladan. In the twenty years prior to the start of Dune, he had ruled over the planet with his concubine the Bene Gesserit Lady Jessica by his side. Jessica was the result of the Bene Gesserit breeding program. The sisterhood had intended to breed her with the Duke Leto and produce a daughter who could then breed with a Harkonnen son. This union, they believed, would produce their Kwisatz Haderach. The Lady Jessica 
was provided with the most advanced Bene Gesserit training available and carried the fate of the sisterhood within her genes. But she betrayed them. Her love for Leto eventually grew so strong that Jessica disobeyed her orders to have only daughters and produced a son, their first child, Paul Atreides. In doing this, Jessica not only disobeyed direct orders from the Sisterhood, she betrayed a general understanding held within the Sisterhood. The Bene Gesserit are beyond love. Love had nothing to do with it. Reverend Mothers did not act from such mundane motives. Love clouded reason. It diverted the sisters from their duties. Love could be tolerated only where it caused no immediate and obvious disruptions, or where it served the larger purposes of the Bene Gesserit. Otherwise, it was to be avoided. Always, though, it remained an object of disquieting watchfulness. A life without love can be devoted more intensely to the sisterhood. Love, damnable love, weakening love. Love leads to misery. The sisterhood had planned to breed Jessica's daughter with a Harkonnen son, uniting the two houses and producing their long-awaited Kwisatz Haderach. But now they would have to adapt their plans. The son, Paul, was raised on Caladan and trained in the Bene Gesserit way. When the sisterhood realized what Jessica had done, they were furious. But the Bene Gesserit adapt, and the boy was either the Kwisatz Haderach, or he was not. Accompanying House Atreides to Arrakis were several servants and teachers, notably Duncan Idaho, Swords Master, Gurney Halleck, War Master, Thufir Howitt, Mintat, and Master of Assassins and Willington Yui, Souk Doctor. The Souk Inter-School is devoted to finding cures for the many ailments that afflict mankind. In the Dune universe, they are widely considered to be superior to all other medical groups. Dr. Willington Yui graduated from the Souk School in 10,112 AG. Through Imperial conditioning, the school renders its students incapable of inflicting harm. Once on Arrakis, House Atreides takes up residence at the home previously occupied by House Harkonnen. It is full of traps, and although Mintat Thufir Howitt locates and disarms most of them, a hunter-seeker attacks Paul in his room and nearly kills him. Paul slipped out of bed, headed for the bookcase door that opened into the closet. He stopped at the sound behind him, turned. The carved headboard of the bed was folding down onto the spot where he had been sleeping. Paul froze, and immobility saved his life. From behind the headboard slipped a tiny hunter-seeker, no more than five centimeters long. Paul recognized it at once, a common assassination weapon that every child of royal blood learned about at an early age. It was a ravening sliver of metal guided by some nearby hand and eye. It could burrow into moving flesh and chew its way up nerve channels to the nearest vital organ. Paul knows that if he calls for help, the device will kill whoever opens the door. He manages to survive the situation by utilizing his unique skill set and ultimately destroying the device. In doing so, Paul also saves the life of Fremen Housekeeper, the Shadowout Mapes, as thanks she gives Paul a valuable piece of information. There is a traitor in their midst, though she could not say who. Duke Leto is furious over the attempt on his 15-year-old son's life. Paul tells his father of the traitor in their midst, and Leto admits to discussing the possibility several times before with the Traides Mintat Thufir Howitt. When speaking with Thufir later, Leto receives another piece of information. A scrap of a letter bearing the Baron Harkonnen's own seal has been discovered, and it seems to identify the traitor. It says, Ato will never suspect, and when the blow falls on him from a beloved hand, its source alone should be enough to destroy him. The note was under the Baron's own seal, and I've authenticated the seal. 
Your suspicion is obvious, the Duke said, and his voice was suddenly cold. I'd sooner cut off my arms than hurt you, Howitt said. My lord, what if... The Lady Jessica, Leto said, and he felt the anger consuming him. Couldn't you wring the facts out of this party? Unfortunately, party was no longer among the living when we intercepted the courier. The courier, I'm certain, did not know what he carried. I see. Leto shook his head, thinking, what a slimy piece of business. There can't be anything in it. I know my woman. My lord, if... No, the Duke barked. There is a mistake here. That we cannot ignore it, my lord. She's been with me for 16 years. There have been countless opportunities for it. You yourself investigated the school and the woman. Howard spoke bitterly. Things have been known to escape me. It's impossible, I tell you. The Harkonnens want to destroy the Atreides line, meaning Paul too. They've already tried once. Could a woman conspire against her own son? In the days before House Atreides left the planet Caladan for Dune, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen Mohiam, came to visit the Lady Jessica. Jessica had betrayed the sisterhood, used her Bene Gesserit skills to bear a son against their orders, and trained him in the Bene Gesserit way. The sisterhood is furious with Jessica for her transgression, but the boy Paul must be tested with the Gom Jabbar nonetheless. The Gom Jabbar, which is also known as the High-Handed Enemy, is a metacyanide poison needle that sits upon a thimble which is attached to a person's fingertip. The Bene Gesserit make use of the Gom Jabbar when they test the humanity of certain people. The device would be held against the person's neck and used as a deterrent for the person backing out of the test. This test would be to find out whether or not a person had enough control over themselves, body, and mind to override their instincts to end their suffering. And the test did involve a great amount of physical suffering. One does not obtain food safety freedom by instinct alone. Animal consciousness does not extend beyond the given moment, nor into the idea that its victims may become extinct. An animal destroys and does not produce. Animal pleasures remain close to sensation levels and avoid the perceptual. The human requires a background grid through which to see his universe. Focused consciousness by choice, this forms your grid. Bodily integrity follows nerve blood flow according to the deepest awareness of cell needs. All things, cells, beings, are impermanent. Strive for flow permanence within. The test of the Gamjabar was so that the Bene Gesserit could find out exactly who Paul Atreides was. Could he control himself in the face of great pain? Was he a liability to the sisterhood and their machinations? Paul was raised outside of their control on the world of Caladan. They needed to test him to find out how they could most optimally use him, or if they even could. There was in fact a possibility that he should be terminated altogether. The Bene Gesserit operate through manipulation. She only gives Paul some of the truth. It is a test of awareness, a test of human will, but it is also so much more. The Reverend Mother is gathering information, creating a profile. The actions of the Bene Gesserit are always layered, and often their simplest of actions possess many significant implications. Paul, in fact, ends up withstanding more pain than any female child before had withstood. Paul passes the test. He is human. The Reverend Mother then tells Paul of the Kwisatz Haderach and of his foretold power, and also of the fact that any man before who has been tested for being the Kwisatz Haderach had died. The Reverend Mother then reveals to Paul and Jessica a terrible prophecy. When you live upon Arrakis, she said, Kala, 
The land is empty. The moons will be your friends, the sun your enemy. Paul sensed his mother come up beside him, away from her post guarding the door. She had looked at the Reverend Mother and asked, Do you see no hope, your reverence? Not for the Father. Helen Mohiam's words seem to suggest that something terrible will befall House Atreides after its arrival on Arrakis, and the Duke will not survive. Leto did not truly believe that Jessica was the traitor. He knew that the letter was merely a ploy by the Baron Harkonnen to wound and confuse House Atreides. Thufir Howitt, however, does not trust Jessica. Jessica discovers Howitt's mistrust of her when a drunken Duncan Idaho stumbles into the Atreides castle and reveals that he too suspects Jessica. The Lady Jessica is shocked and confused by this revelation and attempts to convince Howitt that his beliefs are illogical. Jessica tries to explain that it is more logical to believe that it is the Harkonnens that are making him suspicious of her, but Howitt will not listen. Jessica decides that the only way to convince Howitt that she is innocent is to prove that if she wanted Leto dead, she could have done so long ago. I don't trust your Bene Gesserit motives, he said. You may think you can look through a man. You may think you can make a man do exactly what you... You poor fool, through fear, she raged. He scowled, pushing himself back in the chair. Whatever rumors you've heard about our schools, she said, the truth is far greater. If I wish to destroy the Duke, or you, or any other person within my reach, you could not stop me. And she thought, why do I let pride drive such words out of me? This is not the way I was trained. This is not how I must shock him. How it slipped a hand beneath his tunic, where he kept a tiny projector of poison darts. She wears no shield, he thought. Is this a brag she makes? I could slay her now, but ah, uh, the consequences if I am wrong. Jessica saw the gesture towards his pocket, said, let us pray violence shall never be necessary between us. A worthy prayer, he agreed. Meanwhile, the sickness spreads among us, she said. I must ask you again, isn't it more reasonable to suppose that the Harkonnens have planted this suspicion to pit the two of us against each other? We appear to have returned to stalemate, he said. She sighed, thinking, he's almost ready for it. The Duke and I are father and mother surrogates to our people, she said. The position, he hasn't married you, Howard said. She forced herself to calmness, thinking, a good repost that. But he'll not marry anyone else, she said. Not as long as I live, and we are surrogates, as I've said. To break up this natural order in our affairs, to disturb disrupt and confuse us, which target offers itself most enticingly to the Harkonnens? He sensed the direction she was taking, and his brows drew down in a lowering scowl. The Duke? she asked. Attractive target, yes, but no one, with the possible exception of Paul, is better guarded. Me? I tempt them, surely, but they must know the Bene Gesserit make difficult targets. And there is a better target, one whose duties create necessarily a monstrous blind spot, one to whom suspicion is as natural as breathing, one who builds his entire life on innuendo and mystery. She darted her right hand toward him. You, Howard started to leap from his chair. I have not dismissed you through fear, she flared. The old mint had almost fell back into the chair. So quickly did his muscles betray him. She smiled without mirth. Now you know something of the real training they give us, she said. Howitt tried to swallow in a dry throat. Her command had been regal, preemptory, uttered in a tone and manner that he found completely irresistible. His body had obeyed her before he could think about it. Nothing could have prevented his response, not logic, not passionate anger, nothing. To do what she had done, 
spoke of a sensitive, intimate knowledge of the person thus commanded, a depth control he had not dreamed possible. She had used the Bene Gesserit power of voice on him, forcing him to obey her words. This, however, does not go as planned. Instead of Thufir being more confident in the fact that Lady Jessica is not interested in hurting Leto, Thufir is even more disturbed and considers Jessica even more dangerous than he had before. But Jessica was not the traitor. There is a traitor amongst them, but someone that could have never been suspected. All the while House Atreides had been on Arrakis, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen had been plotting their destruction. He indeed planted the letter to frame Jessica and to move suspicion even further away from the true traitor. The Baron Harkonnen is a monstrosity of a man, a sadistic pedophile and rapist. He is grossly fat and must be held up by suspensers. Despite of all this, the Baron is also a genius and is recognized for his remarkable insight in knowing people. This is demonstrated in the way he has developed the roles of his nephews, the Brutus Glossu Raban, and the Baron's favored Fade Raltha, and also demonstrated in the maintenance of the Baron's own Mintat, the Twisted Piter de Vries. The Baron has proven throughout his time as the leader of a major house to be incredibly cruel, and has earned House Harkonnen its reputation. Slavery, murder, and torture on a wide scale find no fault in the Baron's mind. The Harkonnens and the Atreides have been feuding for generations. The Baron now had the chance to destroy the house once and for all, and with the Emperor backing him, he did not know how he could fail, and he knew that the traitor amongst the Atreides would not be detected, because he had recruited the help of a man conditioned against doing harm to eliminate House Atreides. Vladimir Harkonnen had taken the soup doctor Yui's wife, Moana, prisoner, threatening her with torture and even death unless Yui complies with his demands. Dr. Yui would go down as the first instance ever of Imperial conditioning being broken. Yui could avoid detection from Jessica's truth-sensing abilities due to the skills he had learned from his wife Moana, who was trained by the Bene Gesserit school as well. Under the cover of night, House Harkonnen launches a devastating attack on House Atreides. Yui disables the protective shields around the Atreides palace, and House Atreides soon falls to the Emperor's own Sardaukar soldiers disguised as Harkonnens. The Emperor does not wish his hand in this to be known. Leto and Jessica and Paul are sedated with drugs. Yui also replaces one of the Duke's teeth with a false one that could emit a poison gas. Yui encourages the Duke to kill the Baron with the poison gas when he is close enough to him. The Duke himself would die as well, but the Baron would be no more. Leto is taken prisoner by the Baron, and Jessica and Paul are taken to the deep desert to die in the sun without still suits or be consumed by the sandworms. Survival on Arrakis is brutal. Water is the most precious thing on the planet rather than spice. Frank Herbert has stated that the scarcity of water on Arrakis is meant to be an analog for the scarcity of oil on Earth. The surface of the planet is almost entirely dry dune deserts, hence the planet's less formal name, Dune. The heat in the desert is sweltering and miserable. Without a still suit to recycle the body's water, one will be dead within hours during the daytime. The Fremen inhabitants of the desert, even with still suits, only travel at night. While in the Ornithopter, a flying vehicle driven by Harkonnen henchmen, Paul and Jessica use their Bene Gesserit skills to get free of their bondage. Understanding some of the strange powers possessed by students of the Sisterhood, the Baron insisted that the Lady Jessica be gagged the entire time. He also insisted that one of the three captors be deaf and therefore immune to Jessica's ability of voice. Paul, for the first time, manages to use the Bene Gesserit power of voice, convincing the men to remove Jessica's gag. And when it is done, 
The highly skilled Jessica manipulates one man to kill the other and remove Paul's bonds as well. Paul then skillfully crushes the man's heart, killing him instantly. This is the first man Paul has ever killed. Hidden within the Ornithopter, Paul and Jessica discover a bundle containing Leto's ducal ring, still suits, food, and other provisions. Clearly this bundle was left by the Doctor Yui. He is the only one that would have had access to the Thopter and Leto's ring. Yui does this out of some sense of guilt and responsibility for his betrayal of House Atreides. After the assault on House Atreides, Yui finally confronts the Baron, demanding to know what has become of his wife. And as Yui has already suspected, the Baron had killed her. But no matter to him, he had already set a deadly trap for the Baron. Dr. Yui was killed then by the Baron's twisted Mintat Piter, and would forever go down in history as a traitor. The Baron then has Duke Leto brought to him. He demands to know where Jessica and Paul have fled, but the Duke truly does not know, and would never tell the despicable Baron even if he did. The Baron threatens to torture the Duke, but Leto remembers the secret weapon that Dr. Yui had planted on him. Leto stared across the table, wondering why he waited. The tooth would end it all quickly. Still, it had been good much of his life. He found himself remembering an antenna kite up dangling in the shell blue sky of Caladan, and Paul laughing with joy at the sight of it. And he remembered the sunrise here on Arrakis, colored strata of the shield wall mellowed by dust haze. Too bad, the Baron muttered. He pushed himself back from the table, stood up lightly in his suspensers, and hesitated, seeing a change come over the Duke. He saw the man draw a deep breath, jawline stiffen, the ripple of muscle there as the Duke clamped his mouth shut. How he fears me, the Baron thought. Shocked by the fear that the Baron might escape him, Leto bit sharply on the capsule tooth, felt it break, opened his mouth and expelled the biting vapor. He could taste it as it formed on his tongue. The Baron grew smaller, a figure seen in a tightening tunnel. Leto heard a gasp beside his ear, the silky voiced one, Piter, I got him too. Piter, what's wrong? The rumbling voice was far away. Leto sensed memories rolling in his mind, the old toothless mutterings of hags, the room, the table, the Baron, the pair of terrified eyes blue within blue, the eyes all compressed around him in ruined symmetry. There was a man with a boot toe chin, a toy man falling, the toy man had a broken nose slanted to the left, an offbeat metronome caught forever at the start of an upward stroke. Leto heard the crash of crockery, so distant, a roaring in his ears, his mind was a bin without end, catching everything, everything that had ever been, every shout, every whisper, every silence. One thought remained to him. Leto saw it in formless light rays of black. The day the flesh shapes, and the flesh the day shapes. The thought struck him with a sense of fullness he knew he could never explain. Silence. The twisted Mintat Piter is killed instantly, and the rest of the men in the room die as well, including the noble Duke Leto. But the Baron manages to escape in the nick of time and preserves his own life. Now, lost in the desert, Paul and Jessica must find a way to survive. It is during this time, however, that Paul's powers truly begin to awaken. Paul sensed the hyper-alertness of his mind, reading her reactions, computing on minutia. You see it now, he said. Satellites watch the terrain below. There are things in the deep desert that will not bear frequent inspection. You're suggesting that the guild itself controls this planet? She was so slow. No he said. The Fremen! They are paying the guild for privacy. Paying in a coin that is freely available to anyone with desert power. Spice. 
This is more than a second approximation, answer. This is the straight line computation. Depend on it. Paul, Jessica said. You're not a Mintat yet. You can't know for sure how. I'll never be a Mintat, he said. I am something else. A freak. Paul, how can you say such? Leave me alone. As Paul's abilities heighten, more and more becomes clear to him. For one, the Fremen hold much more power than initially believed. The Fremen people, who exist in greater numbers than anyone had ever expected, are the secret power on Arrakis. They are overlooked by most members of the Imperium and are considered to be primitive savages. Frank Herbert based several parts of their society and culture off of real-life Arabic traditions. The Fremen had come to the planet Arrakis thousands of years ago. Over the centuries that they have been on Dune, only the fittest have survived. Their culture has adapted a way of life to survive and even thrive in the harsh conditions of the planet. The Fremen are also known to be amazing fighters. Fremen society is organized into communities of people called Sieches. Leading each Sietch is a Niamb, the Arabic word meaning deputy or representative of authority, who ascends to leadership upon defeating his predecessor in combat, proving himself to be the strongest member of the tribe. A notable characteristic of the Fremen is their blue-in-blue -blue eyes, the result of spice addiction. The spice is everywhere on Arrakis. All Fremen develop blue-in-blue -blue eyes well before they reach adulthood. Now, in the desert plains of Arrakis, exposed to more spice than ever before, Paul's awareness expands dramatically. His vision is clearer than anyone before him. If you are not the Kwisatz Haderach, Jessica said. What? You couldn't possibly know, he said. You won't believe it until you see it. And he thought, I'm a seed. He suddenly saw how fertile was the ground into which he had fallen. And with this realization, the terrible purpose filled him, creeping through the empty space within, threatening to choke him with grief. He had seen two main branchings along the way ahead. In one, he confronted an old evil baron and said, Hello, grandfather. The thought of that path and what lay along it sickened him. The other path held long patches of gray obscurity except for peaks of violence. He had seen a warrior religion there a fire spreading across the universe, with the Atreides green and black banner waving at the head of fanatic legions drunk on spice liquor. Gurney Halleck and a few other of his father's men, a pitiful few were among them, all marked by the hawk symbol from the shrine of his father's skull. I can't go that way, he muttered. That's what the old witches of your school really want. I don't understand you, Paul, his mother said. He remained silent, thinking like the seed he was, thinking with the race consciousness he had first experienced as terrible purpose. He found that he no longer could hate the Bene Gesserit, or the Emperor, or even the Harkonnens. They were all caught up in the need of their race to renew its scattered inheritance, to cross and mingle and infuse their bloodlines in a great new pooling of genes. And the race knew only one sure way for this, the ancient way, the tried and certain way that rolled over everything in its path, Jihad. Surely I cannot choose that way, he thought. But he saw again in his mind's eye, the shrine of his father's skull and the violence with the green and black banner waving in its midst. Jessica cleared her throat, worried by his silence. Then, the Fremen will give us sanctuary? He looked up, staring across the green lighted tent at the inbred, patrician inlines of her face. Yes, he said, that's one of the ways. He nodded. Yes, they'll call me Muad'Dib, the one who points the way. Yes, that's what they'll call me. 
And he closed his eyes, thinking, Now, my father, I can mourn you. And he felt the tears coursing down his cheeks. Book one of the first novel ends here, with the revelations that the Baron Harkonnen is actually the maternal grandfather of Paul, the Lady Jessica's own father, though this information is not known to her or the Baron, and also that they will find sanctuary amongst the desert people, the Fremen. Paul also senses a terrible purpose, a great jihad of violence that will spread, a religious war in his name. After managing to survive in the desert for a while on their own, Paul and Jessica eventually do encounter the Fremen. The naive of this tribe, Stilgar, after viewing the fighting prowess of Jessica, her weirding way, the special martial arts of the Bene Gesserit, he agrees to allow Jessica and Paul to enter the tribe under the condition that they will teach them the weirding way. Jessica must play a very delicate game, using her knowledge of the sisterhood's Missionara Protectiva she will manipulate the Fremen people in order to preserve House Atreides. The superstitions maintained by the Fremen detailed the coming of a prescient son of a Bene Gesserit who would lead them to freedom. This figure is referred to as the Lisan al Gayib in Fremen myth, and this is the son that will become the Mahdi, the Arabic word meaning the guided one, of the Fremen, and lead them to freedom. Long have the Fremen people been spat upon and oppressed by the Imperium, and a myth such as this was highly appealing to them. Thus, from the moment Paul and Jessica arrived on Arrakis, the Fremen had believed that their prophecies were being fulfilled. The fact that the Mahdi legend specifically had been planted on Doom indicates to Jessica that conditions on Doom are truly horrible. The Mahdi legend she knew was reserved for only the harshest environments where the Bene Gesserit would need significant advantages over indigenous influences. Over the course of the next two years, Paul would amass more and more power, respect, and influence amongst the Fremen people. To the Fremen, Paul is a spiritual and religious leader. His fighting prowess is also well known among the Fremen and he has trained a group of death commandos called Fedekin. The Fedekin warriors were highly loyal to Paul and some of the deadliest soldiers in the known universe. At this point, the Emperor Shaddam, along with the Baron Harkonnen and the rest of the Imperium, assume that Paul and Jessica are dead. During this time, Paul has taken the Fremen woman Chani, daughter of Leit Kynes, as concubine. They have a son together, named Leto for Paul's father. Jessica has become Sayadina of the Fremen, a rogue reverend mother. Due to the Missionara Protectiva, many fringe cultures such as the Fremen have produced so-called wild reverend mothers, who possess many of the skills of the Bene Gesserit reverend mothers, but without official training. Jessica encounters one of them during the Spice Agony, she absorbs the dying Reverend Mother's consciousness and unblocks her own genetic memory by converting the deadly truth-sayer drug, the Water of Life. But the cost was greater than she understood. Jessica, since before the Harkonnen attack, had been carrying the daughter of Duke Leto Atreides, Aaliyah, and when Jessica underwent the Spice Agony, unblocking her genetic memory, Aaliyah's genetic memory is unlocked as well, and in that instant, she becomes a reverend mother too. Aaliyah is her mother, and her grandmother, and her grandfather, the full maternal genetic bloodline in one mind. The Bene Gesserit consider a child such as this to be abomination. You should have told us you were pregnant. Jessica found the voice that talked within, the mutual awareness. Why? This changes both of you. Holy Mother, what have we done? Jessica sensed a forced shift in the mutual awareness, saw another moat presence within the inward eye. The other moat darted wildly here, there, circling, 
It radiated pure terror. You'll have to be strong, the old Reverend Mother's image presence said. Be thankful it is a daughter you carry. This would have killed a male fetus. Aaliyah, you see, was pre-born. The shock and trauma that this brought onto the unborn child was catastrophic. What happens when a person does not have the time to establish their own personality? The weight of the egos stretching back through the genetic history becomes unbearable. Eventually, the ego memories of the person's ancestors could assert themselves and eventually govern the person's behavior. Possession. Aaliyah's strangeness is frightening to the Fremen. She is a child, but not a child. They do not understand her. There is yet misunderstanding because of Aaliyah's strangeness. The women are fearful because a child little more than an infant talks of things that only adults should know. They do not understand the change in the womb that made Aaliyah different. Likely the most crucial aspect of the first Dune book is Paul's terrible purpose. It is his awareness that his actions on Arrakis will lead to Jihad, essentially a holy war. This would be a holy war in his name. The Fremen would gallop across the known universe, and in their fanatic assuredness, they would lay waste to all non-believers, spreading death across the galaxy. Paul throughout this book makes attempts to avoid this future, and yet, no matter what path he looked into, it seemed that victory for House Atreides would come at the cost of countless lives, a long-lasting, brutal war. Paul Atreides is tormented by this knowledge, and the weight of it. So much death in his name. During the time with the Fremen, Paul encounters the now dead Liet Kynes, Imperial Planetologist, who was in all but name one of the Fremen. Paul learns of the Fremen plans to terraform the planet Dune into an Eden full of life, guided by Kynes. After Kynes is murdered by the Harkonnens, it is Paul who begins to replace him as the spiritual and military leader of the Fremen. The final test in Paul becoming a Fremen is for him to mount a sandworm. The worm riding ritual is a coming of age ritual among the Fremen people, and in that moment, his vision is blocked. He has not seen this moment in his prescience, and therefore, he does not know the outcome. It came from the southeast, a distant hissing, a sand whisper. Presently, he saw the faraway outline of the creature's track against the dawn light and realized he had never before seen a maker this large, never heard of one this size. It appeared to be more than half a league long, and the rise of the sand wave at its cresting head was like the approach of a mountain. This is nothing I have seen by vision or in life, Paul cautioned himself. He hurried across the path of the thing to take his stand caught up entirely by the rushing needs of the moment. Paul, of course, survives this test and mounts his first worm, but the young men of the tribe are not content. They clearly see Paul as the strongest member of the tribe and wonder why he has not called out Stilgar yet, who has grown close to Paul. The idea of replacement or recycling is important to the Fremen. Water is scarce on Arrakis, so the Fremen use the water from the dead corpses to replenish their wells. Even in light of this, Paul has no wish to kill Stilgar. Later, the Fremen discover a spice smuggling operation taking place in their territory. Paul realizes that the operation is being led by none other than Gurney Halleck, former master of arms to House Atreides. He survived the Harkonnen raid. Paul reveals himself to Gurney, who confirms to Paul that he is still his duke and he remains loyal to him. After leading Gurney 
and his smuggler men into a Fremen cavern. Several of the so-called smugglers reveal themselves to be Sardaukar soldiers in disguise. They attack, but the Fremen kill all but a few of them. Paul allow a few to escape so that they can report back to House Harkonnen of the fighting power of the Fremen. The Baron Harkonnen, in the time since the raid on House Atreides, has regained the fiefdom of Arrakis. He has manipulated aging Mintat Thufir Howard into serving him. The Baron, who resides on Gidi Prime, has placed his cruel nephew, the Beast Raban, in charge of the people on the planet Dune. Fade Ratha, who the Baron intends to precede him, has grown impatient and wants the Baron dead. In one instance, while a slave boy, the Baron is almost killed by a poison needle that was implanted into the boy's thigh. The Baron knows that Fade is to blame. It doesn't take the Baron much time to find and kill without hesitation Fade Ratha's spies among his own guard. Meeting with Fade, the Baron attempts to explain to Fade the folly of his actions, stating that Fade will eventually secede him as Baron, and that day may be soon. The Baron also assigns Thuthir to watch over Fade from this point on, for now Fade decides not to make another attempt on the Baron's life. Eventually, the Fremen attempt to force Paul to call out Stilgar, but he refuses. Paul acknowledges who he was to the Fremen, a religious leader, Muad'Dib. His role as Messiah could not be compared to Stilgar's non-mystical role. At this point in time, the Baron who rested his hopes on Fade Ratha had stopped sending resources to Raban in the form of supplies and reinforcements. This made Raban very vulnerable. It will then be easier for the Fremen people to take control of Arrakis from the Harkonnens, and they are ready to fight. They are willing to die for their liberation. Gurney Halleck, upon seeing the Lady Jessica, quickly attacks her, still under the belief that she was the traitor to House Atreides. He threatens to kill her while he holds a knife to her throat. Paul, however, convinces Gurney that Jessica was not the traitor but that it was instead the Dr. Yui who betrayed House Atreides. Gurney becomes overwhelmed with shame and asks to be killed, but Paul refuses. In the religious mythology of the real world, messiahs are almost always peaceful figures. Jesus would be the most famous and obvious example. He was a peaceful figure and his name has been used to commit violence. But the world of fiction is an utterly distinct animal. In fiction, the chosen hero guides the people he has chosen to triumph, often through violent means. Aragorn from The Lord of the Rings, Daenerys from A Song of Ice and Fire. Paul represents an extremely well-known trope in fiction, the hero that is victorious through violence. What makes Paul different is that he acknowledges and is fully aware of the horror of this and of the potential consequences. But Paul was not the Kwisatz Haderach yet. He had realized something during Gurney's attempt on his mother's life. He had not foreseen it in any vision. His body had slowly acquired a certain spice tolerance that made prescient visions fewer and fewer, dimmer and dimmer. The solution appeared obvious to him. I will drown the Maker. We will see now whether I am the Kwisatz Haderach who can survive the test that the Reverend Mothers have survived. Paul decides to take the deadly water of life, the truthsayer drug which no male has ever survived. And it came to pass in the third year of the desert war that Paul Muad'Dib lay alone in the cave of birds beneath the Kiswa hangings of an inner cell, and he lay as one dead caught up in the revelation of the water of life, his being translated beyond the boundaries of time by the poison that gives life. Thus was the prophecy made that the Lisan Al-Gayib might be both dead and alive. After three weeks in a coma, Paul emerges as the Kwisatz Haderach. 
he looks into space and sees that the Emperor and the Harkonnens have amassed a huge armada to invade the planet to regain the control that Raban has lost. Sometime later, the Siach where Aaliyah and Leto II reside is attacked and the Sardaukar soldiers kill Leto and take Aaliyah prisoner. Aaliyah is then brought to the capital city of Arrakis, Arakin, by the Emperor Shaddam himself. It is here that the story comes to its climax. My dear Baron, the Emperor said, become acquainted with the sister of Mu'adib. The sister? The Baron shifted his attention to the Emperor. I do not understand. I too sometimes err on the side of caution, the Emperor said. It has been reported to me that your uninhabited South Polar regions exhibit evidence of human activity. But that's impossible, the Baron protested. The worms, there's sand clear to the... These people seem to be able to avoid the worms, the Emperor said. The child sat down on the dais beside the throne, dangled her feet over the edge, kicking them. There was such an air of sureness in the way she appraised her surroundings. The Baron stared at the kicking feet, the way they moved the black robe, the wink of sandals beneath the fabric. Unfortunately, the Emperor said, I only sent in five troop carriers with a light attack force to pick up prisoners for questioning. We barely got away with three prisoners and one carrier. Mind you, Baron, my Sardaukar were almost overwhelmed by a force composed mostly of women, children, and old men. This child here was in command of one of the attacking groups. You see, your majesty, the Baron said. You see how they are. I allowed myself to be captured, the child said. I did not want to face my brother and have to tell him that his son had been killed. Only a handful of our men got away, the Emperor said. Got away. You hear that? We'd had them too, the child said, except for the flames. My Sardaukar used the attitudinal jets on their carriers as flamethrowers, the Emperor said. A move of desperation, and the only thing that got them away with their three prisoners. Mark that, my dear Baron. Sardaukar forced to retreat in confusion from women and children and old men. We must attack them in force, the Baron rasped. We must destroy every last vestige of silence, the Emperor roared. He pushed himself forward on his throne. Do not abuse my intelligence any longer. You stand there in your foolish innocence and majesty, the truthsayer said. He waved her to silence. You say you don't know about the activity we found, nor the fighting qualities of these superb people. The Emperor lifted himself half off his throne. What do you take me for, Baron? The Baron took two backward steps, thinking, it was Raban. He has done this to me. Raban has. And this fake dispute with Duke Leto, the Emperor purred, sinking back into his throne. How beautifully you maneuvered it. Majesty, the Baron pleaded. What are you? Silence. The old Bene Gesserit put a hand on the Emperor's shoulder, leaned close to whisper in his ear. The child seated on the dais stopped kicking her feet and said, Make him afraid some more, Shaddam. I shouldn't enjoy this, but I find the pleasure impossible to suppress. Quiet, child, the Emperor said. He leaned forward, put a hand on her head, stared at the Baron. Is it possible, Baron? Could you be as simple-minded as my truth-sayer suggest? Do you not recognize this child, daughter of your ally, Duke Leto? My father was never his ally, the child said. My father is dead, and this old Harkonnen beast has never seen me before. The Baron was reduced to stupefied glaring. When he found his voice, it was only to rasp. Who? Oh, I am Aaliyah, daughter of the Duke Leto and the Lady Jessica, sister of Duke Paul Muad'Dib, the child said. She pushed herself off the dais, dropped to the floor of the audience chamber. My brother has promised to have your head atop this battle standard, and I think he shall. B. 
Be hushed, child, the emperor said, and he sank back into his throne, hand to chin, studying the baron. I do not take the emperor's orders, Aaliyah said. She turned, looked up at the old reverend mother. She knows. The emperor glanced up at his truth-sayer. What does she mean? This child is an abomination. You babble, old woman, Elias said. You don't know how it was, yet you rattle on like a purblind fool. Elia closed her eyes, took a deep breath, and held it. The old reverend mother groaned and staggered. Elia opened her eyes. That is how it was, she said. A cosmic accident, and you played your part in it. The reverend mother held out both hands. Palms pushed the air toward Elia. What is happening here? The emperor demanded. Child, can you truly project your thoughts into the mind of another? That is not how it is at all, Elia said. Unless I am born as you, I cannot think as you. Kill her, the old woman muttered and clutched the back of the throne for support. Kill her. The sunken old eyes glared at Aaliyah. Silence, the emperor said, and he studied Aaliyah. Child, can you communicate with your brother? My brother knows I'm here, Aaliyah said. Can you tell him to surrender as the price of your life? Aaliyah smiled up at him with clear innocence. I shall not do that, she said. The baron stumbled forward to stand beside Aaliyah. Majesty, he pleaded, I knew nothing of. Interrupt me once more, baron, the emperor said, and you will lose the powers of interruption forever. He kept his attention focused on Aaliyah, studying her through slitted lids. You will not, eh? Can you read my mind, what I'll do if you disobey me? I've already said I cannot read minds, she said. But one does not need telepathy to read your intentions. The emperor scowled. Child, your cause is hopeless. I have but to rally my forces and reduce this planet to... It is not that simple, Aaliyah said. She looked at the two guildsmen. Ask them. It's not wise to go against my desires, the emperor said. You should not deny me the least thing. My brother comes now, Aaliyah said. Even an emperor may tremble before Muad'Dib, for he has the strength of righteousness and heaven smiles upon him. The emperor surged to his feet. This play has gone far enough. I will take your brother and this planet and grind them too. The room crumbled and shook around them. There came a sudden cascade of sand behind the throne where the hutment was coupled to the emperor's ship. The abrupt flickering tightening of skin pressure told of a wide area shield being activated. I told you, Aaliyah said, my brother comes. It is at this moment, under cover of a giant sandstorm, Paul and his army of Fremen warriors attack the capital city, riding on the backs of dozens of giant sandworms. They destroy the shield wall. In the chaos, Aaliyah kills the Baron Harkonnen and escapes the Emperor. I'm sorry, Grandfather, Aaliyah said. You've met the Atreides Gum Jabbar. She got to her feet, dropped a dark needle from her hand. Unlike Duke Leto Atreides, the Baron Harkonnen never saw the potential of the Fremen. He viewed them as savages, and that was the death of him. Aaliyah then goes to seek out and slit the throats of any wound in Harkonnen and Sardaukar soldiers, as Fremen tradition dictates. Upon witnessing the coming onslaught, the Emperor Shaddam and the Reverend Mother Gaius realize that they have but one weapon left to them, treachery. The Fremen quickly defeat the Emperor Sardaukar, and Paul takes his place at the Arakeen Governor's Mansion, which was the home of House Atreides when they first arrived on the planet Dune. Paul has one of the captive Sardaukar soldiers relay a message to Shaddam. Paul wishes to discuss the Emperor's surrender. At this point, however, Paul can still see the Jihad, which worries him. The Emperor and his entourage arrive at the mansion. The Emperor has instructed Thufir to kill Paul using a poison needle, but Thufir refuses. He dies in Paul's arms, 
due to a poison that the Baron had administered to him in secret. The Emperor then threatens to order the ships of the Lancerad, who hovered above the planet, to attack the Fremen, but Paul orders the Spacing Guild to force the Lancerad ships to leave. The Guild obeys he who controls the Spice, and that was now Paul Atreides. The Emperor was powerless. Paul sees the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohaim as well. Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohaim, Paul said. It has been a long time since Caladan, hasn't it? She looked past him at his mother, said, Well, Jessica, I see that your son is indeed the one. For that you can be forgiven even the abomination of your daughter. Paul stilled a cold and piercing anger and said, You have never had the right or cause to forgive my mother anything. The old woman locked eyes with him. Try your tricks on me, old witch, Paul said. Where is your gum, Jabbar? Try looking into that place where you dare not look. You'll find me there staring out at you. The old woman dropped her gaze. Have you nothing to say? Paul demanded. I welcome you to the ranks of humans, she muttered. Don't besmirch that. Paul raised his voice. Observe her, comrades. This, a Bene Gesserit reverend mother, patient in a patient cause. She could wait with her sisters, ninety generations for the proper combination of genes and environment to produce the one person their schemes required. Observe her. She knows that the ninety generations have produced that person. Here I stand, but I will never do her bidding. Jessica, the old woman screamed, silence him. Silence him yourself, Jessica said. Paul glared at the old woman. For your part in this, I could gladly have you strangled, he said. You couldn't prevent it, he snapped as she stiffened in rage. But I think it better punishment that you live out your years, never able to touch me or bend me to a single thing your scheming desires. Jessica, what have you done? The old woman demanded. I'll give you only one thing, Paul said. You saw part of what the race needs, but how poorly you saw it. You think to control breeding and intermix a select few according to your master plan. How little you understand of what. You mustn't speak of these things. The old woman hissed. Silence! Paul roared. The word seemed to take substance as it twisted through the air between them under Paul's control. The old woman reeled back into the arms of those behind her, face blank with shock at the power with which he had seized her psyche. Jessica, she whispered. Jessica. I remember your gum, Jabbar, Paul said. You remember mine. I can kill you with a word. The Fremen around the ball glanced knowingly at each other. Did the legend not say? And his word shall carry death eternal to those who stand against righteousness. It is here that Fade Ratha Harkonnen comes forth. If Paul had been born a girl, as the sisterhood intended, he would have likely married Fade Ralpha. But instead, they cannot coexist. Fade challenges Paul to a duel. Fade cheats, but still falls to Paul Muad'Dib nonetheless. The Emperor's last hope is that Finring, also a product of the Bene Gesserit breeding plan, who was almost a Kwisatz Haderach himself, would slay Paul. But Finring refuses, feeling a special connection with Paul. The Emperor is out of options. Paul ascends the throne and is allowed to marry the Emperor's daughter, the Princess Irulan. He ensures Chani that the marriage is strictly political and that he will remain loyal to her. Book One in the Dune Saga ends here, with Paul's ascension to Emperor of the Imperium. By the end of the first book in the Dune Saga, Paul does not know how he will avoid the Jihad, and neither does the reader. Paul's future plans are hinted at in this specific quote at the end of the novel. They sense that I must take the throne, but they cannot know I do it to prevent the Jihad. Each chapter in Dune begins with a quote, many by the Princess Irulan. 
The odd thing is, based on the way the quotes are written, especially Irulan's, it is ambiguous as to whether Paul eventually brought peace to the galaxy, or whether his Fremen became the very face of death itself. In the end, the fate of the Fremen and the Empire is left open until the next book, that is. The action in Dune reaches a crescendo towards the end of the novel. The novel has a sudden and relatively anticlimactic ending. Many avenues remain unexplored. Paul rising to ruler of the Imperium, alongside the Fremen acquiring full control of Arrakis by the end of the book, shows how quickly the status quo can change after significant events occur. Earlier in the novel, House Atreides is nearly destroyed by the work of the Emperor and the Baron. But now Paul is not simply Duke of Arrakis. He is Mahdi of the Fremen and ruler of the Imperium. In the eyes of the Fremen people, Arrakis will soon be a paradise as the legends foretold. But how will changing Arrakis change the Fremen themselves? What aspects of their culture will wither with the desert? Dune is possibly the most influential sci-fi novel of all time. It combines sci-fi and fantasy with the multi-layered interactions of important social issues concerning human social interaction, religion, and genetic development. Dune is widely considered to be far ahead of its time in pointing out the importance of preserving the ecology of a planet, the conservation of resources, and by addressing the complexities of religion, Dune explored a topic that surprisingly was rarely addressed in science fiction prior. Dune's portrayal of the downfall of the Galactic Empire has been compared to Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Lorenzo di Tommaso outlines similarities between the two works, highlighting the excesses of Emperor Shaddam and the Baron Harkonnen. The Emperor loses his effectiveness as a ruler from excess of ceremony and pompousness. Di Tommaso points out that the Baron is similarly materially indulgent, corrupt, and sexually decadent. Gibbon's decline and fall blames the fall of Rome on the rise of Christianity. Complacency weakened the soldiers of Rome and left it open to attack. Similarly, the Emperor's Sardaukar fighters are no match for the Fremen of Arrakis because of their own overconfidence and the Fremen willingness to sacrifice their own individual bodies for the good of the tribe. To the Fremen, the community always comes before the individual, in contrast to the humans of the Landsrad, who live decadent lives at the cost of the rest of humanity. Dune has before been criticized for presenting a sexist portrayal of women. This couldn't be further from the truth. Paul's approach to power required his upbringing under the female-oriented Bene Gesserit. Without his mother's training, he would have never become the Kwisatz Haderach. Though the sisterhood claims that they only exist to serve, they secretly operate as a long-dominating shadow government behind all of the great houses and their marriages or divisions. The Dune universe only appears to be patriarchal at first glance. Throughout the novel, as Paul becomes more and more powerful, more alien to the reader, Jessica remains human mentoring Paul at crucial moments. Frank Herbert did six years of research before he began writing Dune. He spent a year and a half writing the first novel. He conceived of a long novel. What became a trilogy was initially one book about the messianic convulsions that periodically overtake mankind. Demagogues, fanatics, con game artists, the innocent and the not-so-innocent bystanders, all were to have a part in this drama. This grows from my theory that superheroes are disastrous for humankind. Even if we find a real hero, whatever or whoever that may be, eventually fallible mortals take over the power structure that always comes into being around such a leader. Frank Herbert, Doom Genesis. 
Frank Herbert understood that during difficult times, people become perfectly willing to give over their agency, all decision-making capacity, to any leader who can quote wrap himself in the myth fabric of society. Hitler, Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Stalin are among the examples Frank Herbert names. Frank Herbert points out that although these figures often have larger-than-life appearances, each possesses human faults. This is a major theme of the Dune Saga. Never give your critical faculties away to people in power, regardless of how admirable these people may seem to be. The novel Dune understands that power attracts the corruptible, people who want power for the sake of it. Frank Herbert suggests that a certain proportion of such people are imbalanced, or perhaps even insane. Frank Herbert believed that humanity must continue to evolve or it would die. I now believe that evolution or de-evolution never ends short of death, that no society has ever achieved an absolute pinnacle, that all humans are not created equal. In fact, I believe attempts to create some abstract equalization create a morass of injustices that rebound on the equalizers. Equal justice and equal opportunity are ideals we should seek, but we should recognize that humans administer the ideals and that humans do not have equal ability. This quote may be off-putting to some, but all it is saying is that yes, some humans are smarter than others, some have greater physical prowess. Regardless of this, we should embrace these differences while still providing equal justice and protection under the law, and not pretend that all humans are the same. In the next part of this series, we will explore the second novel in Frank Herbert's original Doom series, Doom Messiah, which details the consequences of Paul's ascension to ruler of the universe. For more Doom, check out the videos in the Doom playlist on my channel. I wrote the Dune series because I had this idea that charismatic leaders ought to come with a warning label on the forehead, may be dangerous to your health. One of the most dangerous presidents that we've had in this century was Jack Kennedy. Because people said, yes sir, Mr. Charismatic Leader, what do we do next? And we wound up in Vietnam. And I think probably the most valuable president of this century was Richard Nixon because he taught us to, to distrust government and he did it by example. Well anyway, I wanted to do this thing about messiahs and charismatic leaders. I mean, why do 900 people go to Guyana and drink poison Kool-Aid? Why do the citizens of an entire nation, most of the citizens anyway, say Sieg Heil and murder some three million Jews and gypsies? Why do they not question their leaders? Such a rich store of myths enfold Paul Muad'Dib, the Mintat Emperor, and his sister, Aaliyah. It is difficult to see the real persons behind these veils, but there were, after all, a man born Paul Atreides and a woman born Aaliyah. Their flesh was subject to space and time, 
and even though their oracular powers placed them beyond the usual limits of time and space, they came from human stock. They experienced real events which left real traces upon a real universe. To understand them, it must be seen that their catastrophe was the catastrophe of all mankind. This work is dedicated then not to Muad'Dib or his sister, but to their heirs, all of us. All of the books following the first one deal with the results of Paul's influence on the galaxy. Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, and God Emperor of Dune especially. At the start of Messiah, we are immediately faced with the problems surrounding Paul's rule of the Imperium. Dune Messiah opens with a recorded interrogation between a Fremen priest and a historian named Bronzo, who has been labeled a heretic and sentenced to death for his accurate writings on Emperor Paul Muad'Dib. Twelve years have passed since the events of Dune. At this point, Paul Atreides rules from Arrakis as Emperor of the Imperium. Even though Paul is the most powerful emperor of all time, he is still unable to control the deadly religion that has formed in his name. The Jihad has been unleashed, and it has conquered most of the known universe. 61 billion people have died so far due to Paul's decision to become the Messiah of the Fremen people. But according to Paul's vision, this is nowhere close to the worst possible outcome for humanity. It is in Dune Messiah that Paul begins the Golden Path, a plan of unmatched complexity to set humanity on a path that won't lead to our eventual extinction in the future. Paul has to maintain a balance between his golden path, his duty as the ruler of the Imperium, and his role as the central figure in the Fremen religion. As Paul maintains this balance, other powers in the universe have moved to threaten his position as Emperor. Several forces are at work and conspire together to undo Paul Atreides and reverse the events that led to his ascension to the throne. These forces include the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, who are vexed that they have lost control of their Kwisatz Haderach, the remnants of the displaced House Carino, the former occupants of the throne, the Spacing Guild, who are now under Paul's control due to his control over the Spice, and the Bene Tleilex, who have their own agenda. The Tleilex Su have sent the Face Dancer Skytail as their representative. Despite the murderous nature of the plot he hoped to devise, the thoughts of Skytail, the Tleilaxu face dancer, returned again and again to rueful compassion. I shall regret causing death and misery to Muad'Dib, he told himself. He kept this benignity carefully hidden from his fellow conspirators. Such feelings told him, though, that he found it easier to identify with the victim than with the attackers, a thing characteristic of Tleilaxu. Skytail stood in bemused silence, somewhat apart from the others. The argument about psychic poison had been going on for some time now. It was energetic and vehement, but polite, that blindly compulsive way that adepts of the great schools always adopted for matters close to their dogma. When you think you have him skewered right, then you find him unwounded. That was the old reverend mother of the Bene Gesserit, Gaius Helen Mohayim. Their hostess here on Wallet 9. She was a black-robed stick figure, a witch crone seated in a floater chair at Skytail's left. Her Abba hood had been thrown back to expose a leathery face beneath silver hair. Deeply pocketed eyes stared out of skull mask features. They were using a Mirabasa language, honed phalange consonants and joined vowels. It was an instrument for conveying fine emotional subtleties. Edric, the guild steersman, replied to the Reverend Mother now with a vocal curtsy contained in a sneer, a lovely touch of disdainful politeness. Skytel looked at the guild envoy. Edric swam in a container of orange gas only a few paces away. His container sat in the center of the transparent dome which the Bene Gesserit had built for this meeting. The guildsman was an elongated figure vaguely humanoid with thin feet and hugely fanned membranous hands, a fish in a strange sea. His tank's vents emitted a pale orange cloud rich with the smell of the geriatric spice melange. 
If we go on this way, we'll die of stupidity. That was the fourth person present, a potential member of the conspiracy. Princess Irulan, wife but not mate, Skytail reminded himself, of their mutual foe. She stood at a corner of Edric's tank, a tall blonde beauty, splendid in a robe of blue whale fur and matching hat. Gold buttons glittered at her ears. She carried herself with an aristocrat's hauteur, but something in the absorbed smoothness of her features betrayed the controls of her Bene Gesserit background. The Atreides dynasty has become less secure due to Paul not producing an heir. At first, it is unclear why, but it is later revealed that the Princess Irulan has been secretly administering contraceptives to Paul's lover and concubine Chani. After meeting with the conspirators, Irulan returns to the planet Dune. As Empress, she demands a child from Paul Atreides, but he denies her as he always had. Chani is aware that Irulan is involved in some kind of plot against Paul. She suggests that Paul give Irulan the child she desires in order to keep him out of danger. Irulan would be less likely to betray Paul if she got what she wanted. Irulan is the wife of Paul only in name. Their marriage was made only so that Paul could have a claim to the Imperial throne. Irulan Corino is the eldest daughter of Shaddam. She received her education through the Bene Gesserit. She was conditioned to be a lady of refinement and elegance. Shaddam IV very much expected Irulan to become empress after his death. The Bene Gesserit also saw potential in the princess and gave her sufficient training so that they could exploit her at some point in the future were she to find herself in a position of power. Still, Despite expectations, Irulan remained only an average Bene Gesserit adept, though she still maintained loyalty to the sisterhood. Irulan desires to bear the royal heir herself and preserve the Atreides bloodline for the Bene Gesserit, but Paul will not touch her. Though Paul is aware of Irulan preventing Chani from conceiving, he allows it. Paul has seen through his prescience that the birth of his child will bring about the death of his love. He does not want Chani to die. But things change once Chani eventually conceives, having switched to an ancient Fremen fertility diet. The Empire grows ever more unstable. The Spacing Guild is refusing to give over the location of the Tupal Entante, a sanctuary planet where defeated great houses can retreat to. Irulan suggests that they retaliate by cutting off the Guild's access to spice but her suggestion is almost unanimously shot down. Stilgar, however, does not understand why Paul cannot use his prescient power to locate Tupel. Paul explains to him that prescience is neither a gift nor power, but a natural consequence. You have certain powers, Stilgar said. Can you not locate the Entente despite the guild? Powers, Paul thought. Stilgar couldn't just say. You're prescient. Can't you trace a path in the future that leads to Tupul? Paul looked at the golden surface of the table. Always the same problem. How could he express the limits of the inexpressible? Should he speak of fragmentation, the natural destiny of all power? How could someone who never experienced the spice change of prescience conceive an awareness containing no localized space-time, no personal image vector, nor associated sensory captives? He looked at Aaliyah, found her attention on Irulan. Aaliyah sensed his movement, glanced at him, nodded toward Irulan. Ah, yes. Any answer they gave would find its way into one of Irulan's special reports to the Bene Gesserit. They never gave up seeking an answer to their quiz at Sadarak. Stilgar, though, deserved an answer of some kind. For that matter, so did Irulan. The uninitiated tried to conceive of prescience as obeying a natural law, Paul said. He steepled his hands in front of him. But it'd be just as correct to say it's heaven speaking to us. That being able to read the future is a harmonious act of man's being. In other words, prediction is a natural consequence in the wave of the present. It wears the guise of nature, you see. 
but such powers cannot be used from an attitude that pre-states aims and purposes. Does a chip caught in the wave say where it's going? There is no cause and effect in the oracle. Cause becomes occasions of conveying convections and confluences, places where the currents meet. Accepting prescience, you feel your being with concepts are repugnant to intellect. Your intellectual consciousness therefore rejects them, and rejecting intellect becomes a part of the process and is subjugated. You cannot do it, Stilgar asked. Were I to seek to pile with prescience, Paul said, speaking directly to Irulan, this might hide to pile. Chaos, Irulan protested. It has no, no consistency. I did say it obeys no natural law, Paul said. Irulan is irritated by the lack of preciseness in Paul's vision. Stilgar merely cannot comprehend how Paul's godly powers could be limited in such a way. Many people of the Imperium are seeking constitution. They desire limits on Paul's imperial control. Paul's priest Korba suggests that constitution could begin as a religious one, but Paul rejects any idea of a constitution, calling it tyranny. According to Irulan, many in the Imperium have grown nostalgic and they look back on the time in which her father Shaddam ruled as better days. Paul is grateful for her insight. The conspiracy against Paul Atreides is a complicated one. The guild navigator Edric is able to shield the conspiracy from Paul's prescience due to a property of prescience which causes oracles to interfere with each other's sight. The spacing guild has come to Arrakis and brought a gift for Paul, a gola of the dead Duncan Idaho, who was Paul's childhood teacher who died 14 years earlier on Arrakis in the novel Dune. They have named this Gola Hate and also conditioned him as a Mintat. Knowing the love Paul felt for Duncan, they hoped that the Gola being present would hinder Paul's ability to properly manage the Empire. Many in the Imperium, including the Fremen, also saw the Bene Tleilax and their creations as dirty. If Paul accepted this Gola, this would weaken his already faltering position in the eyes of some Fremen. It was Duncan Idaho. It could not be Duncan Idaho, yet it was. Captive memories absorbed in the womb during that moment of her mother's spice change identified this man for Aaliyah by Rayana decipherment, which cut through all camouflage. Paul was seeing him, she knew. Out of countless personal experiences, out of gratitudes and youthful sharing, it was Duncan. Aaliyah shuddered. There could only be one answer. This was a Tleilak suit Gola a being reconstructed from the dead flesh of the original. That original had perished saving Paul. This could only be a product of the axolotl tanks. The Gola walked with the cocked-footed alertness of a master swordsman. He came to a halt as the ambassador's tank glided to a stop, ten paces from the steps of the dais. In the Bene Gesserit way she could not escape, Aaliyah read Paul's disquiet. He no longer looked at the figure out of his past, not looking. His whole being stared, muscles strained against restrictions as he nodded to the guild ambassador, said, I am told your name is Edric. We welcome you to our court, in the hope that this will bring new understanding between us. The steersman assumed a sybaritic reclining pose in his orange gas, popped a melange capsule into his mouth before meeting Paul's gaze. The tiny transducer orbiting a corner of the guildsman's tank reproduced a coughing sound, then the rasping uninvolved voice. I abase myself before my emperor and beg leave to present my credentials and offer a small gift. An aide passed the scroll up to Stilgar who studied it, scowling, then nodded to Paul. Both Stilgar and Paul turned toward the Gola standing patiently below the dais. Indeed, my emperor has discerned the gift, Edric said. We are pleased to accept your credentials, Paul said. Explain the gift. Edric rolled in the tank, bringing his attention to bear on the Gola. This man is called Hate, he said, spelling the name. 
According to our investigators, he has a most curious history. He was killed here on Arrakis, a grievous head wound which required many months of regrowth. The body was sold to the Bene Tleilax as that of a master swordsman, an adept of the Gianna school. It came to our attention that this must be Duncan Idaho, the trusted retainer of your household. We brought him here as a gift befitting an emperor. Edric peered up at Paul. Is it not Idaho, sire? Restraint and caution gripped Paul's voice. He has the aspect of Idaho. Does Paul see something I don't? Aaliyah wondered. No, it's Duncan. The man called Hate stood impassively, metal eyes fixed straight ahead, body relaxed. No sign escaped him to indicate he knew himself to be the object of discussion. According to our best knowledge, it's Idaho, Edric said. He's called Hate now, Paul said, a curious name. Sire, there is no divining why the Tleilaxu bestow names, Edric said. But names can be changed. The Tleilaxu name is of little importance. This is a Tleilaxu thing, Paul thought. There's the problem. The Bene Tleilax held little attachment to phenomenal nature. Good and evil carried strange meanings in their philosophy. What might they have incorporated into Idaho's flesh out of design or whim? Paul glanced at Stilgar, noted the Fremen's superstitious awe. It was an emotion echoed all through his Fremen guard. Stilgar's mind would be speculating about the loathsome habits of guildsmen, of Tleilaxu, and of Golas. Turning toward the Gola, Paul said, Hate, is that your only name? A serene smile spread over the Gola's dark features. The metal eyes lifted, centering on Paul, but maintained their mechanical stare. That's how I am called, my lord. Hate. The situation becomes even more complicated due to Paul's sister, Aaliyah, who is now maturing into a woman. Aaliyah is exceptionally powerful with all the skills of a Bene Gesserit reverend mother. Aaliyah is irresistibly attracted to Hate, the Duncan Idaho Gola. Aaliyah and Hate investigate the appearance of a female corpse near the city Arakin. Hate due to his computational abilities as a Mentat, realizes that the fact that no one has been reported as missing implies a Tleilaxu plot. They realize that the dead woman has likely been replaced by a face dancer. Sensing plans within plans, Paul demands to see the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohayim. She fears that Paul will kill her due to her part in the conspiracy, but instead she discovers that Paul wishes to bargain with her. He offers to produce a child with Irulan, through artificial insemination. The Reverend Mother is disgusted, understanding that such an act would violate the Butlerian Jihad, and also she understands that no child born this way would be a candidate for the Golden Lion Throne. Still, the Bene Gesserit are desperate to regain control of the Atreides genes, though if they admit it to the existence of such a child, it would jeopardize their own position within the Empire. The Reverend Mother decides that she must consult with the Sisterhood. Though Chani has conceived, her pregnancy begins to experience problems due to the contraceptives in her system. Chani immediately realizes that Irulan must be the culprit and would have killed her if not for Paul's intervention. Paul has spent more and more time with the Gola Hate. During this time he realizes that it may even be possible to restore the Gola's original memories. Little does he know. This is precisely the key to the Tleilaxu plot surrounding the Gola Hate. In Dune, Paul trained a group of extremely deadly and extremely loyal death commandos known as the Feta King. In Dune Messiah, Otham, one of Paul's former commandos, reveals evidence of a Fremen conspiracy against Paul. Many Fremen have grown disillusioned with the world that Muad'Dib has made. Otham's daughter, Lichna, comes to Paul and insists that her father has a message for him. He asks for Paul to meet with him in secret. Paul notices then that Lichna is not actually Lichna. She is a Talaxu face dancer. 
but Paul allows this to happen. He has seen this in his prescience. Otham gives Paul his Tleilaxu dwarf servant named Bijas, who has the ability to record faces, names, and details like a machine. Paul accepts Bijas reluctantly, though he is disturbed because he has not seen the dwarf in any vision. Bijaz, Duri called. You call me? The dwarf stepped into the room from the courtyard, an alert expression of worry on his face. You have a new master, Bijaz, Duri said. She stared at Paul. You may call him Usul. Usul, that's the base of the pillar, Bijaz said, translating. How can Usul be base when I am the basest thing living? He always speaks thus, Otham apologized. I do not speak, Bijaz said. I operate a machine called language. It creaks and groans, but is mine own. A Tleilaxu toy learned and alert, Paul thought. The Benny Tleilax never threw away something this valuable. He turned, studied the dwarf, round melange eyes, returned his stare. Shortly after Paul accepts Bijaz, and sends him away with Stilgar. A stone burner is set off in Otham's home. It destroys the area and blinds many people, including Paul himself. But to the surprise of everyone else, especially the Fremen, Paul does not need eyes to see. According to Fremen tradition, the blind are abandoned in the desert, but Paul's oracular powers are such that he can foresee in his mind's eye everything that happens as if he had eyes. Paul shocks the Fremen, who take this as more evidence of his divinity. By following his visions perfectly, Paul can see even the most slight details around him. This only makes him appear more godlike to those around him, further establishing his divinity in the minds of many. But this is a curse. Becoming blind has forced Paul to never stray from his vision. He is unable to change even the smallest part of his destiny while maintaining his appearance as sighted. As the Fremen conspiracy comes to light, it is learned that Korba, former Fadekin warrior who is now a high priest of Paul's church, is an enemy as well. As Fremen naives who are convinced of his innocence await in the hall, Aaliyah receives a letter from the Lady Jessica. A few naives had come out to observe the treatment accorded of fellow Fremen. They'd brought on the clamor, exciting Korba to protest his innocence. Aaliyah moved her gaze across the Fremen faces, trying to recapture memories of the original men. The present blotted out the past. They'd all become hedonist, samplers of pleasures most men couldn't even imagine. Their uneasy glances she saw strayed often to the doorway into the chamber where they would meet. They were thinking of Muad'Dib's blind sight, a new manifestation of mysterious powers. By their law, a blind man should be abandoned in the desert, his water given up to Shai Halud. But eyeless Muad'Dib saw them. They disliked buildings too, and felt vulnerable in space built above the ground. Give them a proper cave cut from rock, then they could relax. But not here, not with this new Muad'Dib waiting inside. As she turned to go down to the meeting, she saw the letter where she'd left it on the table by the door, the latest message from their mother. Despite the special reverence held for Caladan as the place of Paul's birth, the Lady Jessica had emphasized her refusal to make her planet a stop on the Hajj. No doubt my son is an epical figure of history, she'd written, but I cannot see this as an excuse for submitting to a rabble invasion. Aaliyah touched the letter, experienced an odd sensation of mutual contact. The paper had been in her mother's hands, such an archaic device, the letter, but personal in a way that no recording could achieve. Written in the Atreides' battle tongue, it represented an almost invulnerable privacy of communication. Thinking of her mother afflicted Aaliyah with the usual inward blurring. The spice change that had mixed the psyches of mother and daughter forced her at times to think of Paul as a son to whom she had given birth. The capsule of complex oneness could present her own father as a lover. Ghost shadows cavorted her mind, people of possibility. 
Aaliyah reviewed the letter as she walked down the ramp to the antechamber, where her guard Amazons waited. You produce a deadly paradox, Jessica had written. Government cannot be religious and self-assertive at the same time. Religious experience needs a spontaneity, which laws inevitably suppress, and you cannot govern without laws. Your laws eventually must replace morality, replace conscience, replace even the religion by which you think to govern. Sacred ritual must spring from praise and holy yearnings which hammer out a significant morality. Government, on the other hand, is a cultural organism particularly attracted to doubts, questions, and contentions. I see the day coming when ceremony must take the place of faith and symbolism replaces morality. Korba, who has now been brought to the gallery, has denied the allegations against him, claiming that he took no part in the conspiracy to take down Paul Atreides. Where is Muad'Dib? he asked. My brother has delegated me to preside as a reverend mother, Aaliyah said. Hearing this, the naives in the gallery begin raising their voices in protest. Silence, Aaliyah commanded. In the abrupt quiet, she said, Is it not Fremen law that a reverend mother presides when life and death are at issue? As the gravity of her statement penetrated, stillness came over the naives. But Aaliyah marked angry stares across the rows of faces. She named them in her mind for a discussion in council. Horbors, Rafiri, Tasman, Sajid, Umbu, Leg. The names carried pieces of dune in them. Umbu Siech, Tasman Sink, Korbo's Gap. She turned her attention to Korba. Observing her attention, Korba lifted his chin, said, I protest my innocence. His tongue flickered between his teeth as he spoke. Not by word or deed have I been traitor to my Fremen vows. I demand to confront my accuser. A simple enough protest, Aaliyah thought, and she saw that it had produced a considerable effect on the Naibs. They knew Korba. He was one of them. To become a Naib, he proved his Fremen courage and caution. Not brilliant Korba, but reliable. Not one to lead a Jihad, perhaps but a good choice as supply officer. Not a crusader, but one who cherished the old Fremen virtues. The tribe is paramount. Otham's bitter words, as Paul had recited them, swept through Aaliyah's mind. She scanned the gallery. Any of those men might see himself in Corpus Place, some for good reason, but an innocent naive was as dangerous as a guilty one here. Corba felt it too. Who accuses me? he demanded. I have a Fremen right to confront my accuser. Perhaps you accuse yourself, Aaliyah said. Before he could mask it, mystical terror lay briefly on Korba's face. It was there for anyone to read. With her powers, Aaliyah had but to accuse him herself, saying she brought the evidence from the Shadow Region, the Alam al Mithil. Our enemies have Fremen allies, Aaliyah pressed. Water traps have been destroyed, Kanats blasted, plantings poisoned and storage basins plundered. And now they've stolen a worm from the desert, taken it to another world. The voice of this intrusion was known to all of them. Muad'Dib. Paul came through the doorway from the hall, pressed through the guard ranks and crossed to Aaliyah's side. Johnny accompanying him remained on the sidelines. My lord, Stilgar said, refusing to look at Paul's face. Paul aimed his empty sockets at the gallery, then down to Korba. What, Korba? No words of praise? Muttering could be heard in the gallery. It grew louder, isolated words and phrases audible. La for the blind, Fremen way, in the desert, who breaks? Who says I am blind? Paul demanded. He faced the gallery. You, Rai Thiri, I see you're wearing gold today, and that blue shirt beneath it which still has dust on it from the streets. You always were untidy. Rai Thiri made a warding gesture, three fingers against evil. Point those fingers at yourself, Paul shouted. We know where the evil is. He turned back to Korba. 
There is guilt on your face, Corba. Not my guilt. I may have associated with the guilty, but no. He broke off, shot a frightened look at the gallery. Taking her cue from Paul, Aaliyah Rose stepped down to the floor of the chamber, advanced to the edge of Corba's table. From a range of less than a meter, she stared down at him, silent and intimidating. Corba cowered under the burden of eyes. He fidgeted, shot anxious glances at the gallery. Whose eyes do you seek up there? Paul asked. You cannot see, Corba blurted. I don't need eyes to see you, Paul said, and he began describing Corba. Every movement, every twitch, every alarmed pleading look at the gallery. Corba mustered a pitiful air of pomposity to plead. Who accuses me? Otham accuses you, Aaliyah said. But Otham's dead, Corba protested. How did you know that? Paul asked. Through your spy system? Oh yes, we know about your spies and couriers. We know who brought the stone burner here from Tarahel. It was for the defense of the Quizarat, Corba blurted. Is that how it got into your traitorous hands? Paul asked. It was stolen, and we... Corba fell silent, swallowed. His gaze darted left and right. Everyone knows I have been the voice of love for Muad'Dib. He stared at the gallery. How can a dead man accuse a Fremen? Otham's voice isn't dead, Aaliyah said. She stopped as Paul touched her arm. Otham sent us his voice, Paul said. It gives the names, the acts of treachery, the meeting places and the times. Do you miss certain faces in the Council of Naibs, Korba? Where are Merker and Fash? Keek the Lame isn't with us today. And Takum, where is he? Korva shook his head from side to side. They fled Arrakis with the stolen worm, Paul said. Even if I freed you now, Korba, Shai Halud would have your water for your part in this. Why don't I free you, Korba? Think of all those men whose eyes were taken. The men who cannot see as I see. They have families and friends, Korba. Where could you hide from them? It was an accident, Korba pleaded. Anyway, they're getting to lay Laksu. Again, he subsided. Who knows what bondage goes with metal eyes, Paul asked. The naives in their gallery begin exchanging whispered comments, speaking behind raised hands. They gazed coldly at Korba now. Korba demands to face his accuser, but Paul says his accuser is Otham. They have his voice by way of Bijaz. The other Fremen conspirators have fled Arrakis with the worm they kidnapped. Korba insists that he be judged by Fremen law, and Stilgar agrees, because he plans to take care of Korba himself later. Aaliyah realizes that this was a plan between Paul and Stilgar to flush out the other traitors. As hate, the Duncan Idaho Gola interrogates the dwarf Bijaz later, the Tleilaxu plot pans out. Hate had been implanted with a secret command, even he was not aware of. It is revealed that Bijaz was secretly a Tleilaxu master with a hidden purpose. By use of an extremely specific humming intonation, Bijaz implants conditioning that will force Duncan to kill Paul in the appropriate instance. After this interrogation, Duncan remembers none of this. Aaliyah has grown frustrated. She wishes to see as her brother Paul sees. She has consumed an enormous dose of spice in an attempt to induce spice trance. Hate finds her in this state. She tells him that the Bene Gesserit are hoping to get their breeding program back in line by getting Paul's child, or hers, though she cannot see who the father of her child will be, however. Hate realizes that she is likely overdosed on spice, and he could not bear the thought of Aaliyah's death. He wants to call for a doctor. Aaliyah realizes in that moment that the Gola loves her, and the doctor is called to help with her overdose. Aaliyah tells Hate that she wishes she were not a part of Paul's story, that she wants the ability to laugh and love. She also asks Duncan if he loves her, and he admits that he does. He tries to get her to sleep, but she tells him about the plot against Paul and how bad it has become. 
She drifts off thinking of the child she will have one day and how that child will be preborn, just as she was. As Chani's time to give birth nears, Paul and Chani journey to Sich Tabur with a group of odd companions. Bijaz, the Tleilaxu dwarf, the Gola Hate, Edric, the Guild Steersman Ambassador, Gaius Helen Mohayim, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, Lichna, Otham's strange daughter, who Paul knew was secretly the Tleilaxu face dancer Skytel, Stilgar, and his favorite wife Hera, the Princess Irulan, Adelia. Chani is confused as to why Paul has brought so many with them into the desert, including enemies. As Chani looks out into the desert near the siege where she will give birth, Hate insists that she must come inside to avoid the coming sandstorm. For some reason, Hate is gripped by the fear that Chani will die and that Paul will tell him so. He does not yet understand that the panic is due to his Tleilaxu conditioning, which was activated earlier by the dwarf Bajaz. Chani dies giving birth. Once Paul receives the news, the grief of his loss is too much to bear. Paul stumbles and is truly blind now. Having removed himself from the prison of his own precise vision, Paul's reaction to Chani's death finally triggers hate's compulsion and he attempts to kill Paul by stabbing him with a knife. However, the inner turmoil is so great that Duncan Idaho's Gola body reacts against its own programming and recovers Duncan's full consciousness. He now remembers his previous life and is no longer bound to Tleilaxu programming. Paul discovers that Chani has given birth to twins. They are pre-born, just as his sister Aaliyah was, born into the world with access to ancestral memories. Thanks to the combinations of their genes and Chani's consumption of spice while pregnant, Paul is shocked that in no vision had he foreseen twins. Lichna, who reveals herself to be the Tleilaxu face dancer Skytel, offers to revive Chani as a Gola in exchange for all of Paul's Chome Company holdings. This was the Tleilaxu plot from the beginning, to convince Paul that the memories of a Gola could be reawakened and to use this as leverage upon Chani's death. I am Skytel, a Tleilaxu of the Face Dancers, and I would know a thing before we bargain. Is that a Gola I see behind you, or Duncan Idaho? It's Duncan Idaho, Paul said, and I will not bargain with you. I think you'll bargain, Skytel said. Duncan, Paul said, speaking over his shoulder, Will you kill this Tleilaxu if I ask? Yes, my lord. There was the suppressed rage of a berserker in Idaho's voice. Wait, Elias said. You don't know what you're rejecting. But I do know, Paul said. So it's truly Duncan Idaho of the Atreides, Skytel said. We found the lever. Agola can regain his past. Paul heard footsteps. Something brushed past him on the left. Skytel's voice came from behind him now. What do you remember of your past, Duncan? Everything. From my childhood on. I even remember you at the tank when they removed me from it, Idaho said. Wonderful, Skytel breathed. Wonderful. Paul heard the voice moving. I need a vision, he thought. Darkness frustrated him. Bene Gesserit training warned him of terrifying menace in Skytel, yet the creature remained a voice, a shadow of movement, entirely beyond him. Are these the Atreides babies? Skytel asked. Hera, Paul cried. Get her away from there. Stay where you are, Skytel shouted. All of you, I warn you. A face dancer can move faster than you suspect. My knight can have both these lies before you touch me. Paul felt someone touch his right arm, then move to the right. That's far enough, Aaliyah, Skytel said. Aaliyah, Paul said. Don't. It's my fault, Aaliyah groaned. My fault, Atreides, Skytel said. Shall we bargain now? Behind him, Paul heard a single hoarse curse, his throat constricted at the suppressed violence in Idaho's voice. Idaho must not break. Skytel would kill the babies. To strike a bargain, one requires a thing to sell, Skytel said. 
Not so, Atreides. Will you have your Chani back? We can restore her to you. Agola, Atreides. Agola with full memory. But we must hurry. Call your friends to bring a cryologic tank to preserve the flesh. To hear Chani's voice once more, Paul thought. To feel her presence beside me. Ah, that's why they gave me Idaho as Agola. To let me discover how much the recreation is like the original. But now, full restoration, at their price. I'd be a Tleilaxu tool forevermore. And Chani, chained to the same fate by a threat to our children, exposed once more to the Quizarat's plotting. What pressures would you use to restore Chani's memories to her? Paul asked, fighting to keep his voice calm. Would you condition her? To kill one of her own children? We use whatever pressures we need, Skytel said. What say you, Atreides? Aaliyah, Paul said, bargain with this thing. I cannot bargain with what I cannot see. A wise choice, Skytel gloated. Well, Aaliyah, what do you offer me as your brother's agent? Paul lowered his head, bringing himself to stillness within stillness. He glimpsed something just then, like a vision but not a vision. It had been a knife close to him. There. Give me a moment to think, Elias said. My knife is patient, Skytel said, but Chani's flesh is not. Take a reasonable amount of time. Paul felt himself blinking. It could not be, but it was. He felt eyes. Their vantage point was odd. They moved in an erratic way. There, the knife swam in his view. With a breath-stealing shock, Paul recognized the viewpoint. It was that of one of his children. He was seeing Skytel's knife hand from within the crash. It glittered only inches from him. Yes, and he could see himself across the room as well, head down, standing quietly, a figure of no menace, ignored by the others in this room. To begin, you might assign us all your chome holdings, Skytel suggested. All of them, Aaliyah protested. All. Watching himself through the eyes in the crash, Paul slipped his Chris knife from his belt sheath. The movement produced a strange sensation of duality. He measured the distance, the angle. There'd be no second chance. He prepared his body then, in the Bene Gesserit way, armed himself like a cocked spring for a single concentrated movement, a prana thing, requiring all his muscles balanced in one exquisite unity. The Chris knife leaped from his hand, the milky blur of it flashed into Skytel's right eye, jerked the face dancer's head back. Skytel threw both hands up and staggered backwards against the wall. His knife clattered off the ceiling. To hit the floor. Skytail rebounded from the wall. He fell face forward, dead before he touched the floor. The reawakening of Duncan's memories confirms to Paul that it is indeed possible to restore Chani as she once was. Still, Paul refuses, understanding that even if they were to bring Chani back, the Tleilaxu would likely program the Gola in some diabolical way, as they did with Duncan. Though Paul is blind due to escaping his oracular trap, he manages to kill Skytel with a dagger by tapping into the vision of his preborn son. Paul names the boy child Leto for his father, and the girl Ganima, meaning spoil of war. Bijaz comes in and insists that the plan succeeded despite Skytel's death. The Tleilaxu knew that Idaho thought of Paul as the son he never had, so he would not kill him if he resurfaced. He offers again to restore Chani, and Paul is more tempted than before. He orders Duncan to kill Bijaz to prevent this, and Duncan does. Now that Paul is truly blind, both prophetically and literally, he chooses to embrace Fremen tradition. He walks into the desert alone. His children will now inherit his empire. Until the children come of age, Aaliyah will rule as regent. 
Duncan does not believe that Paul will perish in the desert, but no one can say for sure. Aaliyah is furious after the loss of Paul. She has Edric, the guild navigator, executed for his part in the conspiracy. The Reverend Mother Gaius is also executed, despite Paul's previous orders to spare her life. Aaliyah is racked with grief, calling her brother a fool for giving in to this path. She has had no more vision since the death of Chani. Irulan now insists that she loved Paul, but never knew it. Irulan has promised to renounce the Bene Gesserit and spend her life training Paul's children. Aaliyah can sense Irulan's sincerity. Duncan realizes that now the Bene Gesserit have no hold on any of the Atreides' heirs, with Irulan on their side. Aaliyah pleads with Duncan to love her and tells him that she loves him. He does, and agrees to follow her wherever she leads him. Dune Messiah was not the novel that people expected after the epic that was Dune. Messiah is meant to illustrate that the life of Muad'Dib was a tragic one. Paul is no true savior, any more than he is a deity. He did what he believed he had to do, but still ultimately just traded one brand of tyranny for another. Paul insists in this novel that people prefer tyrants to kind rulers. He argues that freedom results in chaos. In Dune Messiah we observe a society where this idea has subsumed an empire of billions and resulted in unimaginable slaughter. But this book is not just making the argument against the deification of human beings, it is also a criticism of the system that conditions people in a way that makes it so that they can be manipulated by such human beings. Taking into account the long view of history, Paul can be blamed for some of the chaos and slaughter that fell upon the universe, but not the entirety of it. There was, in fact, a structure that led to his rise, a system. The Bene Gesserit Missionara Protectiva, their myth-seeding, their legend-making. Without myths and legends and religion, the rise of Paul Muad'Dib is something that could have never occurred. He was a player in a game that started long before he was born. The message of Dune Messiah, in a nutshell, is when you mix religion and government, terrible things can happen as a result. Paul Atreides was never a god, and terrible things happen when you put your faith in charismatic leaders, specifically ones of a religious nature. Dune Messiah sets up Children of Dune, ending with the birth of Paul's pre-born children Leto II and Ganema, who will become the future rulers of the Imperium. Leto will continue the golden path that Paul abandoned. He will maneuver fate and transcend time like Paul never could. Muad'Dib's teachings have become the playground of scholastics of the superstitious and the corrupt. He taught a balanced way of life, a philosophy by which a human can meet problems arising from an ever-changing universe. He said mankind is still evolving, in a process which will never end. He said this evolution moves on changing principles, which are known only to eternity. How can corrupted reasoning play with such an essence? Children of Dune takes place nine years after Dune Messiah, 
in this time, the Empire is ruled by Elia Atreides, who maintains the regency until Paul's twins, Leto and Ganema, come of age. Paul's twins are like no other children that have ever lived before. In truth, they are millions of years old. A perfect combination of genes and a mother's heavy consumption of spice led these children to become pre-born, forced into consciousness with all the memories of their ancestors. Although Aaliyah was pre-born as the twins were, she does not share their experience. The twins' connections to their past lives seems to be more fluid. Aaliyah avoided the intricacies over her inner world and therefore did not possess the mental linkages that the twins had. For example, they were able to speak fluently in many ancient languages where Aaliyah would only be able to catch a word or two. Aaliyah now has undergone the spice trance, and as a result, the unimaginable has happened. The very thing the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohayim feared in Book 1. That child is an abomination! Her mother deserves a punishment greater than any in history! Death! It cannot come too quickly for that child or the one who spawned her. When a child is preborn, the weight of the ancestral memories is crushing. If the child cannot form a sufficient ego, a more dominant ego within the other memories would take possession of the person. The Bene Gesserit call this abomination. These abominations were feared and considered very dangerous by the sisterhood. Anyone who was believed to be abomination was immediately killed. This is why the Reverend Mother calls for Aaliyah's death in Dune. Why did you abandon Aaliyah? Ganima asked. I fled in terror of what I created, Jessica said, her voice low. I gave up, and my burden now is that. Perhaps I gave up too soon. What do you mean? I cannot explain yet, but maybe. No, I'll not give you false hopes. Gafla, the abominable distraction, has a long history in human mythology. It was called many things, but chiefly it was called possession. That's what it seems to be. You lose your way in the malignancy, and it takes possession of you. Aaliyah is possessed. Abomination. Her mind infected with the evil presence of her grandfather, the Baron Harkonnen, whose ego memory now seeks revenge against House Atreides. He has poisoned Aaliyah's psyche, and there is seemingly no help for her. The Baron is a constant shadow in Aaliyah's mind, watching through her eyes. The twins have recognized this, and only pity Aaliyah. They worry, though, that they even may one day succumb to possession. In the decades since Dune Messiah, the planet Arrakis has changed drastically. The ecological transformation has led to the point where there are now clouds in the skies of Dune. It even rained on occasion. Instead of still suits, many Fremen now took pills which shifted the body's temperature and reduced water loss. Why should they? When rain had been recorded on this planet. When clouds were seen. When eight Fremen had been inundated and killed by a flash flood in Awadi. Until that event, the word drowned had not existed in the language of Dune. But this was no longer Dune. This was Arrakis. Thoughts of Stilgar. As the planet has changed, Fremen culture has eroded. Many Fremen have left the sieges for the villages and cities. Stilgar has noticed this change, and he has changed as well. Over time he has come to realize that Paul Muad'Dib was also flesh and blood, not a messiah. He is now much wiser than he was in the days before Paul walked into the desert. Yet still, he longs for what he refers to as cleaner values. Stilgar longs for a time when he could believe without question, when he didn't have to consider the fact that the Jihad was killing millions because he knew that it was the will of God and God had a plan. Now that Stilgar knows the truth, he has become more like Paul, more like God, and he cannot unsee the horror that Paul always saw, hence him longing for cleaner values. He longs for a simpler time, when he was more naive about what was really going on. Children of Dune opens at a very interesting time. It is on this very day that the Lady Jessica returns to Arrakis, for the first time since the day she left for Caladan 20 years ago. 
Aaliyah is anxious about Jessica's return. She knows of Jessica's power as a Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, and she fears that her mother will recognize the signs of abomination. Jessica's return also shakes the balance of power on Arrakis. Jessica is the mother of Muad'Dib, and would have huge sway over the Fremen. It has also been rumored that Lady Jessica has returned to the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. Aaliyah is extremely bitter towards the Sisterhood and her mother. She blames them for the way that she is. The Sisterhood had only been seeking to breed a Kwisatz Haderach, the male counterpart of a fully developed Reverend Mother, and more, a human of superior sensitivity and awareness, the Kwisatz Haderach, who could be in many places simultaneously, and the Lady Jessica, merely a pawn in that breeding program, had the bad taste to fall in love with the breeding partner to whom she had been assigned. Responsive to her beloved Duke's wishes, she produced a son and set up the daughter which the Sisterhood had commanded as the firstborn, leaving me to be born after she became addicted to the spice. And now they don't want me. Now they fear me with good reason. Aaliyah has come to realize that the ecological transformation which now grips the planet will ultimately result in the death of all the worms spice production would end. The twins have realized this as well, and the creature inside Aaliyah desperately desires this. When Jessica returns to Arrakis, her Bene Gesserit powers immediately force her to become aware of many things. She notices that many of the million or so that have gathered to witness the arrival of the Mother of God are pilgrims. These pilgrims have been arriving more and more in order to experience the planet of the Messiah. Jessica also notices that both Irulan and Aaliyah are utilizing forbidden Bene Gesserit techniques to prevent aging. She refers to this as an affront. Many Reverend Mothers could choose that course, or try it. The manipulation of internal chemistry was available to initiates of the Sisterhood. But if one did it, sooner or later all would try it. There could be no concealing such an accumulation of ageless women. They knew for certainty that this course would lead them to destruction. Short-lived humanity would turn upon them. No, it was unthinkable. Using this technique, a Bene Gesserit could potentially live for thousands of years, but the Sisterhood understood that the backlash from a universe which relied on spice to extend life would be too great and ultimately lead the Sisterhood to annihilation. This is why Jessica is disturbed by both Irulan and Aaliyah's use of this technique. But Jessica noticed something far more terrible in Aaliyah. The rumors were true. Horrible. Horrible. Aaliyah had fallen into the forbidden way. The evidence was there for the initiate to read. Abomination. Jessica instantly recognizes the signs of possession in her daughter, and knows from that moment on that her daughter is her enemy. She wonders then if the twins too have succumbed to abomination. Recently, on Arrakis, a mysterious blind man known as the Preacher has appeared. He speaks blasphemy against the church and also against the government. Many people believe him to be Paul Atreides himself. Aaliyah and the twins view this as a possibility. Aaliyah wishes to have the Preacher arrested for heresy. He raised both arms and roared in a voice which surely had commanded worm riders. Silence! The entire throng in the plaza went still at that battle cry. The preacher pointed a thin hand toward the dancers, and the illusion that he actually saw them was uncanny. Did you not hear this, man? Blasphemers and idolaters, all of you! The religion of Muad'Dib is not Muad'Dib. He spurns it as he spurns you. Sand will cover this place. Sand will cover you. Saying this, he dropped his arms, put a hand on his young guy's shoulder, and commanded, Take me from this place. Far away on the planet Seleucus Secundus, Wincesia Carino, the younger sister of Irulan, plots treachery. Her plot involves assassinating the twins, using laser tigers, large and powerful cats who could be controlled from a distance by a transmitter, due to servo stimulators implanted in their brains as cubs. Laser Tigers were a special breed brought to the planet nearly 8,000 years ago. 
They were created through genetic manipulation of original tigers. They have huge fangs, wide faces, and enlarged paws. Their coats were an even colored tan, perfect for blending against sand. Wincesia's son, Faradin, is not aware of his mother's plan. Wincesia wishes to steal the imperial seat from House Atreides and make Faradin emperor. Once Jessica is alone with the twins on Arrakis, she can see that Ganema is not possessed. Leto, however, she is not sure. Something about him disturbs her. When she is alone with him, he demonstrates his power to her. Throughout their conversation, he manipulates her through voice and eventually breaks her Bene Gesserit conditioning. Abruptly, she realized that the quickened breath, the pounding heart, were not latent not held at bay by her Bene Gesserit control. Eyes widening in shocked awareness, she felt her own flesh obeying other commands. Slowly she recovered her poise, but the realization remained. This unchild had been playing her like a fine instrument throughout their interview. Now you know how profoundly you are conditioned by your precious Bene Gesserits, he said. The realization that Leto had been manipulating her through their conversation shatters Jessica's reality. She is still, however, unsure about Leto, though she observes his power. Leto commands Jessica to allow herself to be abducted by Aaliyah's men. Leto is aware that prescience is what destroyed his father. He knows that within the spice trance lies even greater risk for himself. Leto has seen three possible futures. In one, he must kill Jessica in order to prevent the loss of the Spice Monopoly. In the second, he would marry his sister Ganema for the sake of House Atreides. But the third future would permit him to live millennia and require him to undeify his father, to remove Paul's godhood. Aaliyah and Duncan's relationship has become strained in Children of Dune. Since her possession, she has engaged in an affair with Javid, the High Priest of the Quisarat. Duncan Idaho's Mintat abilities kick in whilst Aaliyah is attempting to convince him to help her kidnap Jessica. He realizes that Aaliyah has succumbed to possession. He points out to Aaliyah that the simpler option would be to kill the Lady Jessica, and he notices the signs of an alien presence when she seems clearly pleased by the suggestion, though she stills the emotion quickly. Duncan agrees to kidnap Jessica, but insists that Aaliyah not know where he is taking her. He tells her that this way, she would be immune to the power of a truth-sayer. He leaves her then, and tears fall from his metal eyes. Aaliyah is gone. In secret, the heretic preacher journeys to the planet Seleucus Secundus and meets Faradin, nephew to Irulan and future leader of House Carino. The preacher promises Faradin that he will have Duncan Idaho as his agent, Faradin finds the preacher strange and indecipherable. At the halfway mark of Children of Dune, Aaliyah's true intentions are revealed when she attempts to assassinate the Lady Jessica in the open. Now look at her, Jessica pointed at Aaliyah. She laughs alone at night in contemplation of her own evil. Spice production will fall to nothing or at best a fraction of its former level. And when word of that gets out, We'll have a corner on the most priceless product in the universe, Aaliyah shouted. We'll have a corner on hell, Jessica raged. And Aaliyah lapsed into the most ancient Jacopsa, the Atreides' private language, with its difficult glottal stops and clicks. Now you know, mother. Did you think a granddaughter of Baron Harkonnen would not appreciate all of the lifetimes you crushed into my awareness before I was even born? When I raged against what you'd done to me, I had only asked myself what the Baron would have done. And he answered, Understand me, Atreides bitch! He answered me! Jessica heard the venom and the confirmation of her guess. Abomination. Aaliyah had been overwhelmed within, possessed by that Kuwait of evil, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. The Baron himself spoke from her mouth now, uncaring of what was revealed. He wanted her to see his revenge, wanted her to know that he could not be cast out. Jessica manages to escape from Aaliyah into the desert with the help of the Fated King. Now that the mother of Paul Atreides has renounced Aaliyah, the Fremen are now in open rebellion. 
During these events, the twins have also escaped into the desert in search of the preacher. It is in the desert that they are attacked by the Leza Tigers, who have been brought on the planet by Wimsishia Carino with the help of Fremen traders. The children defeat the Tigers, but not easily, and it is at this point that they begin the next phase in their plan. They split. Leto leaves going deeper into the desert to seek out the preacher. Ganema masks her own memory through a form of self-hypnosis. She implants false memories of her brother's death, truly believing it, thus making her immune to the power of a truth-sayer. Ganema stilled herself for what she had to do. Leto must be dead in her mind. She had to make herself believe it. There could be no Jakarutu in her mind. No brother out there seeking a place lost in Fremen mythology. From this point onward, she could not think of Leto as alive. She must condition herself to act out of a total belief that her brother was dead, killed here by Leza Tigers. Not many humans could fool a truth-sayer, but she knew that she could do it, might have to do it. The multi-lives she and Leto shared had taught them the way. When Jessica had first returned to Arrakis, captives were taken from the throng of people awaiting her. When subjected to what Gurney Halleck describes as the deep drugs, some of the captives spoke the name Jakarutu. And as they said the word, they died. It is assumed that they were conditioned for this reaction. Long before the days of House Atreides on Arrakis, before Liet Kynes, before the rule of Shaddam IV, there were certain tribes that roamed the desert known as Water Hunters. The Fremen called them Iduali, Water Insects. They would steal the water of Fremen they caught in the desert, even the water of the body. The siege they lived in was called Jakarutu, and it was in Jakarutu that the other Fremen tribes banded together to destroy the Iduali. The place was considered taboo after that, and from that day forth, no Fremen had gone to Jakarutu. Its very location was lost. The remaining Iduwale, according to legend, were cast out from Fremen society. For most Fremen, Jakarutu was considered a myth, but Leto has begun to have prescient dreams of Jakarutu and believes he can find the preacher there. From the desert, Jessica sends a message to Stilgar, telling him that her daughter, Aaliyah, is indeed possessed. Whilst waiting for a response, Duncan Idaho arrives, having been sent by Stilgar. Jessica allows Duncan to abduct her. She tells him that Aaliyah is no longer Atreides. She has succumbed to the ego of another. He is bound to the Atreides, not Aaliyah. The acceptance of this makes Duncan Idaho sad. He tells her that he is taking her to Seleucus Secundus on behalf of the Preacher, who, for some reason, has asked that she train Farad and Carino in the ways of the Bene Gesserit. Jessica suspects that Duncan may know the true identity of the Preacher, so she asks if the Preacher is indeed Paul, but Duncan does not know. On Seleucia, Faradin has learned of his mother Winsashia's plan to kill the Atreides twins. He is, however, unsure how to deal with this information or how to feel about the situation. By the time Jessica and Duncan arrive on Seleucia Secundus, the word of Leto II's death has spread. Word is also spread that Aaliyah has agreed to allow herself to be tested in the Fremen trial of possession, which would determine the truth of the matter and end in Aaliyah's death if the accusation proved valid. Aaliyah has agreed to this in an effort to calm the civil war which is now broken out between the once united Fremen of the desert. The Imperial Fremen and the Desert Fremen are now at odds. Faradin does not understand the purpose of this trial by possession. In fact, many do not. It is an obscure Fremen thing. Jessica tells Faradin that she has come to this planet at the suggestion of the Sisterhood to oversee his education. She tells him that in order to teach him properly, she would need to be given free reign of the planet Seleucia. Duncan's Mintat powers kick in and he finds himself coming to a realization. He explains to Jessica that they have been tricked. He has realized that Faradin is expected to get rid of both he and the Lady Jessica. Plans within plans. This would cause a conflict out in the open between House Atreides, the now Imperial House, and House Carino, the former Imperial House. This would allow the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood to act as a mediator and arbitrate a marriage between Faradin and Ganema. This way the Sisterhood would finally have control over a quiz at Hadarak. The Sisterhood had not given Jessica the full truth. They had lied to her. She had betrayed them before. 
Jessica convinces Farad to accept her offer to be his teacher. She tells him that she will train him in the ways of the Bene Gesserit, as she trained her son Paul Atreides more than 20 years ago. Later, when Duncan speaks to Jessica, he renounces House Atreides and speaks of how there are now entire groups of Fremen who curse their name. At the preacher's bidding, he joined one of the groups, the Tsar Sadis. Jessica is not sure of Duncan's intentions, and they both know that Faradin is having their conversation recorded. She attempts to get more information out of Duncan, but Duncan resists, and wonders if he had finally breached the walls of her Bene Gesserit training. Idaho backed away from her, until he felt the door behind him. He bowed. Once more I called you my lady, and then never again. My advice to Faradin will be to send you back to Wallach quietly and quickly. At the earliest practical moment, you are too dangerous a toy to keep around, although I don't believe he thinks of you as a toy. You are working for the Sisterhood, not for the Atreides. I wonder now if you ever worked for the Atreides. You witches move too deeply and darkly for mere mortals to ever trust. Angola considers himself a mere mortal, she jibed. Compared to you, he said. Leave, she ordered. Such is my intention. He slipped out the door, passing the curious stare of the servant who'd obviously been listening. It's done, he thought, and they can read it only one way. Outwardly, it would seem that Duncan has abandoned House Atreides and gone over fully to House Carino, but Duncan's inner monologue would suggest otherwise. Though there is a warrant for the arrest of the preacher on Arrakis, he appears in the square on Kwisatz Haderach Day to give a sermon on the death of Leto II. Aaliyah has disguised herself as a commoner and gone out into the crowd to hear. She has long suspected that the preacher is in fact Paul, and she fears him, but knows she cannot harm him. With a terrifying directness, the preacher reached out, grabbed Aaliyah's arm. It was done without any groping or hesitation. She tried to pull away but he held her in a painful grip, speaking directly into her face as those around them edged back in confusion. What did Paul Atreides tell you, woman? He demanded. How does he know I'm a woman? She asked herself. She wanted to sink into her inner lives, ask their protection, but the world within remained frighteningly silent, mesmerized by this figure from their past. He told you that completion equals death, the preacher shouted. Absolute prediction is completion, is death. She tried to pry his fingers away. She wanted to grab her knife and slash him away from her, but she dared not. She had never felt this daunted in all her life. The preacher lifted his chin to speak over her to the crowd. Shouted, I give you Muad'Dib's words, he said. I'm going to rub your faces in things you try to avoid. I don't find it strange that all you want to believe is only that which comforts you. How else do humans invent the traps which betray us into mediocrity? How else do we define cowardice? That's what Muad'Dib told you. Abruptly, he released Aaliyah's arm, thrust her into the crowd. She would have fallen, but for the press of people supporting her. To exist is to stand out away from the background, the preacher said. You aren't thinking or really existing unless you're willing to risk even your own sanity in judgment of your existence. Stepping down, the preacher once more took Aaliyah's arm, no faltering or hesitation. He was gentler this time, though. Leaning close, he pitched his voice for her ears alone. Stop trying to pull me once more into the background, sister. Then, hand on his young guide's shoulder, he stepped into the throng. Way was made for the strange pair. Hands reached out to touch the preacher, but people reached with an awesome tenderness, fearful of what they might find beneath that dusty Fremen robe. Aaliyah stood alone in her shock as the throng moved out behind the preacher. Certainty filled her. It was Paul. No doubt remained. It was her brother. Abandon certainty. That's life's deepest command. That's what life's all about. We probe into the unknown, into the uncertain. 
Why can't you hear Muad'Dib? If certainty is knowing absolutely an absolute future, then that's only death disguised. Such a future becomes now. Leto has driven a worm deep into the desert, and has finally found the place he believes to be Jakarutu, but he is concerned when he can find no trace of water. He heads to the siege and is captured by a man who forces him unconscious. When Leto wakes, he sees Namri, father of Javid, the lover and servant of Aaliyah. Namri tells him that he must complete schooling in this place, and if he didn't, he would die. Namri also tells Leto that he soon will come face to face with the man who captured him. When Leto wakes again, he sees the face of none other than Gurney Halleck, who was sent to capture him on Jessica's orders. Their plan is to force Leto to undergo the spice trance, as Paul did, and begin unlocking his vision. He saw the illusion. The entire illusion process rotated half a turn. And now he knew a center from which he could watch without purpose the flight of his visions, of his inner lives. Elation flooded him. It made him want to laugh, but he denied himself this luxury, knowing it would bar the doors of memory. Ah, my memories, he thought. I have seen your illusion. You no longer invent the next moment for me. You merely show me how to create new moments. I'll not lock myself on the old tracks. Repeatedly, he was forced into spice trance, and each time he came out, Namri and Gurney were unsure whether or not to slay him. Leto sees much in his visions, and at times nearly loses sight of himself within the boundaries of time. He tells Namri and Gurney that the problem with his father's rule of the Empire was that it sought to bring peace, but however peace was only defined by a specific way of life, which did not leave people contented. He tells Gurney that he will indeed one day work with the Sisterhood, but they will not like it. The visions cause Leto to grow very weak, and he curses his grandmother for utilizing such a drawn-out gum jabbar. Meanwhile, Irulan and Aaliyah have been trying to convince Ganima to accept Faradin's proposal. Ganima is furious, and wants to kill Faradin as revenge for Leto's death, even though he has blamed his mother for the attack. Irulan even at one point attempts to use voice on Ganima, but this backfires horribly. Why do you and Aaliyah grow so suddenly quiet? Irulan asks, reverting to her previous question, but casting it now in a delicate mode of voice. Ganima threw back her head in laughter. Irulan, you try voice on me? What? Irulan was taken aback. You'd teach your grandmother to suck eggs, Ganima said. I'd what? The fact that I remember the expression and you've never heard it before should give you pause, Ganima said. It was an old expression of scorn when you Bene Gesserit were young. Ganima is done being treated like a child and angrily insists that Irulan and Aaliyah leave her presence. But Aaliyah is intrigued by Ganima's anger and makes a deal with her. She will marry Faradin to get the Lady Jessica back, but she would kill Faradin the first chance she got. Though Irulan is against this, Ganima is insistent. On Seleucus Secundus, Jessica has begun the slow process of training Faradin in the Bene Gesserit ways. Faradin learns the teachings faster than Jessica expected, but he is still in the very early stages. During the storm, Leto escapes Gurney into the desert. He takes a still suit and a still tent with him. Leto heads directly into the storm and hides within the tent to wait it out. However, when he awakes, he finds the hill pumps on his still suit have been cut and he has lost half of his water. He finds a worm and rides it deeper into the desert until he comes across a band of Fremen renegades. He soon discerns that they are from Shulak. Stories of Shulak were often shared amongst Fremen Everyone considered it to be a myth, a place for interesting things to happen only for the sake of a story. Leto has now fully realized what has happened. The original Jakarutu had indeed been renamed Fondak and had become a place for smugglers, but the cast out of Jakarutu had gone to Shulak.
He knows that this is where he will find the preacher. He reveals to Muriz that he is the son of Paul Atreides, and tells him that if they kill him, his people will sink into the sand, but if they let him live, he will lead them to greatness. An uneasy alliance is formed between Leto and Miris. You speak of leading us, Miris said. Fremen are led by men who have been bloodied. What can you lead us in? Kralazak, Leto said, keeping his attention on the crouched figure. Miris glared at him, brows contracted over his indigo eyes. Kralazak, that wasn't merely a war or revolution. That was the Typhoon Struggle. It was a word from the furthermost Fremen legends, the battle at the end of the universe. Kralazek. In the Dune universe, Kralazek is the long foretold mythic battle at the end of the universe, a legend, but here Leto implies that it is actually real. Back at Fondak, Namri reveals to Gurney that he has in fact been following the orders of Aaliyah and not Jessica as he believed. It was Aaliyah who wished to subject Leto to the spice trance. Gurney ends up killing the man and escapes to find Stilgar, knowing that Aaliyah will want him dead. In Shulok, the golden path begins. Leto goes to the Kanat, where the worms and the sand trout are kept. The cast out of Shulok have been selling the worms off world, though they do not live long. Leto allows one of the sand trout to cover his hand. On Arrakis, Fremen children often played a game. If a sand trout was placed in a hand, it would sense the water in the capillaries and cover the entire hand. Eventually, the sand trout glove would fall off, having been repelled by something in the blood's water. Sand trout can join together, locking body to body in order to become a single sac-like organism, enclosing a body of water. He allows the sand trout to cover his whole body, creating a sand trout membrane, which behaves like a living, permanent still suit. The sand trout membrane adjusted to Leto's body and begin integrating, changing him into something not quite human, something beyond human. The sand trout had never before encountered a body containing so much spice. Leto adjusted his internal enzymes and blended himself with the sand trout, feeding it and feeding on it. His vision provided all the knowledge he needed to do so, and he followed it perfectly. The sand trout was no longer sand trout, but something tougher and stronger, and he knew that it would only grow stronger, giving him godlike strength and speed. He got to his feet, turned to run back toward the hut. As he moved, he found his feet moving too fast for him to balance. He plunged into the sand, rolled and leaped to his feet. The leap took him two meters off the sand, and when he fell back trying to walk, he again moved too fast. Stop, he commanded himself. He fell into the Pranabindu forced relaxation, gathering his senses into the pool of consciousness. This focused the inward ripples of the constant now, through which he experienced time, and he allowed the vision elation to warm him. The membrane worked precisely as the vision had predicted. My skin is not my own. The sand trout membrane would also provide Leto with unlimited spice, and he could swim through the sands with lightning speed. Face to face, Leto confronts a worm out in the deep desert. He finds that it will not harm him. Worms will not attack sand trout, the deep sand vector of its own kind. He decides that he will use his powers to destroy the center's key to the ecological transformation of Arrakis. This would set the transformation back decades and would allow Leto to rearrange the plan for Arrakis. He knew that only the necessities of his vision mattered now. Only the golden path could come from this ordeal. Here was the great leap onto the golden path. He had put on the living, self-repairing still suit of a sand trout membrane, a thing of unmeasurable value on Arrakis. Until you understood the price, I am no longer human. The legends about this night will grow and magnify it beyond anything recognizable by the participants, but it will become truth, that legend. In the deep desert, Leto places himself in the path of Paul's worm, and the creature stops. 
Paul's guide is Tariq, son of Muriz. Leto reveals himself and insists that he and his father spend the evening together. Using a pseudo shield, Tariq attempts to kill Paul and Leto by utilizing the maddening effect that the Holtzman effect has on the great worms. Nothing could stop a worm in the presence of a shield, not water or the presence of sand trout. Tariq had been commanded by Jakarutu to do away with both Atreides. It is at this point that the separate visions of Paul and Leto come into conflict. The preacher, following the sound of Leto's voice, clambered up the dune slope and stood two paces away. It was done with a swift sureness which told Leto this would be no easy contest. Here the visions parted. When Paul walked into the desert, many years ago, he had truly wanted to die. When the baby Leto had shared sight with him, Paul had had a vision. He was resigned to be a tool of revenge for Jakarutu. Jakarutu had been waiting for him that night, as he knew they would be. They wanted his visions, but he gave them none. Even when they forced him into trance using the spice essence, he had baited Aaliyah, confused and tempted her into making incorrect decisions. Jakarutu used Paul as bait to trap Aaliyah, and now she knows that the preacher is indeed Paul. Paul is prepared to die. He ran from Leto's vision, and Leto felt the tension grow between himself and his father. It was a shadow play all around them, a projection of unconscious forms, and Leto felt the memories of his father, a form of backwards prophecy which sorted visions from the familiar reality of this moment. Paul insists to Leto that he cannot control the future, but Leto knew that one of them would have to act, make a decision choosing a vision. Leto understood, however, that Paul was correct. Attempting to take ultimate control of the universe could only lead to the ultimate defeat of you. To manage such a vision required a balance of a single thin thread. To play God on a tight wire with cosmic solitude on both sides. Leto had committed himself down a path in which there was now no turning back from and he had accepted the consequences of that choice. Paul, however, had made no final commitment. Though Paul begs him not to, Leto stayed in line with his own vision. He jumps meters into the air, catching Tariq and breaking his neck instantly. Then he dug the pseudo-shield out of the ground and hurled it far off in the distance. Paul had been defeated. Here Leto looked upon his father and saw a blind angry man full of despair. Do you really know the universe you have created here? Leto heard the particular emphasis. The vision which both of them knew had been sent into terrible motion here had required an act of creation at a certain point in time. For that moment, the entire sentient universe shared a linear view of time which possessed characteristics of orderly progression. They entered this time as they might step onto a moving vehicle, and they could only leave it the same way. Leto had locked humanity into his vision. They could not leave it. Paul asks Leto if he is truly prepared to commit to his fate, if he is truly willing to change and live for thousands of years. He wonders if Leto is ready to accept what he will be to the universe. Do you wish to live those thousands of years, changing as you know you will change? Leto recognized that his father was not speaking about physical changes. Both of them knew the physical changes. Leto would adapt and adapt. The skin which was not his own would adapt and adapt. The evolutionary thrust of each part would melt into the other, and a single transformation would emerge. When metamorphosis came, if it came, a thinking creature of awesome dimensions would emerge upon the universe, and that universe would worship him. No, Paul was referring to the inner changes, the thoughts and decisions which would inflict themselves upon the worshippers. It is here that Leto first speaks of his metamorphosis, the millennia's long change that will shape his body into an inhuman form. He would be worshipped and his grip upon the universe will be stronger than Paul's ever was or could have ever dreamed to be. Thousands of peaceful years 
Leto said. That's what I'll give them. Dormancy! Sagnation! Of course, and those forms of violence which I permit. It'll be a lesson which humankind will never forget. I spit on your lesson, Paul said. You think I have not seen a thing similar to what you choose? You saw it, Leto agreed. Is your vision any better than mine? Not one whit better. Worse, perhaps, Leto said. Then what can I do but resist you? Paul demanded. Paul concedes to Leto, acknowledging that this is his universe now. He knew that he would have no comfort this night or any other. He knew that Muad'Dib must be destroyed. Paul Atreides, the hero, must die. Only the preacher could survive. He would do Leto's bidding. Aaliyah has now begun to show signs of possession in her physical form. Her flesh is beginning to change from the prolonged abomination. She has grown more and more deranged. Duncan Idaho, now on Arrakis, is at Siege Tabor and has been trying to convince Stilgar that Aaliyah is possessed but Stilgar is unsure of Duncan's motives. Javid, Aaliyah's lover, is also at Tabor, and when Duncan sees him, he is overcome with rage. He murders Javid. Stilgar is extremely angry that Duncan had defiled the siege, breaking its neutrality. Duncan provokes Stilgar, insulting him in ways in which a Fremen cannot ignore. You've defiled my honor, Stilgar cried. This is neutral. Shut up. Duncan glared at the shocked Naib. You wear a collar, Stilgar. It was one of the three most deadly insults which could be directed at a Fremen. Stilgar's face went pale. You're a servant, Idaho said. You sold Fremen for their water. This was the second most deadly insult, the one which had destroyed the original Jakarutu. Stilgar ground his teeth put a hand on his Chris knife. The aide stepped back, away from the body in the doorway. Turning his back on the Naib, Idaho stepped into the door, taking the narrow opening beside Javid's body and speaking without turning, delivered the third insult. You have no immortality, Stilgar. None of your descendants carry your blood. Where do you go now, Mintat? Stilgar called as Idaho continued leaving the room. Stilgar's voice was as cold as wind from the poles. To find Jakarutu, Idaho said, still not turning. Stilgar drew his knife. Perhaps I can help you. Idaho was at the outer lip of the passage now. Without stopping, he said, If you'd help me with your knife, water thief, please do it in my back. That's the fitting way for one who wears the collar of a demon. With two leaping strides, Stilgar crossed the room, stepping on Javid's body, and caught Idaho in the outer passage. One gnarled hand jerked Idaho around, and to a stop, Stilgar confronted Idaho with bared teeth and a drawn knife. Such was his rage, that Stilgar did not even see the curious smile on Idaho's face. Draw your knife, Mintat scum! Stilgar roared. Idaho laughed. He cuffed Stilgar sharply left hand, right hand, two stinging slaps to the head. With an incoherent screech, Stilgar drove his knife into Idaho's abdomen, striking upward through the diaphragm into the heart. Idaho sagged onto the blade, grinned up at Stilgar, whose rage dissolved into sudden icy shock. Two deaths for the Atreides, Idaho husked, the second for no better reason than the first. He lurched sideways, collapsed to the stone floor on his face, blood spread out from his wound. Duncan calls Stilgar a slave of a demon, the abomination that lives within Aaliyah, says that he has killed Fremen for their water, the greatest Fremen crime, and implies that Stilgar is sterile and has no children of his own blood. It is here that Stilgar kills Duncan, only realizing afterwards that this was Duncan's intent. Now Stilgar has no option but to flee from Aaliyah. Aaliyah would be compelled to act against Stilgar in response for killing her lover, even though she had already planned to do away with Duncan when she realized that she couldn't fully trust him. This was the way of the Fremen. Realizing all of this, Stilgar takes Kanima 
Irulan, and his wives, as well as all others in the siege who wished to go with him into the desert. Going into the desert, he understood, was the only hope for his and Ganema's survival. Aaliyah's grief and inner turmoil continues to grow. She feels as though she is split in half, two people, one consumed by pain and the other perplexed by her tears. In the desert, there are now rumors of a desert demon. Kanats are being destroyed, and the Fremen say this demon moves through the dunes. At this point, Stilgar's company, along with Ganema, have been traveling for months. Ganema notices how the shattered Kanats have been affecting the land and the behavior of the Fremen. The desert demon is, of course, Leto, who is now worshipped by the cast out at Shulak. When he had brought Gurney Halleck and the Preacher there, he had demonstrated his power to the men of the cast out. With his bare hands, Leto had breached the Shulak Kanat, hurling large stones more than 50 meters. When the cast out had tried to intervene, Leto had decapitated the first to reach him, using no more than a blurred sweep of his arm. He hurled others back into their companions and had laughed at their weapons. In a demon voice, he roared at them. Fire will not touch me. Your knives will not harm me. I wear the skin of Shai Halud. In Arakeen, Faradin and the Lady Jessica have arrived on Arrakis. Aaliyah has captured Stilgar and his party, including Ganema, by putting a tracker on a messenger. Leto has brought the preacher to the city, and he gives a sermon as Faradin, Jessica, Aaliyah, and Stilgar watch from Aaliyah's chambers. When the preacher calls Aaliyah blasphemy, her priests descend upon him, killing the preacher. Then a voice screeched from the mob, Muad'Dib! They've killed Muad'Dib! Gods below, Aaliyah quavered. Gods below. A little late for that, don't you think? Jessica asked. Aaliyah whirled, noting the sudden startled reaction of Faradin as he saw the rage on her face. That was Paul they killed, Aaliyah screamed. That was your son. When they confirm it, do you know what will happen? Jessica is struck by this, but she cannot deny Aaliyah's words. Paul Atreides now lies dead in a mound of bloody rags amongst the temple steps. At that moment, the thick plasteel construction that was the door to Aaliyah's chambers flew off the hinges and came hurling into the room. The guards leaped out of the way to avoid it. In walked Leto, holding Ganema by the arm as she attempted to escape him, but he shook her arm and her whole body shook with it. Uttering a trigger word, Leto breaks Ganema's memory conditioning. Here is Aria, the Atreides lioness. We come to set you unto Setja Nibwi, the golden path. Ganema, absorbing the trigger words, Setja Nibwi, felt the locked away consciousness flow into her mind. It flowed with a linear nicety. The inner awareness of her mother hovering there behind it, a guardian at a gate. And Ganema knew in that instant that she had conquered the clamorous past. She possessed a gate through which she could peer when she needed into that past. The months of self-hypnotic suppression had built for her a safe place from which to manage her own flesh. Ganema's conditioning is broken, and through this Ganema has overcome the possibility of abomination. She can now freely look through the memories of her past lives without fear of possession. Aliyah commands her guards to seize Leto, but seeing his awesome power, they refuse to enter the room. Leto walks across the room towards Aaliyah, and though she tries to fight him, he deals with her easily. It is here that the inner lives of Aaliyah's mind come to the surface, and her possession is there for all to see. Aaliyah's eyes darted wildly from side to side. I have conquered those inner lives, Leto said. Look at Ghani, she too can... Ganema interrupted. Aaliyah, I can show you. No! The word was wrenched from Aaliyah. Her chest heaved, and the voices began to pour from her mouth. They were disconnected, cursing, pleading. You see? Why didn't you listen? And again, what are you doing? What's happening? And another voice. Stop! Make them stop! Jessica covered her eyes, felt Faradin's hand steady her. 
Still, Aaliyah raved. I'll kill you! Hideous curses erupted from her. I'll drink your blood! The sound of many languages began to pour from her, all jumbled and confused. The huddled guards in the outer passage made the sign of the worm, then held clenched fist beside their ears. She was possessed. Shaking his head at the sight of Aaliyah, Leto walks to one of the windows and breaks the supposedly unbreakable crystal reinforced glass from its frame. Aaliyah rolled to her knees, lurched to her feet. Don't you know who I am? She demanded. It was her old voice, the sweet and lilting voice of the youthful Aaliyah who was no more. Why are you all looking at me that way? She turned pleading eyes to Jessica. Mother, make them stop. Jessica could only shake her head from side to side, consumed by ultimate horror. All of the Bene Gesserit warnings were true. She looked at Leto and Ghani standing side by side near Aaliyah. It is then that the Baron himself speaks from Aaliyah's mouth. Both Leto and Ganima recognized his voice from their own inner lives. Ganima began to hear the same voice echo in her mind, but the inner gate sealed, and in the Baron's place she sensed her mother Chani standing there. Leto gives Aaliyah a choice, the trial of possession or the window. Who are you to give me a choice? Aaliyah demanded, and it was still the voice of the old Baron. Demon! Ganima screamed. Let her make her own choice. Mother! Aaliyah pleaded in her little girl tones. Mother, what are they doing? What do they want me to do? Help me! Help yourself, Leto ordered. For just an instant, he saw the shattered presence of his aunt in her eyes. A glaring hopelessness which peered out at him and was gone. But her body moved, a stick-like thrusting walk. She wavered, stumbled, veered from her path, but returned to it, nearer and nearer the open window. Now the voice of the old baron raged from her lips. Stop it! Stop it, I say! I command you! Stop it! Feel this! Aaliyah clutched her head, stumbled closer to the window. She had the sill against her thighs then, but the voice still raged. Don't do this. Stop it. I'll help you. I have a plan. Listen to me. Stop it, I say. Wait. But Aaliyah pulled her hands away from her head, clutched the broken casement. In one jerking motion, she pulled herself over the sill and was gone. Not even a screech came from her as she fell. In one instant of awareness, Aaliyah was as she once was. And in that moment, Aaliyah overcame her possession, killing the Baron for the second time. There is a thump, and the crowd below can be heard screaming. Jessica is overcome with grief for the daughter she abandoned, for the daughter she lost long ago. Though humanity will not know it, Leto has made a great sacrifice for them. The skin which is not his own can never be shed. He is no longer human. And in 4,000 years, the complete metamorphosis of the Sand Trout symbiote will destroy him. The pain of his life is great, because the memory of being human is richer in Leto than any other person. Think of all those lives, cousin. No, you cannot imagine what that is, because you've no experience of it. But I know. I can imagine his pain. He gives more than anyone ever gave before. Our father walked into the desert trying to escape it. Aaliyah became abomination in fear of it. Our grandmother has only the blurred infancy of this condition, yet must use every Bene Gesserit while to live with it, which is what Reverend Mother training amounts to anyway. But Leto, he's all alone, never to be duplicated. Leto is taking over the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood's breeding program. Since he is no longer human, he cannot continue the Atreides bloodline. Instead, he will continue it through Ganema and Faradin. He will himself marry Ganema, but no one will know that Faradin is the true father of her children. All Leto does now is for the Golden Path. He will prepare humanity for Kralazak, saving them, though they will call him Tyrant. He'll lead humans through the Cult of Death into the free air of exuberant life. He speaks of death because that's necessary still. 
its attention by which the living know they're alive. When his empire falls, oh yes, it'll fall. You think Kralazek is now, but Kralazek is yet to come. And when it comes, humans will have renewed their memory of what it's like to be alive. Most of the great worms would be gone in a hundred years. The guild whose navigators require such high quantities of spice would nearly perish in these famine times, but they will persist. Once Leto returns into the sands of Arrakis, so will the worms, and mankind will arise from the ashes of Kralazek. Leto renames Faradin Hak Alada, which means the breaking of the habit. He commands him to hand over his Sardaukar soldiers. Leto intends to mingle them with the Fremen. In the final chapter of Children of Dune, Leto reveals to Hak Aladar that he is in fact possessed. Abomination by the Bene Gesserit definition. Leto had forced back most of his malevolent ego memories, but he had allowed one to take root. The ego memory of a man named Harem. A man who had bred humans who were short-lived and prone to superstition, easily led by a god-king. Leto believes they were a powerful people, whose survival as a species became habitual. Leto mentions that the reason the Bene Gesserit breeding program failed was because they attempted to control evolution while overlooking their own changes over the course of that evolution. He has no such illusions. I refuse, Faradin said. You refuse to father an Atreides dynasty? What dynasty? You'll occupy the throne for thousands of years. And mold your descendants in my image. It will be the most intensive, the most inclusive training program in all of history. We'll be an ecosystem in miniature. You see, Whatever system animals choose to survive by must be based on the pattern of interlocking communities, interdependence, working together in the common design, which is the system, and this system will produce the most knowledgeable rulers ever seen. You put fancy words on a most distasteful. Who will survive Kralazek? Leto asked. I promise you, Kralazek will come. You're a madman. You will shatter the Empire. Of course I will. And I am not a man. But I'll create a new consciousness in all men. I tell you that below the desert of Dune, there is a secret place with the greatest treasure of all time. I do not lie. When the last worm dies and the last melange is harvested upon our sands, these deep treasures will spring up throughout our universe. As the power of the spice monopoly fades and the hidden stockpiles make their mark, new powers will appear throughout our realm. It is time humans learned once more to live in their instincts. Leto will bring peace and stagnation to humanity for thousands of years, and then Kralazek. New strange powers will arise, and humans yet again will feel the tension of death. Faradin insists that he will resist Leto, but Leto tells him that he expects him to, and that this is in fact the reason he was chosen. Leto stands alone in the universe. He walks in solitude, carrying the weight of all mankind. One of us had to accept the agony, Ganema said, and he was always the stronger. Children of Dune is the completion of the first trilogy in the Dune series. It is the beginning of Leto's long-term plan for history. Leto has made this sacrifice, knowing that humanity will curse his name for it. They could not possibly understand how one whose vision stretches to the end of time sees the universe. Children of Dune is regarded as one of the greatest science fiction books of all time. Intense action and a gripping plot. This novel, unlike Dune Messiah, is a sweeping epic much like the original Dune novel. There are multiple parallels between Paul and Leto. Children of Dune also shows the downfall of Aaliyah, who succumbs to possession by the Baron Harkonnen. Aaliyah had no choice in her life. This makes her end all the more tragic. The next book in the series, God Emperor of Dune, 
takes place 3,500 years later. It is, in my opinion, the most profound novel in the series. In it, Leto has morphed into the Worm God Emperor and rules the Imperium with an iron fist, continuing to shape his golden path. I assure you that I am the Book of Fate. Questions are my enemies, for my questions explode. Answers leap up like a frightened flock blackening the sky of my inescapable memories. Not one answer. Not one suffices. What prisms flash when I enter the terrible field of my past? I am a chip of shattered flint, enclosed in a box. The box gyrates and quakes. I am tossed about in a storm of mysteries. And when the box opens, I return to this presence like a stranger in a primitive land. Slowly, slowly, I say, I relearn my name. But that is not to know myself. This person of my name, this Leto who is the second of that calling, finds other voices in his mind, other names and other places. Oh, I promise you, as I have been promised, that I answer to but a single name. If you say Leto, I respond. Sufferance makes this true. Sufferance and one thing more. I hold the threads. All of them are mine. Let me but imagine a topic, say, men who have died by the sword, and I have them in all their gore, every image intact, every moan, every grimace. Joys of motherhood, I think, and the birthing beds are mine serial baby smiles, and the sweet cooings of new generations. The first walkings of the toddlers, and the first victories of youths brought forth for me to share. They tumble one upon another, until I can see little else but sameness and repetition. Keep it all intact, I warn myself. Who can deny the value of such experiences, the worth of learning through which I view each new instant? Ah, but it's the past. Don't you understand? It's only the past. This morning I was born in a yurt at the edge of a horse plain in a land of a planet that no longer exists. Tomorrow I will be born somewhere else, in another place. I have not yet chosen. This morning, though, ah, this life. When my eyes had learned to focus, I looked out at sunshine on trampled grass, and I saw vigorous people going about the sweet activities of their lives. Where, oh where, has all of that vigor gone? The God Emperor Leto II, The Stolen Journals. But it's like a balloon. The surface of the balloon is their face, with what we do not know. Inside the balloon, as we blow into it, is what we have proved. But as we increase what we think we know, we increase our exposure to what we do not know. This is one of the inevitable laws of our universe. But isn't it more interesting to live in a universe where there are unknowns to discover? new lands to explore than to live in an absolute box where when you find the edge no place to go from there I like the fact that we cannot predict everything I like the fact that we live in a universe where anything may happen because the alternative to me is a constricting dead end God Emperor of Dune is the fourth book in Frank Herbert's Dune saga. The novel takes place 3,500 years after the events of the previous novel in the series, Children of Dune. Leto II of House Atreides has ruled the Empire with an iron fist since that time. The Sandtrout skin, 
which Leto had first put on in Shulok, has grown and changed him. In the early stages of Leto's transformation, which is referred to in the novels as his metamorphosis, Leto was mostly human. The symbiote skin had given him incredibly amplified strength, immunity to conventional attacks, and prevented him from aging. But Leto always knew what would become of him eventually. The skin which was not his own consisted of many interlocking tiny sand vectors. Leto knew that approximately 4,000 years after he had put on the living suit, the completed transformation of the sand trout into their adult worm phase would destroy him. Leto calls this his final metamorphosis. I often think about my final metamorphosis, that likeness of death. I know the way it must come, but I do not know the moment or the players. This is one thing I cannot know. I only know whether the Golden Path continues or ends. The Golden Path is Leto's grand plan for humanity. It is a path that his father, Paul Atreides, saw, but rejected. In the time that the God Emperor of Dune takes place, Leto and the Sand Trout Cilia have become one body. Leto is a pre-worm, seven meters long and two meters in diameter. His body weighs approximately five tons and is carried around by the Royal Cart, a technology created by the Ixians, one of the fringe worlds on the outskirts of the Empire, who maintain rule over their home planet through technocracy. Leto's body is ribbed down its length. Only his face remains. It is at the height it would be had he a man's body. Though his arms and hands were still functional and seemingly human, his legs had atrophied and become useless long ago. Mostly Leto was in control of the pre-worm body, but there are also reflexes beyond his control. The pre-worm body, for instance, would react to protect itself if threatened. The God Emperor maintained supreme control over the universe. Arrakis is now a wet planet, fully terraformed, with clouds, lakes, and rivers and forest. The great worms of Arrakis died out long ago, and no more spice is being produced. Leto kept his hoard of spice well hidden. No one truly knew how much he possessed. The Spacing Guild's dependency on spice made them almost reliable as allies. No one moved in the universe without the permission of the God Emperor. All spice in the universe was rationed by the God Emperor himself, and he could deny rations to those who displeased him. Much of the novel God Emperor of Dune is told from the perspective of Leto II. By use of an Ixian device called a Dictatal, Leto can cast his thoughts in a particular mode and have the words printed out on Redulian crystal sheets. One Redulian crystal sheet is a mere molecule in thickness. Leto could then have them copied onto less permanent material. God Emperor of Dune opens sometime in the distant future as the God Emperor's journals, which were discovered long after his death, are being read and studied for historical insight. These journals are a completion to the legendary documents known as Leto's Stolen Journals, which were stolen from the Citadel on Arrakis during his reign as God Emperor. The plot begins as Siona Atreides escapes with the Stolen Journals, two books printed on crystal paper. Siona is highly important to Leto, the most recent result of his breeding program, which he had snatched from the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood over 3,000 years ago. As Siona and her party escapes with the God Emperor's journals, Leto's D-Wolves are unleashed upon them. They had stolen the journals from the fortress in the Sarir. Siona and her two accomplices are pursued by the creatures through Leto's forbidden forest. Ulat dies first, as one of the wolves violently rips out his shoulder and the rest of the pack pounces. The D-Wolves were allowed to eat anything they caught in the Forbidden Forest. But the D-Wolves did not stop to eat. They knew that two more humans ran through the forest. The second to die was Kuteg, whose ancestor had served at Siege Tabor back in the days when Arrakis was still called Dune. Siona had been the fastest, which is why she had been holding the packet containing the stolen journals. They had known the risk would be great, but they knew that the secret of where Leto hoarded his spice 
would be worth it. Kuteng had sacrificed himself, delaying the D-Wolves to help Siona escape with the journals. Once Siona escapes the forest and crosses the Idaho River, the wolves do not cross it. They had been conditioned to stop at the water, to know the boundaries of their territories. Siona had escaped with two of Leto's journals, items of immeasurable value. Siona knows that the people of the Imperium have no true lives of their own. The populace lived in neat rectangular houses, with flat black roofs, constant sameness, and this was repeated on every planet in the Worm God's empire. Even planetary capitals, she said, were nothing more than large villages, of the kind found everywhere in the empire. Even though even the poorest families are well fed, their daily lives grow more and more static with the passage of time. Siona admires the ancient Fremen because they were truly free. In the Worm's empire, you went only where the Worm demanded. According to the God Emperor, this was for the sake of Leto's peace. But Siona had spied on the God Emperor and her father Maneo as a child, and what she had heard had planted a seed of hatred for Leto in her mind. He says he denies us most crises, to limit our forming forces. He said, people can be sustained by affliction, but I am the affliction now. Gods can become afflictions. Those were his words, Duncan. The worm is a sickness. Siona Atreides despises the worm god, and vows that she will be his end. In Siona's mind, Leto has no right to call himself God, no right to impose his tyranny upon the universe. She is certain that the information in his journals will be enough to undo him. Siona calls the worm's empire a prison. I will destroy you, Leto. Not we will destroy you. That was not Siona's way. She would do it herself. She turned and strode toward the orchards beyond the river's mold border. As she walked, she repeated her oath, adding to it aloud the old Fremen formula, which terminated in her full name. Siona ibon fed asifa atreides it is who curses you, Leto. You will pay in full. Leto finds Siona fascinating. He had not predicted that she would take the journals. This gave him great pleasure. He had watched her in the Forbidden Forest by use of his devices. He could have stopped the D-Wolves at any time but chose not to, calling them an extension of his purpose. His purpose to be the greatest predator that mankind has ever known. Throughout the millennia, Leto II has had the Tleilax produce countless Duncan Idaho Golas. Leto used Duncan Idaho Golas as his commander of the Royal Guard. He also used them in his breeding program occasionally. The Duncans always trended towards subversion, however, but this was precisely the reason that the Duncans were used. At the start of the novel, Leto's current Duncan, who has served him in the past 60 years, attempts to kill him after discovering that the Tleilaxu are working on his replacement. He knows that Leto II has vowed not to use his prescient power to predict the moment of his own death and he believes that a Lazgon can kill him. The Duncan concealing the weapon which Leto already knows about, having been informed by the guild, had come to talk to Leto about Siona and her rebellion. This bores the god emperor. He recognizes predictable patterns in the rebellious. All rebellions are ordinary and an ultimate bore. They are copied out of the same pattern, one much like another. The driving force is adrenaline addiction and the desire to gain personal power. All rebels are closet aristocrats, that's why I can convert them so easily. Why do the Duncans never really hear me when I tell them about this? The God Emperor insists that radicals always see the world in binary terms. Simple, us versus them, or good versus evil. In addressing more complex issues this way, these radicals create a window into chaos. The God Emperor states that government is the mastery of chaos, which, contrary to the belief of many, has predictable characteristics. Leto says that radicals only create new radicals, continuing the old process. A radical that saw the complexities, however, was in fact no true radical, but a rival for leadership and must either be killed or co-opted. Duncan, I am all of them, and I know. There has never truly been a selfless rebel, 
just hypocrites. Conscious hypocrites or unconscious hypocrites, it's all the same. Lost in thought, and bored of the talk of rebels, Leto does not initially notice the Laiscon that the Duncan has pointed directly at him. You, Duncan, have you betrayed me too? Eh, too brute? Every fiber of Leto's awareness came to full alert. He could feel his body twitching. The worm flesh had a will of its own. Idaho spoke Tay? with derision. Tell me, Leto, how many times must I pay the debt of loyalty? Leto recognized the inner question. How many of me have there been? The Duncans always wanted to know this. Every Duncan asked it, and no answer satisfied. They doubted. In his saddest Muad'Dib voice, Leto asked, Do you take no pride in my admiration, Duncan? Haven't you ever wondered what it is about you that makes me desire you as my constant companion through the centuries? You know me to be the ultimate fool. Duncan! The voice of an angry Muad'Dib could always be counted on to shatter Idaho. Despite the fact that Idaho knew no Bene Gesserit had ever mastered the powers of voice as Leto had mastered them, it was predictable that he would dance to this one voice. The Lay's gun wavered in his hand. That was enough. Leto was off the cart in a hurtling roll. Idaho had never seen him leave the cart this way, had not even suspected it could happen. For Leto, there were only two requirements, a real threat which the worm body could sense, and the release of that body. The rest was automatic, and the speed of it always astonished even Leto. The Lazgon was a major concern. It could scratch him badly, but few understood the abilities of the pre-worm body to deal with heat. Leto struck Idaho while rolling, and the Lazgon was deflected as it was fired. One of the useless flippers which had been Leto's legs and feet sent a shocking burst of sensations crashing into his awareness. For an instant, there was only pain, but the worm body was free to act, and reflexes ignited a violent paroxysm of flopping. Leto heard bones cracking. The Lay's gun was thrown far across the floor of the crypt by a spasmodic jerk of Idaho's hand. Rolling off of Idaho, Leto poised himself for a renewed attack, but there was no need. The injured flipper still sent pain signals and he sensed that the tip of the flipper had been burned away. The sand trout skin already sealed the wound. The pain had eased to an ugly throbbing. Idaho stirred. There could be little doubt that he had been mortally injured. His chest was visibly crushed. There was obvious agony when he tried to breathe. But he opened his eyes and stared up at Leto. The persistence of these mortal possessions, Leto thought. Siona, Idaho gasped. Leto saw the life leave him then. This was not the first time a Duncan had died by Leto's hands. In truth, only 19 Duncans had died by natural causes. After the Duncan dies, Leto wonders if Siona and Duncan could have been mates, but he dismisses the idea. But Leto does note, however, that the Duncan had been aiming for his brain. His brain was no longer a brain of human dimensions not even associated with his face. It had spread throughout his body. This was a fact he had told only to his journals. Inwardly, Leto possessed a vantage point by which to view his ancestral memories without fear of being overcome. He could reach back and gaze through the eyes of any person in those memories. In this way, he was unlike anyone who had ever lived before him, even his sister Ganima. He had mastered his inner lives, and could speak with the voices of his ancestors. Though his power is great, it causes him to struggle with unbearable boredom, having seen the near extent of all human potential. Leto said that to be thought of as a god, as he was, became ultimately boring. The stolen journals state that holy boredom is a good and sufficient enough reason for the invention of free will. This is key in understanding the role that Leto intends for Siona in his golden path. Leto's rule of the universe was maintained by his Fishspeaker legions. The Fishspeakers were Leto's military force during his reign as God Emperor of the Imperium. Finding that the Fremen and the Sardaukar were unable to suit his needs, Leto II founded his all-female army. The Fishspeakers maintained garrisons on every planet throughout the Imperium. According to the God Emperor, Male militaries were ultimately predatory, 
and would eventually turn against the civilian population in times of peace when there was no enemy to fight. Females, on the other hand, would remain calm and tame during peacetime. Fish beaker schools could be found in the festival city on Arrakis. Leto had given them the name fish speakers because according to his genetic memory, the first priestesses spoke to fish in their dreams. Leto said this was of great value. The fish speakers were extremely loyal followers of the god emperor's religion. They reacted violently to anything they considered to be heresy against their one true god. The fish speakers were the enforcers of Leto's peace, which was necessary for the golden path. In terms of longevity and the number of planets ruled, the fish speakers can be thought of as the most effective military force of all time. Men were almost completely shut out of the fish speaker combat forces. The only role that men served in the lives of fish speaker women was that of husbands. Fish speakers were trained to be extremely effective, disciplined, and even fanatical soldiers. Leto, however, rejected the idea that fish speakers should be thought of as a police force. By my name, I assure you that is not so. Police are inevitably corrupted. Police always observe that criminals prosper. It takes a pretty dull policeman to miss the fact that the position of authority is the most prosperous criminal position available. The fish speakers could not be corrupted. The fish speakers were more than an army. The women also served as the god emperor's governmental bureaucracy. They were activists, courtiers, pages, teachers, fish speaker priestesses served as judge and jury and executioner. The fish speakers also served roles as assassins and secret agents, and any other use that the god emperor saw fit. A fish speaker would fall upon her own blade without hesitation if Leto commanded it. Nela is the most prominent fish speaker in the Dune series. Nela was a large hulking figure. Her strength was legendary. The god emperor himself had once seen her lift a hundred kilo man with one hand. She has been commanded to obey Siona Atreides in all things by Leto II, even though Siona plots to destroy the god emperor. This is a cause of great internal conflict for Nela, but she trusts in the will of God. The god emperor had also implanted technology of Ixian manufacture inside of Nela's head which would allow him to speak directly to her if he wished. Nayla wonders whether there may be a computer inside, but dismisses the thought, for it was God who put it there. Nayla reported on all of Siona's actions to the God Emperor. Her faith in him was unquestionable. Even if Siona sends you to kill me, you must obey. She must never learn that you serve me. No one can kill you, Lord, but you must obey Siona. Of course, Lord. That is your command. You must obey her in all things. I will do it, Lord. Nayla's faith was such that even Leto himself could not shake her. Any obstacle she viewed as a test. This religion built around my purse and disgust me. Yes, Lord. Nayla's green eyes on the gilded cushions of her cheeks stared out at him without questioning, without comprehension, without the need of either response. If I sent her out to collect the stars, she would go and she would attempt it. She thinks I am testing her again. I do believe she could anger me. This damnable religion should end with me, Leto shouted. Why should I want to loose a religion upon my people? Religions wrecked from within, empires and individuals alike, it's all the same. Yes, Lord. Religions create radicals and fanatics like you. Thank you, Lord. The short-lived pseudo-rage sank back out of sight into the depths of his memories. Nothing denied the hard surface of Nayla's faith. Nayla is the perfect example of pure fanaticism. Siona Atreides is the descendant of Ganima Atreides and Hak Aladar, once known as Feridin Carino. Siona's intelligence and charisma has helped her to become a leader of a group of like-minded rebels. They are determined to end the rule of the God Emperor. She plans to give copies of Leto's journals to groups whose loyalty to the god emperor is questionable, including the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, the Guild, and the Ixians. Siona does not find the location of Leto's spice hoard, but she does discover something else. Siona shows Nela a flower and a strand of hair which she found pressed in between two pages of paper. On the paper read, A strand of Ganima's hair, 
with a starflower blossom which she once brought me. On another page was written, words I wrote when told of Ghani's death. The sand beach, as gray as a dead cheek, a green tide flow reflects cloud ripples. I stand on the dark wet edge, cold foam cleanses my toes, I smell driftwood smoke. Siona knew that with these words they had discovered the key to God's undoing. The God Emperor loved his sister. Yes, he is capable of love. Oh yes, we have him now. Maneo Atreides is Siona's father and the closest and most loyal servant to the God Emperor. Maneo acted as major domo of Leto's household. The God Emperor thinks to himself what a gift Maneo has given him and his daughter Siona, knowing that she is the new, while he himself is a collection of the old and obsolete, a crypt of ancestral knowledge, a relic. Siona was more important to Leto than she or Moneo knew. Siona had the ability to vanish from Leto's prescient vision at times, though she was not aware. She would fade, and yet the golden path would remain. But Siona, in fact, was not prescient herself. She was unique. Siona had the potential, if she survived Leto's test, that is, to be the one who could offer humanity a clean slate, the ultimate goal of Leto's breeding program, someone who could hide from the prescient view and spread those genes throughout all mankind. Moneo, in his youth, had been a rebel just as Siona is now. In fact, most of Leto's trusted administrators had once been rebels. According to Leto, rebels made for the best administrators, and all rebels were closet aristocrats, which was why he was able to convert them so easily. Later, seemingly in contradiction to this statement, Leto says that in order to identify rebels, he looks for men with principles. Principles, he said, are what we fight for. Most men go through a lifetime unchallenged, except at the final moment. They have so few unfriendly arenas in which to test themselves. They have you, she said. But I am so powerful, he said. I am the equivalent of suicide. Who would seek certain death? Madmen or desperate ones, rebels. I am their equivalent to war, he said. The ultimate predator. I am the cohesive force which shatters them. Leto says that a good administrator is incorruptible, shrewd, philosophical, and open about their errors, and quick to see decisions. The difference between a good administrator and a bad administrator is the fact that a good administrator can make immediate choices, act on instinct. A bad administrator hesitates, eventually acting in ways that create serious problems. Moneo is concerned for his daughter's safety but make sure that the God Emperor knows that his own concerns are paramount. Moneo knows that Siona is dangerous and has placed a spy amongst her, which Leto already knows. Siona provides Leto with surprise due to her ability to hide from his prescience, but she also reminds Leto of what he fears most of all, the sameness and repetition that could potentially destroy the Golden Path. Siona is the contrast by which I know my deepest fears. Maneo's concern for me is well grounded. I tell you this, in the hope that it will help you understand why I act as I do in the full knowledge that great forces accumulate in my empire with but one wish, to destroy me. You who read these words may know full well what actually happened, but I doubt that you understand it. Though the manipulation of human genetics is forbidden by Leto's religion, the Tleilaxu know how much he treasures his Duncans. They reproduce Golas from the original cells from the original Duncan, who died all the way back in the Dune days. Thus, the Duncans all have the memories up until that original point of death. The Tleilaxu do this in the hopes that it will buy them favor with the God Emperor. It does not. In the opening of God Emperor of Dune, a new Duncan awakes to a strange new world, finding the planet Arrakis to be unrecognizable, and the shape of the Empire to be completely different to how he remembered it. He is a man out of his time. I am Duncan Idaho, 
That was about all he wanted to know for sure. He did not like the Tleilaxu explanations, their stories. But then, the Tleilaxu had always been feared, disbelieved, and feared. The new Idaho, sometime after the death of his predecessor, is escorted down to the planet Arrakis by Tleilaxu face dancers, who make a game out of changing their faces constantly to confuse him. They then tell him that the women of the Royal Guard will come for him soon. They leave him there, in a dull, featureless room. Idaho is confused by their statement since he is not aware of Leto's all-female army. He is aware that he is a Gola. He remembered his own death and could not deny the truth. Initially upon awakening, he had been a blank slate, there to be programmed in any way the Tleilaxu wished. They unblocked his memory by repeating the scenario which awoke hate's memory in Children of Dune, by conditioning him to kill a man so similar to Paul that Duncan believed that it was likely a Gola, though he wonders where the dirty Tleilaxu would have gotten the cells of Paul Atreides. The god Emperor Leto assures Duncan that it was no more than a face dancer mimic. Whilst among the Tleilaxu, Duncan is allowed to study Tleilaxu history. He learns of Leto II, who was born 3500 years ago and yet still lives as ruler of the universe. But this second Leto, so the history said, had become something. Something so strange that Idaho despaired of understanding the transformation. How could a human slowly turn into a sandworm? How could any thinking creature live more than 3,000 years? Not even the wildest projections of the geriatric spice allowed such a lifespan. Duncan doesn't know what to believe. He suspects Tleilaxu lies. It wouldn't be until he saw the worm god Emperor that he would truly believe. The Tleilaxu tell Duncan that the god Emperor is a tyrant and had ordered them to produce him from their axolotl tanks. They do not know what became of the one before him. The presence of the new Gola pleased the shadow of Paul Atreides which lived within Leto. Leto had the new Duncan brought into a dark room, where he could hear Leto speak before he saw his form. What do I call you? It was the sign of acceptance for which Leto had been waiting. Will Lord Leto do? Yes, my lord. Idaho stared directly into Leto's fremen blue eyes. Is it true what your fish speakers say? You have... memories of... We are all here, Duncan. Leto spoke in the voice of his paternal grandfather. Then, even the women are here, Duncan. It was the voice of Jessica, Leto's paternal grandmother. You knew them well, Leto said. And they know you. When the lights turned on, Duncan saw Leto's body and he asked why Leto had done this to himself. Leto told him that he would know in time. He told the Duncan that eventually his body would make sandworms of some sort, but they would be aware, having more ganglia, more nerve cells. Though Duncan begins to accept that Leto is Atreides, he can still sense that something key is missing. Something has been stolen from humankind. You've taken something away from us, he said. I can feel it. Those women, Maneo. Us against you, Leto thought. The Duncans always choose the human side. Idaho returned his attention to Leto's face. What have you given us in exchange? Throughout the Empire, Leto's peace. Leto tells Duncan that his so-called peace is actually enforced tranquility, that the fish speakers are present because humans by nature react negatively against tranquility. He gives them this and a hierarchy, which they can easily identify. A hierarchy where he is God, though he tells Duncan that in truth, holiness is a curse and that it offends him. But Leto understands that it is necessary for the Golden Path, which is a fact that the Duncan cannot yet comprehend. Leto tells the Duncan that his duty will be to guard him by any means necessary and also to guard his secret, the secret that he is in fact vulnerable that he is not truly God in the ultimate sense. Duncan still doesn't fully trust Leto, and tells him that he will turn against him if he should discover him to be worse than the Harkonnens. Ultimately, Duncan agrees to serve Leto, after the God Emperor reminds him who he truly is. When we climbed Siege Tabor for the last time together, you had my loyalty then, and I had yours. 
Nothing of that has really changed. That was your father. That was me. Paul Muad'Dib's voice of command coming from Leto's bulk always shocked the Golas. Idaho whispered, All of you, in that one body. He broke off. Leto remained silent. This was the decision moment. Presently, Idaho permitted himself that devil-may-care grin for which he had been so well known. Then I will speak to first Leto and to Paul, the ones who know me best. Use me well, for I did love you. The Duncan leaves the god emperor then, not knowing that his words had disturbed him. Leto knew that in fact, it was love that he was most vulnerable to. The Bene Gesserit Sisterhood remains unbroken during the reign of the god emperor. Leto mentions that out of all in the universe, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mothers are the most like him, having access to their ancestral memories. The Bene Gesserit as always make their plots. He is aware of most of their efforts. Early on in the novel they attempt to form an alliance between the fish speakers and themselves, but fail. The fish speakers keep nothing from God. You Bene Gesserit assail me on all sides. Even now you seek to suborn my fish speakers. Sister Chinaue says that she steeled herself for death, but the god emperor merely stopped his cart and looked across her at his entourage. She says the others stopped and waited on the road in well-trained passivity, all of them at a respectful distance. The Lord Leto said, There is my little multitude, and they tell me everything. Do not deny my accusation. Sister Chinaue said, I do not deny it. Leto commands Chinaue to report his words back to the sisterhood exactly. He is fully aware of her special training as an oral recorder, and of her true mission on Arrakis. He tells her that he will restore the outward view, the spiritual freedom that humanity had lost. Humans had been enclosed, trapped behind latches and locks, and most humans were not strong enough to seek freedom within themselves. He tells the sisterhood that as they succeeded in creating the Kwisatz Haderach, he has succeeded in creating Siona, though he does not elaborate for the Sisterhood. The Bene Gesserit wonder about the God Emperor's reference to Siona, and intend to investigate. Sister Chinaue had also been commanded by the God Emperor to withhold certain words from her report to the Sisterhood. When Chinaue asked Leto about his likeness to a Reverend Mother, he responded by telling her that he and his sister were awakened in the womb. He told her that because he knows that she had been told to record accurately whatever she heard, that he would speak to her as though he was speaking to one of his journals. He told her to preserve the words well, for he did not want them lost. When she asked him why he had chosen her, he said it was because he would never see her again. She did not understand his strange words. The Lord Leto spoke as follows. To my certain knowledge, when I am no longer consciously present here among you, when I am here only as a fearsome creature of the desert, many people will look back upon me as a tyrant. Fair enough. I have been tyrannical. A tyrant not fully human, not insane, merely a tyrant. But even ordinary tyrants have motives and feelings beyond those usually assigned to them by facile historians and they will think of me as a great tyrant. Thus, my feelings and motives are a legacy I would preserve lest history distort them too much. History has a way of magnifying some characteristics while it discards others. People will try to understand me and frame me in their words. They will seek truth, but the truth always carries the ambiguity of the words used to express it. You will not understand me. The harder you try, the more remote I will become, until finally I vanish into eternal myth, a living god at last. That's it, you see. I am not a leader, nor even a guide. A god. Remember that. I am quite different from leaders and guides. Gods need take no responsibility for anything except Genesis. Gods accept everything and thus accept nothing. Gods must be identifiable and yet remain anonymous. Gods do not need a spirit world. My spirits dwell within me, answerable to my slightest summons. 
I share with you because it pleases me to do so, what I have learned about them and through them. They are my truth. Beware of the truth, gentle sister. Although much sought after, truth can be dangerous to the seeker. Myths and reassuring lies are much easier to find and believe. If you find a truth, even a temporary one, it can demand that you make painful changes, conceal your truth within words. Natural ambiguity will protect you then. Words are much easier to absorb than the sharp Delphic stabs of wordless portent. With words, you can cry out in the chorus, Why didn't someone warn me? But I did warn you. I warned you by example, not with words. There are inevitably more than enough words. You record them in your marvelous memory even now. And someday my journals will be discovered. More words. I warn you that you read my words at your peril. The wordless movement of terrible events lies just below their surface. Be deaf. You do not need to hear or hearing. You do not need to remember. How soothing it is to forget. And how dangerous. Words such as mine have long been recognized for their mysterious power. There is secret knowledge here which can be used to rule the forgetful. My truths are the substance of myths and lies which tyrants have always counted on to maneuver the masses for selfish design. You see, I share it all with you. Even the greatest mystery of all time. The mystery by which I compose my life. I reveal it to you in words. The only past which endures lies wordlessly within you. He tells her that he preserves these words for the future generations of mankind, who will seek to unravel the mysteries of his rule to find meaning in their own existence. Chinoe got the sense from Leto's words that he was uttering some kind of last testament. She asks the god emperor if he is telling her this because he is about to die. Leto laughs. No, gentle sister. It is you who will die. You will not live to be a reverend mother. Do not be saddened by this. For by your presence here today, by carrying my message back to the sisterhood, by preserving my secret words as well, you will achieve a far greater status. You become here an integral part of my myth. Our distant cousins will pray to you for intercession with me. Leto has seen Chinoe's death in his prescient vision, and tells her so. In that moment, the Bene Gesserit sister Chinoe and the Lord Leto share something almost physical, a mutual experience of wordless truth. Chinoe is unable to describe it. This account was found amongst Chinoe's papers after her death. She died in the 53rd year of her sisterhood, when she underwent the spice agony in an attempt to convert the deadly truth-sayer drug and become a reverend mother. The God Emperor completely denies the Sisterhood any involvement in his breeding program. The fish speaker garrisons on the Bene Gesserit homeworld kill the children of the Sisterhood who result from genetic lines which they object to. As a result, the Sisterhood struggles to maintain their level of reverend mothers. When the Sisterhood protested this to the God Emperor, he responded with a warning. Be thankful for what you have. The Sisterhood understood. The Sisterhood does not question Leto's prescient abilities, and know him to be more powerful than any before him. They believe that he knows every important action that they will take prior to the event, and therefore guide themselves by the rule that they will never knowingly threaten his person or his grand plan, which they can discern parts of. The Sisterhood's official address to the God Emperor is as follows. Tell us if we threaten you, that we may desist, and tell us of your grand plan, that we may help. The Sisterhood is also aware that the Guild and the Ixians work together to develop a mechanical substitute to the prescient power of a navigator. The Sisterhood does not suspect that much will come of this, though they are watchful. The success of the project could mean the reduction of the God Emperor's power in the universe, since Spice would no longer be required for safe space travel. The God Emperor has many devices of Ixian manufacture. Many of them defy the proscriptions of the Butlerian Jihad, 
containing thinking machines. Early on in his reign, Leto had revealed to the Ixians that he knew the secret location of their Ixian core, the heartland of their technological federation. He had seen the location in his prescience. The technology of the Ixians is feared throughout the Empire. Only once have the Ixians attempted to trick him with a violent device. He had killed the entire delegation before the package was even opened. In the novel, the Ixians send a new ambassador to the court of the God Emperor, Wee Nori. Shortly after her arrival on the planet, she meets with the God Emperor, and just as the Ixians have planned, Leto is immediately attracted to her. Her uncle Malki had once been boon companion to the Lord Leto. He knew the God Emperor better than perhaps even Moneo. The God Emperor finds both her physical beauty and her truly pure personality to be intoxicating. Leto understands that the Ixians have uncovered his secret, his vulnerability. Leto had known that they had been working on something. He couldn't see it, but he knew when something vanished from his prescient view. Hui Nori had been raised in a no chamber, a device that the Ixians had developed from the same technology that he used to record his journals. A no chamber hid whatever was inside from prescience. Hui Nori had been bred specifically to appeal to the final remnants of humanity within Leto. He has become more and more alien with the passage of time. He longed to feel again. The Ixians hoped that they could use Hui Nori to tempt Leto away from his golden path. Hui was merely a pawn and meant Leto no harm consciously. Leto could not bring himself to dismiss Hui Nori and he could not kill her. The Ixian plot had worked. Leto decides instead that she will be his bride. The God Emperor is incapable of physical intimacy. The sand vectors of his body reacted to even the slightest hints of moisture. He tells Wee Nori that she would be allowed to take a lover if she so chose. She accepts the God Emperor's proposal. We are myth killers, you and I, Moneo. That is the dream we share. I show you from a God's Olympian perch that government is a shared myth. When the myth dies, the government dies. Leto's golden path, if successful, will lead to a new way of existing for humankind. Leto knew that governments were only useful to the governed as long as the government's inherent tendencies towards tyranny were restrained. I can imagine your inward travels, Lord. No, you cannot. I have seen peoples and planets in such numbers that they lose meaning even in imagination. Oh, the landscapes I have passed, the calligraphy of alien roads glimpsed from space and imprinted upon my innermost sight. The eroded sculpture of canyons and cliffs and galaxies has imprinted upon me the certain knowledge that I am Moat. Not you, Lord. Certainly not you. Less than Moat. I have seen people and their fruitless societies in such repetitive posturings that their nonsense fills me with boredom. Do you hear? I did not mean to anger you, my Lord. Moneo speaks meekly. You do not anger me. Sometimes you irritate me. That is the extent of it. You cannot imagine what I have seen. Caliphs and Majids, Rakas and Rajas and Bashars, kings and emperors, primitives and presidents. I have seen them all. Feudal chieftains. Everyone. Everyone a little pharaoh. The Gan Emperor understood that governments always trended towards increasingly despotic states. Humans naturally sought out tribal hierarchies filling an ancient demand for a system in which every individual knows his place. Leto believed that knowing one's place was valuable, even if that place was temporary. But to be held in place against your will was another thing entirely. Leto had imposed this stillness upon the entire universe. Such was his tyranny. But this was his lesson to all mankind. Beware of the liberties you offer up to your leaders. Even though you read these words after a passage of eons, my tyranny shall not be forgotten. My golden path assures this. Knowing my message, I expect you to be exceedingly careful about the powers you delegate to any government. Moneo had been the God Emperor's major domo for the past 79 years. He was truly the God Emperor's creature. Moneo somewhat resented Duncan Idaho Golas because of the special connection they shared with Leto, their mutual memories from the Dune days and before. As I said before, 
Maneo had once been a rebel just as his daughter Siona is now. As a gift to Maneo, Leto takes Siona out of harm's way by forcing her to join his fish speakers. And soon he will test her as he once tested Maneo. Maneo in his youth had been placed in a massive maze concealed beneath Leto's citadel. He was given only a bag of food and a vial of the deadly spice essence, the truthsayer drug, which could unblock genetic memory. It was the only liquid Leto gave him. Maneo was Atreides. He knew he would be exposed to the intermultitude upon consumption of the drug, and he feared this more than dying of thirst. He knew, however, that he had no choice. After wandering the maze for hours, he finally consumes the drug. He heard the ancestral voices and his prescient eye was open. He saw what the god emperor saw. He saw what Paul Atreides had seen and ran from those many thousands of years ago. He saw humanity's extinction and also the means by which it could be diverted, the golden path. Maneo now understood. After this, he awoke knowing the way out of the maze and knowing that he would serve the god emperor to the end of his days and he served him faithfully since that day. Maneo had been enlightened by the Golden Path. He was terrified of the idea of the world without Leto. He would rather die than face such an existence. The new Duncan, however, has begun to see Leto's rule as corruption. As he has gotten to know the world around him, he began to believe that Leto's rule of the Empire was one of religious tyranny and oppression. Idaho naturally rebelled against this. Idaho is even more disturbed upon witnessing the children of his predecessor, as well as the widow, who Duncan notices has a striking resemblance to the Lady Jessica. The God Emperor has intended to breed Siona and Duncan, and has forced them into situations where they must be together. Both Siona and Duncan resent the God Emperor for trying to control them in this manner. Siona is the key to hastening Duncan's disillusionment with the God Emperor giving him insight on the true goings-on in the Worm's empire. Duncan had been immediately attracted to the Ixian ambassador, We Nori, upon seeing her, but the God Emperor had commanded him to avoid her, saying, We is not for you. When the God Emperor decided to wed Hui Nori, Maneo voiced his own apprehensions, pointing out that this was obviously part of some Ixian plot. But Leto is in fact vulnerable. He loves Hui. Only around her does his loneliness fade. Duncan is revulsed by the thought of Leto wedding Hui. He speaks of frontiers and questions the Lord Leto on whether he would truly be free to do what he wished and go where he wished. Leto tells him that he is free to go as he chooses. I have given you my oath. That is important to me. It is still important. I don't know what you're doing or why. I can only say, I don't like what's happening. There, I said it. Leto sees Duncan as a child, and thinks to himself that Duncan is both the oldest and youngest man in the universe. Duncan disobeys the God Emperor, however, which angers him. When the God Emperor speaks to Moneo after his arrival back from the festival city, Moneo could sense the coming of the Worm. Moneo believed, truly, that there were two, Leto and the Worm. It was the Worm that killed, the Worm who was God, Leto inhabited God. Leto demands that Moneo accelerate the plans for the wedding. Moneo attempts to calm the God Emperor by stating that Nori merely feels sorry for Duncan, but Leto knows that he is courting her. He is clever with women, Moneo. Exceedingly clever. He sees into their souls and makes them do what he wants. It has always been that way with the Duncans. I did not know you had prohibited all meetings between them, Lord. Moneo's voice was almost strident. He is more dangerous than any of the others. Leto said. It is the fault of our times. Lord, the Tleilaxu do not have a successor for him ready to deliver. And we need this one? You said it yourself, Lord. It is a paradox, which I do not understand. But you did say it. How long until there could be a replacement? At least a year, Lord. Shall I inquire as to a specific date? Do it today. He may hear about it, Lord. The previous one did. I do not want it to happen this way, Moneo. I know, Lord. And I dare not speak of this to Nori, Leto said. The Duncan is not for her, yet I cannot hurt her. The last was almost a wail. Moneo stood in awed silence. Can't you see this? Leto demanded. Moneo, help me. 
Kuinori and Duncan have fallen for each other, which upsets the God Emperor. He does not wish to hurt her. This makes him vulnerable. Moneo then starts to see the signs of the coming of the worm. The God Emperor's hands begin to twitch, and his eyes glaze over. Moneo takes a step back, feeling exposed, knowing that a mere flick of the great body would kill him. I must appeal to the human in him. Moneo brings up Leto's sister Ganima. They had been wed, but not mates. He asks Leto if it would be possible for him to mate with Wee Nori, but the worm signs only intensified. Leto's hands vibrated spasmodically. In a very distant voice, he tells Maneo not to question him about possibilities. Maneo can hear that Leto is sinking further and further into that inner gate which only he could enter. Maneo slowly backed out of the room, trembling. Ah, that was the closest ever. And the paradox remained. Where did it point? What was the meaning of the God Emperor's odd and painful decisions? What brought the worm who is God? A thumping sounded from within Leto's Ari, a heavy beating against stone. Maneo dared not open the door to investigate. He pushed himself away from the surface which reflected that dreadful thumping, and went down the stairs moving cautiously, not drawing an easy breath until he reached the ground level and the fish speaker guard there. Is he disturbed? she asked, looking up the stairs. Maneo nodded. They both could hear the thumping quite plainly. What disturbs him? The guard asked. He is God, and we are mortal, Moneo said. Duncan has put them all in danger, and Moneo cannot help but resent him even more. He wonders what can be done about Hui Nori. Moneo goes to Duncan and tells him of the God Emperor's wishes. His relationship with Hui Nori cannot continue. It only angers Duncan more. Maneo sees now that this Duncan is more reckless than any of the others before him, and insists that he must trust the God Emperor. But the Duncan says aloud, How can a god do evil things? The fish speaker women in the room without a doubt heard this, and would make their reports to the Lord Leto. Had it been any other man other than Duncan Idaho who spoke those words, the women themselves would have eliminated him. Duncan becomes paranoid, and wonders what the God Emperor will do but in his chambers he finds Wee Nori there. She had been told to reject Duncan. As Duncan looks at her, he is reminded of the controlled movements of the Lady Jessica and realizes that Wee Nori is Bene Gesserit trained. The Bene Gesserit were indeed among her teachers, though she is not a member of the Sisterhood. Hui cannot deny her attraction to Duncan, though the God Emperor forbids it. She admits to Duncan that she was bred and trained for one purpose alone to woo the God Emperor. She was designed to please an Atreides, and Duncan had always truly been Atreides. Hui and Duncan make love then, but afterwards she tells him that they never will again be together in this way. She tells him that she will tell the God Emperor of what they have done. She knows that Leto will not harm her, and he will not harm the Duncan, for this would destroy her in turn. Hui truly understands that Leto needs her more than Duncan, though Duncan argues. He only resents Leto even more. Finally, Leto and Siona meet. He summons her to him. She asks him if he is really a god. She does not understand why her father Maneo believes in him, but he does not necessarily answer her. She asks why he has done what he has done, why he has chosen to become this monstrosity, but he does not directly answer. Gradually as they spoke, Leto had been dimming the concealed lights of his airy, moving his cart closer and closer to Siona. Now he shut off the lights, leaving only the moon. The front of his cart protruded onto the balcony, his face about two meters from Siona. My father tells me, she said, that the older you get, the slower your time goes. Is that what you told him? Testing my veracity, he thought. She is not a truth singer then. All things are relative, but compared to the human time since, this is true. Why? It is involved in what I will become. At the end time will stop for me, and I will be frozen like a pearl caught in ice. My new bodies will scatter, each with a pearl hidden within it. She turned and looked away from him, peering out at the desert, speaking without looking at him. When I talk to you like this, here in the darkness, 
I can almost forget what you are. When Siona asks Leto to turn on the lights, she wonders why his face is not wrinkled. He tells her that nothing about his human parts age in a normal way. She wonders if he did this for long life, but he assures her that he did not. He tells her the truth about his metamorphosis, that since she is Atreides, she could too be like him if there were other sand trout around. The thought of it makes her shiver, but she knows that it is the truth. Once again she asked why, but he said that she will know in time. Leto tells Siona of his secret, the secret that she already knows. He tells her of the companions that he has loved that have slipped away from him, of her mother who slipped away long ago, and her father who is slipping away now. He is racked with emotion each time. For many centuries, this suffering was the only emotion he knew. Siona sympathizes with the God Emperor, but insists that this does not give him the right to govern, and Leto knew this was the root of her rebellion. By what right? Where is the justice in my rule? By imposing my rules upon them, with the weight of fish speaker arms, am I being fair to the evolutionary thrust of mankind? As intended, Leto's conversation with Siona leaves her wide open to her own doubts. She still insists that she had not been convinced of anything by their meeting. She asks what the purpose of it was. He tells her that the purpose is to see if she was ready to be tested, which obviously frightens her. Don't play innocent with me. Maneo has told you, and I tell you that you are ready. She tried to swallow then. What are... I have sent for Maneo to return you to the Citadel, he said. When we meet again, we will really learn what you are made of. When the God Emperor next speaks to Maneo, he asks how soon the Tleilaxu can provide a replacement Duncan. Maneo tells him that the Tleilaxu report problems. Maneo believes that the worm may soon approach. The God Emperor grows increasingly agitated with the behavior of the current Duncan. His subversion was occurring far more quickly than anticipated. Maneo was aware of the many deaths that had occurred in the crypts in which they resided. He wonders, judging by the way the God Emperor is speaking, if it is his time to die. Failure to respond to the God Emperor correctly, he believed, would mean his death. Abruptly, Leto's voice filled the chamber with a rumbling baritone, an ancient voice which spoke across the centuries. You are servants unto gods, not servants unto servants! Maneo wrung his hands out and cried, I serve you, Lord! Maneo! Maneo! His voice low and resonant. A million wrongs cannot give rise to one right. The right is known because it endures. Maneo could only stand in trembling silence. I had intended we to mate with you, Maneo, Leto said. Now it is too late. The words took a moment, penetrating Maneo's consciousness. He felt that their meaning was out of any known context. We? Who was we? Oh yes, the god emperor's Ixian bride-to-be. Mate? With me? Maneo shook his head. Leto spoke with infinite sadness. You too shall pass away. Will all of your works be as dust, forgotten? Without any warning, even as he spoke, Leto's body convulsed in a thrashing roll, which heaved him from the cart. The speed of it, the monstrous violence, threw him within centimeters of Maneo who screamed and fled across the crypt. Maneo! Leto's call stopped the Major Domo at the entrance to the lift. The test, Maneo! I will test Siona tomorrow. Siona asks her father about the test. She asks him what will happen to her. He tells her that each test is different. Leto had listened to them secretly through his Ixian devices, as Maneo dressed his daughter in a traditional Fremen still suit. He told her that the worm would come, and that she must find a way to live in his presence. He explained the still suit to her, and how it worked, and told her that she must go, but that she may not return. Leto brings Siona into his desert, the only desert remaining on the planet Arrakis. The isolated desert climate was maintained by Ixian devices. Leto could move swiftly in his own territory. It was his domain. They look out onto the desert together. This was how it was, he said. He knew that there was something in the desert that spoke to the eternal soul of those who possessed Fremen blood. He tells Siona to climb upon his back. I want you to taste the way our people once moved proudly across this land. 
high atop the back of a giant sandworm. Leto knows that Siona still has no idea how he intends to test her. He knew that he must have no pity. He leads them both deeper into the desert. He sensed it when Siona began to enjoy the sensation of riding on his back. He felt a faint shift in her weight as she eased back onto her legs to lift her head. He drove outward, then along the curving barricade, joining Siona in enjoyment of the old sensations. Once he tells her to come down, she is distrustful. She is afraid that he will leave her there. He tells her that they have traveled 60 kilometers. He tells her that now that she has felt her past, she must be sensitized to her future. He has brought her to the center of the desert. He tells her that they will walk out of the desert together. She only has a small pouch of food to sustain her. He tells her that they will travel by night, in the traditional Fremen way. Meanwhile, Idaho has sought out Maneo and angrily demands to know where Leto is. I'll find him, Maneo. Not right now. Idaho put a hand on his knife. Do I have to use force to make you talk? I would not advise that. Where is he? Since you insist, he is out in the desert with Siona. With your daughter? Is there another Siona? What are they doing? She is being tested. When will they return? Maneo shrugged, then. Why this unseemly anger, Duncan? What's this test of your... I don't know. Now, why are you so upset? I'm sick of this place. Fish speakers. Duncan had glimpsed two fish speaker women joined together in a kiss. This disturbed his archaic sensibilities. Maneo said, It is perfectly normal for adolescent females as well as males to have feelings of physical attraction toward members of their own sex. Most of them will grow out of it. It should be stamped out. But it's part of our heritage. Idaho insists that this rampant homosexuality must be suppressed. But wiser Maneo understood that an attempt to suppress such a thing only increases its power. Idaho shifts the conversation to the topic of Siona and attempts to shame Maneo for allowing the worm to test her, knowing that she may never return. Maneo wonders to himself why he puts up with such a foolish person as Duncan Idaho, and he responds that he had no choice. He insists to Duncan Idaho that he must mature. I am not some damn child you can- Duncan! It was the loudest sound Idaho had ever heard from the mild-mannered Maneo. Surprise stayed Idaho's hand while Maneo continued. If the demands of your flesh are for maturity, but something holds you in adolescence, quite nasty behavior develops. Let go. Are you accusing me of- No! Maneo gestured at the corridor. Oh, I know what you must have seen back there, but it- Two women? In a passionate kiss? You think that's not- It's not important. Youth explores potential in many ways. Idaho balanced himself on the edge of an explosion, rocking forward on his toes. I'm glad to learn about you, Maneo. Yes. Well, I've learned about you several times. Maneo watched the effect of these words as they twisted through Idaho, tangling him. The Golas could never avoid a fascination with the others who had preceded them. Idaho spoke in a hoarse whisper. What have you learned? You have taught me valuable things, Maneo said. All of us try to evolve, but if something blocks us, we can transfer our potential into pain seeking it or giving it. Adolescents are particularly vulnerable. Idaho leaned close to Maneo. I'm talking about sex. Of course you are. Are you accusing me of adolescent? That's right. I should cut your- Oh, shut up! Maneo's response did not have the training nuances of Benny Jesuit voice control, but it had a lifetime of command behind it. Something in Idaho could only obey. I'm sorry, Maneo said, but I am distracted by the fact that my only daughter- He broke off and shrugged. Idaho inhaled two deep breaths. You're crazy. All of you. You say your daughter may be dying and yet- you fool! Maneo snapped. Have you any idea how your petty concerns appear to me? Your stupid questions and your selfish... He broke off, shaking his head. I make allowances because you have certain problems, Idaho said. But if you... Allowances? You make allowances! Maneo took a trembling breath. It was too much. Idaho spoke stiffly. I can forgive you for... You? 
You prattle about sex and forgiving and pain, and you think you and we, Nori, leave her out of this. Oh yes, leave her out. Leave out that pain. You share sex with her and you never think about parting. Tell me, fool, how do you give of yourself in the face of that? Abashed, Idaho inhaled deeply. He had not suspected such passion smoldering in the quiet Maneo. But this attack, this could not be. You think I'm cruel? Maneo demanded. I make you think of things you'd rather avoid. Ha! Huh. Crueler things have been done to the Lord Leto for no better reason than the cruelty. You defend him. You... I know him best. He uses you. To what ends? You tell me. He is our best hope to perpetuate. Perverts do not perpetuate. Maneo spoke in a soothing tone, but his words shook Idaho. I will tell you this only once. Homosexuals have been among the best warriors in our history. The berserkers of last resort. They were among our best priests and priestesses. Celibacy was no accident in religions. Maneo attempts to guide Duncan out of his backward viewpoint, but Duncan resists at every turn, constantly questing for something else to hate about Leto's empire. You suggested that he uses me, Maneo said. I permit this because I know the price that he pays is much greater than what he demands of me. Even your daughter. He holds back nothing. Why should I? Oh, I think you understand this about the Atreides. The Duncans are always good at that. The Duncans, damn you, I won't be. You just haven't the guts to pay the price he's asking, Maneo said. In one blurred motion, Idaho whipped his knife from its sheath and lunged at Maneo. As fast as he moved, Maneo moved faster, sidestepping, tripping Idaho and propelling him face down on the floor. Idaho scrambled forward, rolled and started to leap to his feet, then hesitated realizing that he had actually tried to attack an Atreides. Maneo was Atreides. Shock held Idaho immobile. Maneo stood unmoving, looking down at him. There was an odd look of sadness on the Major Domo's face. If you are going to kill me, Duncan, you'd best do it in the back by stealth, Maneo said. You might succeed that way. Idaho levered himself to one knee, put a foot flat on the floor, but remained there still clutching his knife. Maneo had moved so quickly, and with such grace, so, so casually, Idaho cleared his throat. How did you? He has been breeding us for a long time, Duncan, strengthening many things in us. He has bred us for speed, for intelligence, for self-restraint, for sensitivity. You're, you're just an older model. The tension that had been building between Duncan and Maneo finally comes to a peak in this scene, when Duncan Idaho attacks Maneo, but then is met with the shock of Maneo's incredible agility and speed. Duncan Idaho is nothing compared to thousands of years of precise genetic honing. After this Idaho's self-esteem drops, he begins to see himself as obsolete and wonders if he should kill himself. He only resents Leto even more. Maneo's words echoed in his mind. You're just an older model. As Leto and Siona moved through the desert, they spoke sporadically. He told her of Fremen history, and in the afternoon, she crept close to him for the warmth his body generated in excess. Leto noticed that Siona was not utilizing the face flap in her still suit. This would cause the body to lose moisture much faster, but he could not intervene. It was part of the test. As their time in the desert continues, Siona grows weaker. She leaned against him once and heard the rumbling of his insides. Leto saw that she was cold. He allowed her to curl up inside a depression at the bottom of his first segment in order to keep warm. Leto knew that he had to resist feeling pity for Siona. Since knowing Hui Nori, his human emotions had become more amplified than they had been in centuries. Siona inched closer to death as time went on. Leto prepared himself for her failure, and considered her replacement. Once Leto had made callous decisions with ease, but as he grew increasingly inhuman, he found himself to be consumed with increasingly more human concerns. It was only on the third day that Siona remembered Maneo's explanation of the still suit. By this point, however, Siona had lost a considerable amount of water. Five days in, Leto can sense Siona's desperation 
and knows that she will soon reach a moment of crisis. He tells her that there are three nights until they find water. She knows that she will not make it. Once again, she asks why he does what he does. He tells her truthfully that he has a need to save the threads of all humankind. He says that without him, by this point in history, all of humankind would already be extinct, and the path to that extinction would have been more hideous than she could have ever possibly imagined. He assures her that the two of them are in fact interdependent, and when she asks what need he has of her, he responds by saying this, You are the golden path, he said. Me? It was barely a whisper. You've read those journals you stole from me, he said. I am in them, but where are you? Look at what I have created, Siona. And you, you can create nothing except yourself. Words, more tricky words. I do not suffer from being worshipped, Siona. I suffer from never being appreciated. Perhaps, no, I dare not hope for you. What's the purpose of those journals? An Ixian machine records them. They are to be found on a faraway day. They will make people think. An Ixian machine? You defy the Jihad! There is a lesson in that too. What do such machines really do? They increase the number of things we can do without thinking. Things we do without thinking. There's the real danger. Look at how long you walked across this desert without thinking about your face mask. You could have warned me. And increased your dependency. Siona still does not yet understand what Leto means in insisting that she is the Golden Path, but she is shocked by his admission to defying the Butlerian Jihad. He tells her that it is not the machines that are the danger, but the thoughtless things that humans can do using those machines. In truth, Leto fears the Ixians, knowing that they can invent catastrophe. Leto knew that all of history was a race between invention and catastrophe. Siona asks what she must do for him in order to save her. He tells her that she must undergo the spice agony. And she knows what the spice will do to her, considering her Atreides' blood. These curled flaps beside my face, he said. Tease one of them gently with a finger, and it will give up drops of moisture heavily laced with the spice essence. Siona leaned towards him and licked the drops off his flap and resealed the still suit mask over her eyes. She refitted herself into Leto's front segment. She jerked abruptly and began to tremble like a small creature dying. He knew this experience, but could not change the smallest part of it. No ancestral presences would remain in her consciousness, but she would carry with her forever afterward the clear sights and sounds and smells. The seeking machines would be there. The smell of blood and entrails. The cowering humans in their burrows, aware that they could not escape. While all the time, the mechanical movement approached. Nearer and nearer and nearer. Louder and louder. Leto could feel Siona's life ebbing. He could feel the vitality draining out of her slipping away. She was falling into darkness. Leto rocked her gently like a baby in a cradle. Eventually the trembling subsided. Siona awoke late afternoon and did not speak for an hour, turning her back on Leto. She had seen everything. You could have saved my friends in the forest, she accused. You too could have saved them. She clenched her fist and pressed them against her temples while she glared at him. But you know everything, Siona. Did I have to learn it that way? She whispered. He remained silent, forcing her to answer the question for herself. She had to be made to recognize that his primary consciousness worked in a Fremen way, and that like the terrible machines of that apocalyptic vision, the predator could follow any creature who left tracks. The golden path, she whispered. I can feel it. Then, glaring at him, It's so cruel. Survival has always been cruel. They couldn't hide, she whispered. Then loud, What have you done to me? You tried to be a Fremen rebel, he said. 
Fremen had an almost incredible ability to read signs on the desert. They could even read the faint tracery of wind-blown tracks in sand. Leto muses about what they had seen in the vision. The machines that would hunt and kill any living creature who left tracks. Siona and her descendants would leave no tracks. Siona saw the golden path, saw what it prevented. She saw the thing that humans could not hide from, the thing that would hunt and kill every living thing in the universe. Siona still hates Leto, however, and she has realized that he cannot find her in his prescient view. He tells her that she hates the Predator's necessary cruelty. He tells her that she must breed and preserve her precious genes. As Leto spoke, a sudden bout of rain covered them for an instant, a malfunction of his Ixian weather machines. Siona did not immediately notice the effect it had on Leto. He curled into a ball of agony, felt as though he was being ripped apart. Blue smoke drifted from his body as he involuntarily began to produce true spice essence, not the altered form that he had used to test Siona, which did not allow her to retain genetic memory. Siona realizes that the water hurts him. He tells her about the relationship of sand trout to water. In that moment, Leto could see that there was still rebellion in her eyes. She could not deny the reality of his golden path, but in her mind, his cruelties could not be forgiven. He knows what Siona is thinking, but will do nothing against her. She must live. After their return from the desert, Leto makes Siona a guard commander. Still, she plots his destruction. And now Duncan Idaho plots along with her. And now that Siona knows the secret of the God Emperor's demise, ring him with water, she is certain that she can kill him. Siona says that she will not break her oath, that she will command his fish speakers, but it will not be as he wishes, or so she thought. Siona was Atreides, and she opposed the God Emperor, so Duncan was justified. Leto was no true human after all. Siona was a real Atreides. Together, they plot the murder of the God Emperor. Nela, who has sworn to obey Siona in all things, has no choice but to help, knowing that her god will perform a miracle. The god emperor grows increasingly agitated as his wedding draws nearer. Only Hui Nori seems to calm him. I have no inner eye, no inner voices, she said. But I have seen my lord Leto, whose soul I love, and I know the only thing that you truly understand. He broke from her gaze, fearful of what she might say. The trembling of his hands could be felt all through his front segment. Love, that is what you understand, she said. Love, and that is all of it. His hands stopped trembling. A tear rolled down each of his cheeks. When the tears touched his cowl, wisp of blue smoke erupted. He sensed the burning and was thankful for the pain. The Ixians had intended for Leto to love Hui, but not for her to love him. That was beyond their planning. Leto sheds a tear in this scene, a thing which he had previously believed was impossible. Leto was more inhuman than he had ever been before. We offered him an opportunity to restore his humanity for one final fleeting moment. As the royal cart carrying the god emperor and Wee Nori crosses the bridge leading into Tuano village, Maneo heard the laser gun. It was Nela who had fired from the cliffs at the command of Siona. Maneo felt the bridge shake underneath him. He saw the god emperor's cart lean over the edge of the bridge. Wee Nori fell silently to her death. Her last words echoed in Leto's mind. I shall go on ahead, love. A deep, rumbling groan had come from Leto then. And in that moment, another laser gun blast hit, directly striking the royal cart's suspensors. As Maneo fell, he reaches a final point of awareness, the clarity of mind that one experiences before death. As he plunges to his death, he turns to see Leto fall from the royal cart. He shouted, Leto! See a nook! I believe! He fell freely then, in the ecstasy of awareness. As Leto fell toward the river beneath, he thought to himself, Now you will learn. 
it is time for humanity to know his final lesson. Leto fell into pure agony. He marveled that he could remain conscious through such incredible pain. He could feel himself separating as the sand trout of his body detached from him and went into the water. They would eventually emerge as a new breed of worms. Spice in the future will be more difficult to harvest, for each worm would have a piece of the god emperor inside, a fragmentation of his whole self. Puffs of blue smoke and mist rise all around him as his body produces the spice essence. Somehow, he pulls himself from the water. He recognizes the place then. Just down the barrier wall was the remains of Siege Tabor, where he had hidden his immense hoard of spice. He turned in the confinement of the cave and saw a rope dangling at the entrance. A figure slid down the rope. He recognized Nayla. She dropped to the rocks and crouched there, staring into the shadows at him. The flame which was Leto's vision parted to reveal another figure dropping from the rope. Siona. She and Nayla scrambled toward him in a rattle of rocks and stopped, peering at him. A third figure dropped off the rope. Idaho. He moved with a frantic rage, hurling himself at Nayla, screaming, Why'd you kill her? You weren't supposed to kill Hui. Nayla sent him sprawling with a casual, almost indifferent sweep of her left arm. She scrambled up closer to the rocks and stopped on all fours to peer at Leto. Lord, you live? Idaho was right behind her, snatching the laser gun from her holster. Nayla turned, astonished, as he leveled the weapon and pulled the trigger. The burning started at the top of Nayla's head. It split her, the pieces slumping apart. Siona and Duncan gaze upon Leto. The sand trout skin had fled into the water. He was pocked with cilia holes from where they had left. He was a disgusting sludge. Look at what you've done to poor Duncan, Leto said. He'll find other loves. How callous she sounded, an echo of his own angry youth. You do not know what love is, he said. What have you ever given? He could only wring his hands then, those travesties which once had been his hands. Gods below what I've given. She slid closer and reached toward him, then drew back. I am reality, Siona. Look upon me. I exist. You can touch me if you dare. Reach out your hand. Do it. Slowly, she reached toward what had been his front segment, the place where she had slept in the surreal. Her hand was touched with blue when she withdrew it. You have touched me and felt my body, he said. Is that not strange beyond any other thing in this universe? She started to turn away. No, don't turn away from me. Look at what you have wrought, Siona. How is it that you can touch me, but you cannot touch yourself? She whirled away from him. There is the difference between us, he said. You are God embodied. You walk around with the greatest miracle of this universe. Yet you refuse to touch, or see, or feel, or believe in it. As Leto died, he could sense his Ixian devices working, recording his thoughts on Redulian crystals. Leto thinks to his journals, Remember what I did. Remember me. I will be innocent again. The journals will be his record of the truth, the version undistorted by history. He says to Duncan, Let them scatter. Let them run and hide anywhere they want, in any universe they choose. Referencing the great scattering of mankind that will occur following his death, he tells Duncan that the fish speakers will choose to follow him over Siona. He asks Duncan to be kind to her. He tells him that Siona is more than Atreides, and that she carries the seed of the survival of all humans. Leto tells Siona and Duncan where his spice hoard is hidden. Duncan knows the place. One final time, Duncan asks why. Why has Leto done any of this? Leto answers. My gift, Leto said. Nobody will find the descendants of Siona. The Oracle cannot see her. What? They spoke in unison, leaning close to hear his fading voice. I give you a new kind of time. Without parallels, he said. It will always diverge. There will be no concurrent points on its curves. I give you the golden path. That is my gift. 
never again will you have the kinds of concurrence that once you had. Leto dies as his consciousness is fragmented, and the gross hulk that was his body disintegrates into puddles of blue mist. Siona tells Duncan that though she is different, she is still what Leto was. She walked amongst her inner lives, but was unseen and could only glimpse blurred shapes of her ancestral past, enough to light the golden path. You know the myth of the Great Spice Horde. Yes, I know about that story too. A major domo brought it to me one day to amuse me. The story says there is a horde of melange, a gigantic horde, big as a great mountain. The horde is concealed in the depths of a distant planet. It is not Arrakis, that planet. It is not Dune. The spice was hidden there long ago, even before the First Empire and the Spacing Guild. The story says that Paul Muad'Dib went there and lives yet beside the Horde, kept alive by it, waiting. The Major Domo did not understand why the story disturbed me. The story of the Great Spice Horde may have disturbed the God Emperor for several reasons. In some sense, Paul did live on, kept alive by a giant spice horde. Muad'Dib still lived within the hordes of Leto's mind, eternally observing. The story may also disturb Leto because it represents the very thing he was trying to destroy. The story indicated that humankind still longed for their messiah, their savior who would solve their problems and restore the empire to the way it once was. This mentality was incompatible with the Golden Path. But what is the Golden Path exactly? It starts with one basic idea. If one individual could rule over all mankind, then one threat could destroy it. This is the essential lesson that he had to teach mankind. Centralized leaders must be avoided at all cost. He became the greatest despot of all time, so that humans would always remember and never return to their past behaviors. There is more. Leto saw the death of all humankind if he did not intervene. In the stolen journals, Leto muses to himself, and who knows what the Ixians might manufacture or invent. Who knows? I certainly don't. Not all of it. Leto understood that once the magic of technology was unleashed, that it could never be put back in the box. The Ixians had tried to hide a colony beyond his vision. It had failed. He tolerated the Ixians, though he called them criminals of science. The Ixians operated in the terra incognita of creative invention, which had been outlawed by the Butlerian Jihad. They made their devices in the image of the mind, the very thing which had ignited the Jihad's destruction and slaughter. That was what they did on Ix, and Leto could only let them continue. But Leto knew that he would not have to worry as long as he succeeded in his breeding program. Once he knew that Siona was the one, he no longer feared what the Ixians would create. His final words to Duncan and Siona are, Do not fear the Ixians. They can make the machines, but they can no longer make Arafel. I know. I was there. Arafel is the cloud darkness of holy judgment. This is a biblical reference. Psalm 97.2 Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and justice are the habitation of his throne. Essentially, Leto was saying that though the Ixians will continue to invent, they will never create God, never create a machine that will be the final judge of all humankind. Siona solved this problem. Whatever threat that Leto foresaw would have used prescience to seek out and destroy all of mankind. Siona's genes which spread throughout all the universe during the scattering, would prevent this. By forcing mankind to stagnate, confined to their individual planets for thousands of years, Leto created a restlessness within them. When they were free from his tyranny, they scattered throughout the universe. The Ixian threat would never be able to find all humans. No one individual could ever again glimpse the whole of humanity. 
No machine can do as we do. The descendants of Duncan, Idaho, and Siona have done. How many universes have we populated? None can guess. No one person will ever know. Does the church fear the occasional prophet? We know that visionaries cannot see us nor predict our decisions. No death can find all of humankind. Must we of the minority join our fellows of the scattering before we can be heard? Must we leave the original core of humankind ignorant and uninformed? If the majority drives us out, you know we never again can be found. We do not want to leave. We are held here by those pearls in the sand. We are fascinated by the church's use of the pearl as the sun of understanding. Surely no reasoning human can escape the journal's revelations in this regard. The admittedly fugitive but vital uses of archaeology must have their day, just as the primitive machine which Leto concealed his journals can only teach us about the evolution of our machines. Just so, that ancient awareness must be allowed to speak to us. It would be a crime against both historical accuracy and science for us to abandon our attempts at communication with those pearls of awareness, which the journals have located. Is Leto II lost in his endless dream, or could he be reawakened to our times, brought to full consciousness as a storehouse of historical accuracy? How can Holy Church fear this truth? For the minority, we have no doubt that historians must listen to that voice from our many beginnings. If it is only the journals, we must listen. We must listen across at least as many years into our future as those journals lay hidden in our past. We will not try to predict the discoveries yet to be made within those pages. We say only that they must be made. How can we turn our backs on our most important inheritance? As the poet Lon Bromless said, We are the fountain of surprises. I hope you all have enjoyed episode 5 of my Ultimate Guide to Dune series. In the next episode we will cover Heretics of Dune, the fifth book in Frank Herbert's classic Dune saga. If you would like to support this channel, consider pledging a dollar or two on Patreon. Most discipline is hidden discipline, designed not to liberate but to limit. Do not ask why, be cautious with how. Why leads inexorably to paradox, how traps you in a universe of cause and effect. Both deny the infinite. Heretics of Dune is the fifth novel in Frank Herbert's original Dune series. The book follows the machinations of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood as they encounter new powers within the old empire, the lost ones returning out of the great scattering. After the death of the Worm God Emperor approximately 1500 years ago, the Fish Speakers, his female military force, had taken control of the God Emperor's enormous wealth of spice. They had squandered that tremendous wealth in petty squabbles and foolish actions, 
no single event significant enough to be recorded by history. Eventually, the Tleilak Su, that friend world at the edge of the Empire who had produced countless golas for the God Emperor, discovered a way to produce spice melange from within their axolotl tanks. This pushed the fish speakers into an alliance with the Ixians. Control of Arrakis passed to the priesthood, who led a new religion formed from the remnants of Leto's old design. They worshipped the god of the desert, Shai Halud, each worm now containing a piece of the god emperor's consciousness. Still, the Bene Gesserit remained one of the most powerful forces in the empire superior to the modern fish speaker council, which had inherited the heart of the old Atreides empire. They were superior to Chom by far, and equal to the Spacing Guild, though the guild's monopoly on space travel had long been broken by the Ixians, who had invented technology which allowed vessels to travel without the use of a guild navigator. The Bene Gesserit had always seen themselves as permanent revolutionaries. It was a revolution that had been dampened only in the time of the tyrant, Leto II. Dampened, but not diverted or stopped. Since the time of the God Emperor, the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood had purchased 12 Duncan Idaho Golas from the Tleilaxu. Up until this point, each one had been assassinated. They suspected by the Tleilaxu themselves. Many in the Sisterhood feared this Gola project. The Mother Superior Taraza knows there are heretics among them. The word heretic here referred to a private joke within the Sisterhood. They were supposed to follow the orders of the Mother Superior always, with absolute devotion. The Sisters did do this, except when they disagreed. The most recent Duncan Idaho Gola was sent to the planet Gamu to be trained. Gamu had once been known as Gidi Prime, until the name was changed by Gurney Halleck. The Bene Gesserit keep on Gamu was watched over by the Reverend Mother Shuang Yu. Shuang Yu was a heretic. The older woman, like some others in the Sisterhood, believed the Gola project to be ultimately dangerous to the Bene Gesserit. Those in her camp of thought believed that there was a chance that by meddling with the forces set in motion by the tyrant, they could make the same mistake as before, losing control of a Kwisatz Haderach. To meddle with the worm-bound remnants of the tyrant, that was dangerous in the extreme. Taraza does not trust Shuang Yu with the Gola. She knows that Shuang Yu is in active opposition to the Gola project and has underlying violent motives against Duncan. When the Gola was six, his military training on Gamu began. His instruction was given over to the hands of the Bashar Miles Teg. He was an Atreides descendant, born of a Bene Gesserit reverend mother. Miles Teg's mother had also been a heretic, giving Teg secret knowledge he was not meant to possess. This Gola project was extremely important to Mother Superior Taraza. She had summoned Miles Teg out of retirement, and as a man who had served the Sisterhood his entire life, he could not deny her. Except for his age, 296 standard years, Miles Teg was the spitting image of the original Duke Leto. This, of course, was part of the Bene Gesserit design. Taraza intended to use him to eventually awaken the Gola's past memories, as Hate had done in the book Dune Messiah. This new Duncan Gola had been altered by the Tleilaxu. His reflexes and nerves modernized. The Sisterhood did not deny the possibility that the Tleilaxu may have changed him in other ways as well. Still, the Bene Gesserit gave him the most careful Pranabindu training at all stages. When Duncan is around 10 years old, Reverend Mother Lucilla, an imprinter, is sent to train him at the keep on Gamu. Lucilla was obedient to Taraza. Her task would be to teach Duncan Idaho love in all forms. Lucilla was also of Atreides descent, of a particularly motherly line. As a descendant of Siona, she was immune to all forms of prescience. She was young, but had already produced three children for the sisterhood. When she first speaks with Shuang Yu on Gamu, she can sense Shuang Yu's violent intent against the Gola. 
the Jessica persona within her memories also can sense doom. Surely no one believes this Gola can become another Kwisatz Haderach, Lucilla objected. Shuang Yu merely shrugged. Lucilla held herself quite still, thinking, was it possible the Gola could be transformed into a male version of a reverend mother? Could this Duncan Idaho learn to look inward where no reverend mother dared? On the planet Rackus, formerly known as Arrakis, the priesthood has made a discovery. A child of eight named Shiana Brug, who has power over the great worms of the desert. When her village was attacked by a worm, killing everyone she knew, she encountered the creature, discovering her strange gift. Rage and wild desperation began to fill Shiana. Mindlessly, she raced down the dune toward Shaitan, coming up behind the worm as it turned back through the dry place where it had entered the village. Without a thought, she dashed along beside the tail, scrambled onto it, and ran forward along the great ridged back. At the hump behind its mouth, she crouched and beat her fist against the unyielding surface. The worm stopped. The worm had brought Shiana out of the desert and to the city of Keen, once called Arakeen. The priesthood had seen her arrival. Worm riding had been outlawed by the priesthood, but Shiana did not use maker hooks as did the Fremen of old. The worm carried her of its own volition. Some of the priests called Shiana the child of Shai Halud. Some believed she should be punished for mounting Shai Halud. All her life, Shiana had been taught to despise these priests. And why shouldn't she? They were the oppressive dictators of her planet. For days, the priest argued over the fate of Shiana, and finally they decided to test her. Normally, this test would be an execution in disguise. Those who displeased the priesthood would be dropped into the desert, a thumper would be placed, and a worm summoned. They would meet the judgment of God. Two worms came for Shiana during the test, as the priest watched from thopters above her. Go ahead, eat me, that's what they want. The priest overhead could not hear her words, but the gesture was visible, and they could see that she was talking to the two worms of God. The finger pointing up at them did not bode well. The worms did not move. Shiana lowered her hand. You killed my mother, and father, and all my friends, she accused. She took a step forward and shook a fist at them. The worms retreated, keeping their distance. If you don't want me, go back where you came from. She waved them away toward the desert. Obediently, they backed farther and turned in unison. Shiana's power over the great worms could no longer be doubted by anyone. She is brought to the temple of the priesthood, where she lives like royalty for six years, as the priests study her and her conversations with her father, the god of the desert. The high priest Tuit grows fond of the child, and even gives up his own bedchamber to her. Her every whim is sated. Any request, no matter how difficult, must be fulfilled for the holy child. The people of Arrakis eventually begin to worship Shiana, seeing her as a woman of the people. All the while the Bene Gesserit have had their spies keeping a close watch on Shiana. They have plans for her. Leto II himself had predicted the coming of this child. There is a female child named Shiana Brug on Rakis, Shuang Yu said. She can control the giant worms. Lucilla concealed her alertness. Giant worms, not Shai Halud. Not Shai Tan, giant worms. The Sand Rider predicted by the tyrant had appeared at last. The Mother Superior Taraza has commanded Reverend Mother Darwi Odrade to go to Rakis to prepare Shiana for what must come. Odrade was also an Atreides descendant, strikingly similar in appearance to her cousin Lucilla. Odrade was more similar in age to Taraza, however. The two of them had bonded at a young age while at the Bene Gesserit schools. Out of necessity, Odrade was hidden as a child. Her mother had made the mistake of being recognized while breeding, 
and Dodraid was kept with a man and woman who acted as her true parents, until one day the sisterhood came for her. The memory of that day still haunted Odraid. When the Reverend Mothers came, the foster mother had not fought the removal of her child. Two Reverend Mothers came with a contingent of male and female proctors. Afterward, Odraid was a long time understanding the significance of that wrenching moment. The woman had known in her heart that the day of parting would come, only a matter of time. Still, as the days became years, almost six standard of years, the woman had dared to hope. Then, the Reverend Mothers came with their burly attendants. They had merely been waiting until it was safe, until they were sure no hunters knew this was a Bene Gesserit planned Atreides scion. Odraid saw a great deal of money pass to the foster mother. The woman threw the money on the floor, but no voice was raised in objection. The adults in the scene knew where the power lay. Calling up those compressed emotions, Odraid could still see the woman take herself to a straight-backed chair beside the window onto the street, there to hug herself and rock back and forth, back and forth, not a sound from her. The Reverend Mothers used voice and their considerable wiles plus the smoke of drugging herbs and their overpowering presence to lure Odraid into their waiting ground car. It will be just for a little while. Your real mother sent us. Odraid sensed the lies, but curiosity compelled. My real mother. Her last view of the woman who had been her only known female parent was of that figure at the window rocking back and forth, a look of misery on her face, arms wrapped around herself. Odraid was taught later by the sisterhood to remember that woman's pain. It was her love for Odraid that caused her that misery. The sisterhood understood that love was one of the most dangerous forces in the universe and was best avoided. Thousands of years ago, the Lady Jessica's love for Duke Leto had led to 4,000 years of subjugation under the tyrant. Odre decided early on that she must not love this child, Shiana. Love would weaken her. Odre possessed the Atreides' wild talent, Taraza knew. Prescience. Prescience made the Mother Superior uncomfortable. Two of Odraid's nineteen offspring produced for the sisterhood had been quietly put to death. They had been abominations, pre-born like the tyrant and his sister Ganima had been, as Muad'Dib's sister Aaliyah had been. On Gamu, Duncan, now fifteen, is nearing the appropriate age for Lucilla's final imprintation, sexual imprintation. Throughout his years on Gamu, he had been given access to all the knowledge of the Sisterhood. Only knowledge of the Arcana was forbidden to him. When he had learned of the God Emperor, he had wondered what had driven a man to do such a thing. He wishes that he could have served the God Emperor in his time. Duncan had grown to hate the Reverend Mother Shuang Yu. He could sense her lies and manipulation. He resented the Sisterhood now, but loved Lucilla just as the Mother Superior Teraza had intended. One day, as Duncan is training, a Tleilak Su face dancer disguised as Miles Tag attacks Duncan and Lucilla. After defeating the face dancer, Bashar Mintat Miles Tag quickly discerns that Shuang Yu must be involved in the attack. They are no longer safe at the Bene Gesserit Keep on Gamu. The three of them flee into the wilderness, along with the Bashar's longtime trusted aide, Partran, a native of Gamu. Partran leaves them to create a diversion and is killed by Shuang Yu. Partran, however, had given Miles Tag directions to a secret place he had discovered many years ago as a young man, an ancient Harkonnen no globe. There they could hide from those who would seek them out. For four nights, Tag leads them through the forest of Gamu, knowing that Shuang Yu would not expect them to walk. He must do the unexpected, as the Mother Superior Teraza had commanded. 
According to he and Partran's plan, everything would indicate that they went through the wilderness and escaped the planet on a no ship. The ancient no globe they arrived at was still functioning. There was water and food. Miles knows that he must protect the Gola. He comes to the decision that he will awaken the Gola's memories before Lucilla can complete the final imprintation upon him. This was the only way, according to his Mintat projections, that Duncan's safety and sanity would remain intact. Tag knows it will be no easy thing to thwart a full Reverend Mother. On Rakis, the temple is attacked, and Shiana is nearly killed by a hunter-seeker. The Bene Gesserit spy Kapuna dies saving the now 14-year-old girl. The use of Shigawire during the attack indicated Ixian involvement, and the Sisterhood intended to punish the Guild, the Tleilaxu, and the Ixians for their respective roles in the attack. Shiana is taken into Odraid's care. When Odraid becomes aware of the fact that the High Priest's men are spying, she has them killed swiftly. An agreement is made, and it is decided that Shiana will be brought to a place removed from the Bene Gesserit Keep on Rakis and from the Priest's Temple. They take Shiana to a place in the city of Keen. The place was once a fish speaker center in the days of the God Emperor. It was a comfortable building cooled by Ixian machinery. Odraid allowed the priest to have representatives in the building, but Reverend Mothers walked the halls, and the priest would not intrude where Odraid did not allow, and Shiana would meet them only as she allowed. Shiana takes to Odraid immediately, sensing her power eager for all that she can learn from the Reverend Mother. We have been a long time waiting for you, Odraid said. We will not give those fools another opportunity to lose you. The society of the Bene Tleilax is divided into two classes, Face Dancers and the Masters. No one from Offworld had ever reported seeing a Tleilaxu female. Face Dancers were supposedly sterile mules, submissive to their masters. In this time, Tleilaxu have developed a new kind of face dancer. They were almost undetectable. They could absorb the memories as well as the form and persona of a person. They had already placed some of these new face dancers within the ranks of the Ixians and the fish speakers. The Tleilaxu were now the only secure source of spice melange for the guild now that they could produce it in their axolotl tanks. For every milligram of spice harvested on Rakis, the Bene Tleilax produced tons. Waf was the master of masters. He had been brought back countless times. Since before the time of Paul Atreides, the Tleilaxu had maintained the myth of their own incompetence and malevolence. The Empire had named them Dirty Tleilaxu. We are the people of the Yakist, he had reminded his counselors only last night. All else is frontier. We have fostered the myth of our own weakness and evil practices for these millennia with only one purpose. Even the Bene Gesserit believe. The Tleilaxu held a great belief based on Zinsunism and Sufism. They were extremely pious and extraordinarily xenophobic. No outsider, or Pawinda as they called them, was allowed on the planet. They believed that Leto II had not been God, but the prophet of God. Waf meets with an honored Matre aboard a no-ship. Descendants of Tleilaxu from the Scattering have warned him that these Matres born out of the Scattering had the powers of the Bene Gesserit witches, and worse. The orange-eyed honored Matre demanded total subservience of the Tleilaxu. Using concealed weapons, Waf kills the Matre and she and her companions are replaced with face dancers. He decides that the no ship must disappear. There can be no evidence that the ship ever made it to Tleilax. The retribution of the Matres could be great. After some time inside the Harkonnen note chamber on Gamu, Miles Tag decides that it is time to awaken the Gola's memories, as the Mother Superior had commanded. The young Duncan was eager to know more about his past life. Eight days had gone by in the No Globe. Duncan reacts negatively to the Harkonnen decor of the place, but does not understand why. 
He hated everything about the place. Tag was attempting to keep Duncan from being alone with Lucilla, which Duncan noticed. Lucilla wonders if the tyrant knew through prescience that they would one day need this place. When they had first entered the No Globe, they found 21 skeletons, the ones who had built this place, killed by the Harkonnens to preserve the secrets. Teg tells Duncan that he has been preparing him for the intense pain necessary to restore his memories. Duncan greatly desires to gain past memories, but it was a thing he also feared. He had discovered that he was a Gola years ago at the Bene Gesserit Keep on Gamu. The library provided the child with the most basic details. Golas, humans grown from a cadaver cells in Tleilaxu axolotl tanks. Axolotl tanks? A Tleilaxu device for reproducing a living human being from the cells of a cadaver. Describe a Gola, he demanded. Innocent flesh devoid of its original memories. See axolotl tanks. Duncan had learned to read the silences, the blank places in what the people of the keep revealed to him. Revelation swept over him. He knew. Only ten, and he knew. I am Agola. Late afternoon in the library, all of the esoteric machinery around him faded into a sensory background, and a ten-year-old sat silently before a scanner hugging the knowledge to himself. I am a Gola. Teg knew that he must create mental and physical agony within Duncan as instructed by the Sisterhood. He finds what he must do to be distasteful, which he tells Duncan. The Bene Gesserit had told him the way. Teg's right hand shot out in a swift arc. The open palm cracked against Duncan's cheek. How dare you disobey me! Left hand out, another rocking slap. How dare you! Teg experienced an initial moment of shock at the speed with which the young Duncan reacted to his attacks. Teg continued to create deeper and deeper pain for Duncan, each time making sure Duncan saw his face at the instant of greatest agony. Finally, Duncan called out, Damn you, Leto! Teg knew it was done. Duncan's mind is flooded with new awareness. He even remembers his own death on Arrakis. His gaze remained on Teg. Did I buy Paul enough time to escape? Answer all of his questions truthfully. He escaped. Now came the testing moment. Where had the Tleilaxu acquired the Idaho cells? The Sisterhood's test said they were original, but suspicions remained. The Tleilaxu had done something of their own to this Gola. His memories could be a valuable clue to that thing. But the Harkonnens, Duncan said. His memory from the keep meshed. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> a fierce laugh shook him. He sent a roaring victory shout at the long dead Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. I paid you back, Baron. Oh, I did it to you for all the ones you destroyed. Miles Tag tells Duncan that the Sisterhood has need of him. Lucilla appears and sees that Duncan's memories are awakened. Teg knew that she had intended to imprint the Gola before the awakening of his memories. She threatens Miles Teg, saying that he better not have complicated her task of imprinting. Duncan finally realizes what the imprinting is. The Bene Gesserit intended to use him as a breathing stud, he thought. He would not allow it. Duncan sensed his own violent thoughts towards Lucilla. In his mind's eye, he could see her covered in blood. In that moment, he understood that the Tleilaxu had done something to him. They had altered him in some way. The Tleilaxu have done something to me. Something that has not yet been exposed, Duncan husked. Exactly what we feared. It was Lucilla speaking from the doorway, behind Teg. She advanced within two paces of Duncan. I have been listening. You two are very informative. What have the Tleilaxu done to you? she demanded. Duncan spoke with a flippancy that he did not feel. O oh, great imprinter, if I knew I would tell you. Lucilla knows that Teg has greatly complicated her task, but she was no longer uncomfortable with the imprintation of someone so young. Duncan was no longer a boy, but a man with adult memories. Later she attempts to complete the process, 
but Duncan has made a judgment about the sisterhood now. He rejects her. Lucilla, if you touch me again without my permission, I will try to kill you. I will try so hard that you will very likely have to kill me. She recoiled. He stared into her eyes. I am not some damn stud for you witches. Is that what you think we want of you? Nobody has said what you want of me, but your actions are obvious. He stood poised on the balls of his feet. The unawakened thing within him stirred and sent his pulse racing. Lucilla knows that he is serious. Lucilla is concerned that she may not be able to complete her task given to her by the Mother Superior Terraza. The Bene Gesserit had delivered their standard messages to the Guild, Ix, and the Tleilaxu for their roles in the attack on Rakis. You will be punished. Mother Superior Terraza has decided to meet with the Tleilaxu Master Waf aboard a Guild vessel. Speculating, Terraza tells Waf that he will not be able to deal with her the way he had dealt with the Honored Matres earlier. Terraza claims that the Sisterhood had intercepted the missing Matre ship containing the Face Dancers. It is a lie, but he believes it. He is shocked. In his mind he curses her and all the damnable Bene Gesserit witches. He recognized her power. Waf did not try to delude himself about Terraza. This woman was far more dangerous than any honored Matre. If he killed Terraza, she would be replaced immediately by someone just as dangerous, someone with every essential piece of information possessed by the present Mother Superior. We find your new face dancers very interesting, Terraza said. Waf grimaced involuntarily. Yes, far more dangerous than the honored Matres, who were not yet even blaming the Tleilaxu for the loss of an entire no-ship. Waf wishes that he could do away with Terraza and the entire sisterhood. Sensing potential violence in him, Terraza makes a guess. She claims that she knows about his concealed weapons, and his response demonstrated the truth of her guess. Waf wonders again if telepathy was among the many powers of Bene Gesserit Reverend Mothers. She tells him that in exchange for Bene Gesserit access to their axolotl tanks, the Sisterhood will offer Atreides breeding mothers, though she would never give them true Atreides, only close mimics. Terraza also discerns something critical from analyzing Waf's speech patterns. She realizes that the Tleilaxu Great Belief was based in Zinsunism and Sufism. She knows now that the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood can manipulate the Tleilaxu through use of the Missionara Protectiva. Terraza offers Waf an opportunity to experience the land of his prophet, inviting him to the Bene Gesserit Keep on Rakis. She will use him as bait in her scheme. The significant fact is this. No Bene Tleilax female has ever been seen away from the protection of their core planets. Face dancer mules who simulate females do not count in this analysis. They cannot be breeders. The Tleilaxu sequester their females to keep them from our hands. This is our primary deduction. It must also be in the eggs that the Tleilaxu masters conceal their most essential secrets. Bene Gesserit Analysis, Archive Number XOXTM990014 Back on Rakis, Odraid awaits the arrival of the Tleilaxu Master Waf. She plans to take Shiana along with Waf into the desert when he arrived. Thanks to Taraza's new discovery regarding the roots of the Tleilaxu Great Belief, she knew how to trap the Tleilaxu. They would go deep into the sands beyond watchful eyes, and she would manipulate him by use of the Missionara Protectiva. She would force Waf to have a religious experience. The chance to observe a Tleilaxu master in a religious setting would be invaluable. Once Waf arrives on Rakis, he attempts to spy upon Odraid with the help of High Priest Tuik as they discuss the Holy Child Shiana. Tuik had allowed the Tleilaxu master to listen because he told him he would help get Shiana back. 
Audre tells Tuick that because of the attack, she had sent for Miles Tag to reinforce Rakian planetary defenses. Tuick believes the Bene Gesserit mean to wrestle control of the planet from him. Though Tuick had believed that Audre didn't know about the Tleilaxu listening, she in fact was aware. Audre demands the secret listener, Waff, to be invited to sit with them. Waff was not supposed to bring face dancers to Rakus, but he brought two anyway. Audre did not allow them into the room. Audre noticed that Waff concealed weapons beneath his sleeves. She detected secret motives in Waff and comes to the realization that Waff aimed to substitute a face dancer for High Priest Tuik. My Lord Tuik, Audre said. This Tleilaxu intends to murder us both. Waff attacks, and Odraid breaks both of his arms in two quick motions, but not before one of his darts fires, killing Tuik instantly. Waff had never expected that there would be such speed and power in her attacks. The two face dancers burst into the room, but Waff commands them to leave when Odraid threatens to end him. Rendering him unconscious, she sets his broken arms. She tells him that her sisters have been listening, and that he was now her ally. She uses what she had learned from Taraza about the Tleilaxu Zinsuni beliefs, and manipulates him into agreeing to an alliance, making him feel as though no Tleilaxu plot remains hidden from the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. A monopoly would force the guild to buy more Ixian navigation machines, she said. You would have the guild in the jaws of your crusher. Waff lifted his head to glare at her. The movement sent agony through his broken arms and he groaned. Despite the pain, he studied Odre through almost lidded eyes. Did the witches really believe that was the extent of the Tleilaxu plan? He hardly dared hope the Bene Gesserit were so misled. Of course, that was not your basic plan, Odre said. Waff's eyes snapped wide open. She was reading his mind. I am dishonored, he said. When you saved my life, you saved a useless thing. He sank back. Odraid inhaled a deep breath. Time to use the results of the chapter house analysis. She leaned close to Waff and whispered in his ear. The Shariat needs you yet. Waff gasped. Odraid sat back. That gasp said it all. Analysis confirmed. The Bene Gesserit had always used religion to manipulate and control. The Tleilaxu Master was no different from the rest. The planet Chapter House had been occupied by the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood for 1400 years, and even then they only thought of it as a temporary planet. It was a secret world, but of course there was always the risk of accidental discovery. Terraza, on Chapter House, wonders where Miles Teg and the Gola could be. She had instructed the Bashar to act unpredictably, but she had not expected this. She has already asked the Tleilaxu to prepare a new Gola, just as a precaution in case the current one was dead. Taraza is conscious of the fact that the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood could be swallowed up by the honored Matres. The Matres had not returned out of the scattering because of curiosity, but out of dreams of conquest, and they had begun their conquest. The Bene Gesserit keep on Gamu had been attacked, Shuang Yu had been killed, but not before she left a message to her sisters. Shuang Yu left you a message that only we might read. And the wear marks on the furniture? Yes, Mother Superior, and then she knew she would be attacked and had time to leave a message. I saw your earlier report on the devastation of the attack. It was quick and totally overpowering. The attackers did not try to take captives. What did she say? Whores. The Bene Gesserit referred to the Matres as such for a simple reason. They believed that the Matres made a mockery of the sisterhood, copying them yet selling themselves for power. The Matres did not have mastery of melange. They used an inadequate substance which turned their eyes orange instead of the characteristic blue within blue which marked spice addiction. These Matres gained power through sexual enslavement. They aped some of the Bene Gesserit ways, but possessed none of their deeper awareness, and yet they dared place themselves at the center of worship. 
Taraza clearly understood Shuang Yu's message. The Matres had acted. The ones out of the scattering sought the Bene Gesserit Elder secrets, secrets lost to them during their time away from the old empire. Taraza commands Burzmali, who was trained by Teg, to go to Gamu in search of Miles Teg and the Gola with as many resources as he needs. She suspects that the Gola never left the planet. Back on Rakis, Odraid continues with the plan, though she wonders why the Gola is not yet on the planet. She takes Shiana and Waf to Dar es Balat, the place where Leto's no room had been found. They go into the desert to find a worm. Odraid intends to force Waf into a religious experience and observe him. Shiana begins dancing, summoning Shaitan. Odraid looks into the distance and feels the coming of a vision, a warning. She realizes that she is looking at the place where the One God was divided. The place where Leto II had fallen into the Idaho River 1500 years ago. She wonders if the heretics of the Sisterhood had been correct. What would come out of them meddling in the remnants of the tyrant's work? As the worm approaches, Odraid resigns herself to whatever fate is to come. Waf is overcome with religious exultation. A sibilant hiss subterranean and muted by sand. It became louder with shocking swiftness. There was heat in it, a noticeable warming of the breeze that twisted down their rocky avenue. The hissing swelled to a crescendo roar. Abruptly, the crystal ring gaping of a gigantic mouth lifted over the dune directly above Shiana. Shaitan! Shiana screamed, not breaking the rhythm of her dance. Here I am, Shaitan! As it crested the dune, the worm dipped its mouth downward toward Shiana. Sand cascaded around her feet, forcing her to stop her dance. The smell of cinnamon filled the rocky defile. The worm stopped above them. Messenger of God, Waf breathed. Heat dried the perspiration on Odraid's exposed face and made the automatic insulation of her still suit puff outward, perceptibly. She inhaled deeply, sorting the components behind that cinnamon assault. Daintily, like a child on unfamiliar ground, the worm once more moved forward. It slid across the dune crest, curled itself down onto the exposed rock and presented its burning mouth slightly above and about two paces from Shiana. As it stopped, Odraid became conscious of the deep furnace rumbling of the worm. She could not tear her gaze away from the reflections of lambent orange flames within the creature. It was a cave of mysterious fire. Odraid could see that Shiana commanded the worm, but she could also see that it was not the girl's words that moved the creature but something else. Waf came up beside Odraid, his trance-like gaze fixed on the worm. I am here, he whispered. Odraid silently cursed him. Any unwarranted noise could attract this beast onto them. She knew what Waf was thinking, though. No other Tleilaxu had ever stood this close to a descendant of his prophet. Not even the Rakian priest had ever done this. With her right hand, Shiana made a sudden downward gesture. Down to us, Shaitan, she said. The worm lowered its gaping mouth until the internal fire pit filled the rocky defile in front of them. Her voice little more than a whisper, Shiana said. See how Shaitan obeys me, mother? Odraid could feel Shiana's control over the worm, a pulse of hidden language between the child and monster. It was uncanny. Though Odraid is annoyed by Waf, she knew that never before had one of the Bene Gesserit had an opportunity to study a Tleilaxu master religiously. The insight she was gathering was highly valuable. The three of them mount the worm, and Shaitan moves. Though Shiana had commanded the creature, she had only been allowed to ride a worm once before. The day Shai Halud brought her to the city of Keen years ago. Now the worm moved again of its own accord, towards that place of Odraid's vision. Members of the priesthood and the Bene Gesserit followed behind in thopters. Eventually, the worm did stop, and when they dismounted, it merely returned into the sands the way it had came. 
The immortal hand of the god emperor still moved those creatures in the sand. It had come to this place of its own free will, drawn back toward the place where Leto's endless dream had begun. The three of them end up falling deep into a sand slope. It is only then that Odrade realizes the place. They had fallen into an ancient Fremen water storage basin. They were in siege to Boar, Stilgar's place during the time of Paul Atreides, the place where Leto II had hidden his spice hoard. The place had long since been cleaned out. Odrade believes that she is the one being brought here for a purpose. Using her knowledge of the Missionara Protectiva, she manipulates Waff into staying behind while she explores the place. She gives Shiana instruction to keep an eye on him. Odrade can still sense the warning from her other memories. She finds several desert mummified bodies that had been stabbed to death in what looked like ritual killings. She knew that the bodies could not be from the Fremen times. They were from the Famine times and made her fearful. Odrade could still smell the residue of Melange in the place, and wanted to turn back, but something compelled her forward. She finds a word carved on the floor. Arafel. She knows the meaning. The cloud darkness at the end of the universe. She realizes that the God Emperor had reached out of the past to send her a message. Written in ancient Jacobsa, she finds the word here. It leads her to a trap door. Inside, Odre discovers a great treasure of Melange, 90,000 long tons. It was half a year's harvest on the entire planet of Rakis, geniusly hidden and left there by Leto II for her to find. Written on the walls in the ancient Atreides language were the words of the god emperor. A reverend mother will read my words. Something cold settled in Odrade's guts. She moved to her right with the light plowing through an empire's ransom in Melange. There was more to the message. I bequeath to you my fear and loneliness. To you I give the certainty that the body and soul of the Bene Gesserit will meet the same fate as all other bodies and all other souls. Another paragraph of the message beckoned to the right of this one. She plowed through the clawing melange and stopped to read. What is survival if you do not survive whole? Ask the Bene Tleilax that. What if you no longer hear the music of life? Memories are not enough unless they call you to noble purpose. There was more of it on the narrow end wall of the long chamber. Odrade stumbled through the melange and knelt to read. Why did your sisterhood not build the golden path? You knew the necessity. Your failure condemned me, the god emperor, to millennia of personal despair. The words god emperor were not written in Jacobsa, but in the language of the Islamiyat where they conveyed an explicit second meaning to any speaker of that tongue. Your god and your emperor because you made me so. Odrage smiled grimly. That would drive Waff into a religious frenzy. The higher he went, the easier to shatter his security. She did not doubt the accuracy of the tyrant's accusation, nor the potential in his prediction that the sisterhood could end. The sense of danger had led her to this place unerringly. Something more had been at work, too. The worms of Rakis still moved to the tyrant's ancient beat. He might slumber in his endless stream, but monstrous life, a pearl in each worm to remind it, carried on as the tyrant had predicted. What was it he had told the sisterhood in his own time? She recalled his words. When I am gone, they must call me Shaitan. Emperor of Gehenna, the wheel must turn and turn along the golden path. Yes, that was what Taraza had meant. But don't you see? The common people of Rakis have been calling him Shaitan for more than a thousand years. So Taraza had known this thing. Without ever seeing these words, she had known. I see your design, Taraza. 
and I know the burden of fear you have carried all these years. I can feel it every bit as deeply as you do. Odraid knew then that this warning sense would not leave until she ended, or the sisterhood vanished from existence, or the peril was resolved. Odraid lifted her light, got to her feet, and slogged through the melange to the wide steps out of this place. At the steps she recoiled. More of the tyrant's words had been cut into each riser. Trembling, she read them as she moved upward to the opening. My words are your past. My questions are simple. With whom do you ally? With the self-idolaters of Tleilax? With my fish bureaucracy? With the Cosmos Wandering Guild? With the Harkonnen blood sacrifices? With a dogmatic sink of your own creation? How will you meet your end? As no more than a secret society? Odraid climbed past the questions, reading them a second time as she went. Noble purpose. What a fragile thing that always was, and how easily distorted. But the power was there immersed in constant peril. It was all spelled out on the walls and stairs of that chamber. Taraza knew without having it explained. The tyrant's meaning was clear. Join me. As she emerged into the small room finding a narrow ledge along which she could swing herself to the door, Odraid looked down at the treasure she had found. She shook her head in wonder at Taraza's wisdom. So that was how the sisterhood might end. Taraza's design was clear. All the pieces in place. Nothing certain. Wealth and power. It was all the same in the end. The noble design had been started, and it must be completed. Even if that meant the death of the sisterhood. What poor tools we have chosen. That girl waiting back there in the deep chamber below the desert. That girl and the gola being prepared on Rakis. I speak your language now, old worm. It has no words, but I know the heart of it. Odraid saw Leto's message as a warning and an invitation. The sisterhood may end. She wonders at the purpose of the Bene Gesserit. Was survival a sufficient enough purpose? Odraid knows that she must act on her own. They travel to the Bene Gesserit sanctuary on Rakis, and Odraid reveals secret knowledge to Woth. The sisterhood planned to plant the worms of Rakis on countless planets of the scattering. He thought it was a lie and she had intended him to, though it was true. He asked for the real reason for dissension among the Bene Gesserit ranks, and she tells him that some fear that they may birth another Kwisatz Haderach. Odraid manages to refocus Waf's doubts about the Sisterhood onto the people of the Scattering. She manipulates him into agreeing to alliance, one she knows that many in the Sisterhood will not like. Our survival in the face of the storm that is brewing among the scattered ones, she said. The Tleilaxu survival too. The farthest thing from our desires is an end to those who preserve the great belief. Waf felt a tight band release itself from his breast. The unexpected, the unthinkable, the unbelievable was true. The Bene Gesserit were not Pawinda. All the universe would yet follow the Bene Tleilax into the true faith. God would not permit otherwise, especially not here on the planet of the Prophet. The effectiveness of the Bene Gesserit Missionara Protectiva had proven itself again. Back on Gamu, Miles Teg has made contact with Bursmali. They have arranged a rendezvous. It is snowing when they finally leave the No Globe, heavily armed. Lucilla carried only a single laser gun with one burst. The Bene Gesserit believed that it diminished them to go into battle with much more than their skills. Now that they were outside of the No Globe, they could be detected by life scanners. They could hear the sounds of battle in the distance. The ground rumbled. They could hear shouting and voices in the distance. Tag recognized face dancers. He tells Lucilla and Duncan to run. The attackers advanced on him. 
He fired at them, but they did not fire back. He realized that they wanted him alive. The Tleilak Su could expend any number of face dancers to run down his laser gun's charge. He attempts to run, but he is stunned and captured. Lucilla and Duncan make it to an armored ground car. Brismali leads them out of the car and puts a life blanket on them to hide them from detection. They are led by Brismali's men through the wilderness through a cleft and into an enclosed passage cut into the rocks. Thick algae grew on the ceiling and the walls of the place. It was specially grown algae that disrupted life scanners. The face dancer Sorifa tells Lucilla that she was bred and trained to kill the Matres. Lucilla trades places with the face dancer to throw off the searchers. She will disguise herself as an honored Matre. Duncan is disguised as a Tleilaxu, and the two of them split up, taking different paths. When Miles Tag wakes, he encounters three strange figures. They put a device known as a tea probe on his head, a device from the scattering. The pain it caused him was exquisite as they attempted to penetrate his mind. He wonders if there is a greater pain. He wonders if this is what the spice agony feels like for reverend mothers. The captors continue to increase the pain even more, and then suddenly, stillness. Miles Tegg wonders if he is dead, but he is not. The device takes over his flesh, and he feels as though another person is sharing his body. It was reading his senses, trying to block his awareness. It was copying him. Tegg attempts to counter the probe using his Mintat powers, blocking it from copying his memories, but it would have everything else. Tegg centered his focus on the movements of the probe. He found that he could anticipate it now, as if he was growing some new muscle. His captors wonder why they cannot read his mind, and then he forces his eyes open. From his perspective, the three are moving in ultra-slow motion. In the time of several eye blinks, Tag escapes from confinement, killing his captors with supreme bloody ease. He had predicted their every move. Using his Mintat abilities, Tag determines that the agony of the probe had lifted him to some new level of ability. Hidden powers that had been awaiting within him had been unlocked out of necessity taking the form of this strange new kind of prescience. Slowly, he felt himself return to a normal sense of time. He escaped to the outside. He knew the place. He was in the city of Yasai. He was free. On the Bene Gesserit Secret Planet Chapter House, some sisters are calling for Odraid's death after what she did on Rakis. The Bene Gesserit were still wary of the Atreides' flaws, they did not fully trust their hunger for power, which was evident by their history. The heretics of the Sisterhood believed that the Sisterhood was playing directly into the hands of the Tleilaxu, who made this Duncan Gola for their own purposes. They believed that they will be forced to serve the Tleilaxu design, which would be worse than the time of the tyrant. They would be vulnerable, and perhaps even further, considering Leto's message, perhaps the Gola project had never been truly theirs from the start, but instead something that was set in motion by Leto II himself. Leto's message in Siege to Boor worries Teraza. She wonders if the Sisterhood is to end now, crushed by invaders from the scattering. Teraza decides that she must go to Rakis, and she may have to do what the others want, kill Odraid. On Gamu, Teg went to appear before an honored Matre as the Bene Gesserit Bashar. He knew there was danger in the place. Teg deduces that the place is a bank. The honored Matre that he met was old. Teg had not expected her age. She tells him that if he ever sees her eyes fully orange, then that means that he has offended her beyond her ability to tolerate. She tells Teg the Bene Gesserit are no match for the Matres. I'm sure you understand this kind of power generally, Bashar, she said. The Bene Gesserit trained you well. They are quite talented, but not, I fear, as talented as we are. The old Matre summons the Matre who is meant to mark Teg. Teg sensed the danger. He determines that he must use his new talents. Teg becomes the whirlwind. He was a monstrous threat. He made his way through the complex as a blurred sweep, 
slaughtering everyone he met as blood sloshed around him. Doing so required minimal mental effort. Blood splattered him as he drove himself through the headquarters building, slaughtering everyone he met. As he had learned from the Bene Gesserit teachers, the great problem of the human universe lay in how you managed procreation. He could hear the voice of his first teacher as he carried destruction through the building. You may think of this only as sexuality, but we prefer the more basic term, procreation. It has many facets and offshoots. It has apparently unlimited energy. The emotion called love is only one small aspect. Teg crushed the throat of a man standing rigidly in his path, and at last found the control room for the building's defenses. Teg knows that this transformation had something to do with his Atreides' blood. As he ran toward an alley, the people he passed seemed as still as statues. He examined himself and could see that his blood was black. That moment of ultimate pain and crisis had forced him into a new domain of human potential, the God Emperor's design. He now possessed a double vision, a strange prescience. Tag realized that he could also sense the positions of no ships and decides that he will capture one. His double vision provided him with the path. Lucilla and Bursmali head to the safe place to rendezvous with Duncan. There they encounter a young woman, and Lucilla immediately knows that something is off about her. The woman, named Mirbella, is an honored matre. She attempts to kill Bursmali after he tries to slap her, and she assumed that Lucilla is a great honored matre because of her clothing and because of the ease in which Lucilla subdues her. Mirbella tells Lucilla that she has subdued Duncan and that she intends to complete the sexual enslavement of him. During the process, however, Duncan gains access to the memories of all the other Duncan Idahos. He is crushed by the memories. He can see his deaths, all of them. He remembers the axolotl tanks, the gross, living female flesh, the Tleilaxu design, the hidden thing in him awakens, the secret to destroying the Matres. He overwhelms Mirbella, forcing her to lose control of her own responses. Mirbella realizes who Duncan is. The Matres were warned of a Gola possessing of forbidden knowledge gifted by the Tleilaxu. She wanted to kill him, but she could not. Lucilla had watched from another room. When she comes in, Mirbella begs her to kill Duncan, but Lucilla says that Duncan will go to Rackus. On Rackus, Taraza tells Audrey that the preservation of the sisterhood is the only important thing. Audrey tells Taraza that the Tleilaxu give the appearance of full cooperation, but something is disturbing her. She wonders if their axolotl tanks are truly tanks. She suggests to Taraza that they could be surrogates, living organisms, the remnants of the Tleilaxu females. No one had ever seen a Tleilaxu female. It was monstrous. Audrey tells the Mother Superior what she has learned of the Matres from the Tleilaxu. They had surpassed the sexual skills of Bene Gesserit imprinters such as Lucilla, but the honored Matres employ their skills in a manner that is ultimately fatal to themselves and others. Audrey suggests that the change that the Tleilaxu had made to the Duncan Idaho Gola was to make him the equivalent of a male honored Matre. That's why the honored Matres attacked their keep on Gamu believing the Gola was there. Taraza realized that they did not know what this Gola was, and now that he had been reawakened, he was unpredictable. The sequencing of the Gola's education became shambles even before the escape from the Gamu Keep. He leaped ahead of his teachers to grasp things that were only implied, and he did this at an alarmingly accelerated rate. Who knows what he has become by now? The Tleilaxu meddled with the forces that had produced their Kwisatz Haderach and led to 3,500 years of subjugation under the tyrant. After meeting Shiana, Taraza determines that Shiana will be loyal in exchange for Bene Gesserit teachings. Taraza had been intrigued by the young girl, and Shiana recognized the power of the Mother Superior. I am informed that you may become one of us, Taraza said. Both women could see the effect of this on the girl. 
By now, Shiana was more fully aware of a Reverend Mother's accomplishments. The powerful beam of truth had been focused on her. She had begun to grasp at the enormous body of knowledge the sisterhood had accumulated over the millennia. She had been told about selective memory transmission, about the workings of other memories, about the spice agony. And here before her stood the most powerful of all Reverend Mothers, one from whom nothing was hidden. Taraza and Odrade believed that one day Shiana could become a Mother Superior of extraordinary ability. Taraza, Odrade, and Shiana, and the Bene Gesserit Company, along with Waf and the High Priest Tuik, who had been replaced by a face dancer after he was killed, convened at Dar es Balat. It is a tense gathering. Taraza sensed a danger of violence. In the meeting, it appears that the false Tuik had convinced himself that he is actually Tuik. Waf is surprised by this and cannot control him. Never before had he seen a face dancer behave in this way. It was the Bene Gesserit plot. This false Tuik was now a creature of the Sisterhood and remembered nothing of his face dancer origins. The Tleilaks who had designed these new face dancers too well, one could only imagine what was happening with the face dancers the Tleilaks who had implanted among the fish speakers and the Ixians. Waf was greatly intimidated by Taraza. Taraza tells Waf that they will serve the Tleilaxu, but they will never become axolotl tanks. Waf was shocked. Sisterhood knew even the secret of the Tleilaxu axolotl tanks. Waf attempted to signal his face dancers to attack, but Taraza stops him, assuring him that the Tleilaxu will fall if he does not agree. Waf ground his teeth. What was she doing? He entertained the mad thought that the Sisterhood had clogged his mind with some secret drug in the air. They knew things denied to others. He stared from Taraza to Odrade and back to Taraza. He knew he was old with serial Gola resurrections, but not old in the way of the Bene Gesserit. These people were old. They seldom looked old, but they were old. Old beyond anything he dared imagine. Waf has no choice but to accept. Odre tells Shiana that the Honored Matres will come to Rakis. They had returned from the scattering because they see the old empire as an easy conquest. At the penthouse at Daris Balat, the Honored Matres attack. Taraza sees the beam from the Thopter and recognizes that her own death is imminent. The beam severs both of her legs but she manages to cut off the blood flow from her wounds. She reminds herself that the pain was not as great as the spice agony. She thinks to herself, I have won. Odraid comes to Taraza as she lies dying. Placing their foreheads together, they share memories. Odraid is now the mother superior. Odraid and Shiana head towards the No Room. Sometime later, Teg's stolen No Ship arrives on Rakis. He has arranged to meet Shiana and Odrade in the desert. They will arrive upon the back of a worm. Teg meets with Lucilla aboard the No Ship and tells her that they are there to pick up Odrade, Shiana, and a worm. He tells her that he and his people will remain to create a diversion. He knew that the Honored Matres would destroy Rakis when they learned that the Gola, the secret to their demise, was there. It had been Taraza's design all along. The Gola had been bait. When Odrade boards the No Ship, she comes to Teg. For quite some time now, she had known that he was her father. Looking at him now, she could see that something had been changed about him. Something was different. He tells her to take the ship to Chapter House, and that the Gola must go with them too. They had to change Taraza's original design. He was no longer just bait for the destruction of the planet. They needed his talents. Teg tells Brismali that he will take over as Bashar. Odraid, Shiana, Duncan, Brismali, Lucilla, and a single worm escape the destruction of the planet Rakis. The honored Matre Mirbella is held prisoner. Waf and his face dancers die on the planet of the Prophet. Teg had sacrificed himself so that the others could escape. The Honored Matres unleashed, 
their obliterator weapons, scorching the surface of the planet Doom, killing all life on the surface. The planet of Muad'Dib, home of the Zin Sunni Wanderers, where the God Emperor had ruled from for 4,000 years, was gone. On Chapter House, Odraid adjusts to Taraza's memories. She knew some in the Sisterhood would not like that she was the Mother Superior. Many in the Sisterhood still distrusted the Atreides. Their history had shown a hunger for power. She knew her position may be temporary. The Sisterhood had tested Shiana. She too was Atreides, descended from Siona and immune from prescience. The worm they had captured was nearing metamorphosis, and when the time came, they would bathe it in a mixture of melange and water, converting it into many sand trout. They would release them onto Chapter House. They would create a second dune. Terraza had wanted the destruction of Rakis to eliminate almost all worms. According to her, they were an oracular force which held the universe in bondage. The worms containing a pearl of Leto's awareness magnified that grasp. He did not predict events, but instead he had created them. By the time the worms returned to their larger numbers, humankind would be far too numerous, doing too many different things. No single force could rule over all of their futures completely. But this was always his design. Mirbella and the Gola are being held inside of the No Ship. Mirbella is pregnant with Duncan's child. Duncan still insists that he will not serve the Sisterhood, telling Odre that he will never be a stud for them. Duncan had realized some time ago that he had never fully trusted the witches, not even the Lady Jessica. Odraid promises to help Duncan in any ways that she can. When he asked why, she responds by saying this, Because my ancestors loved you. Because my father loved you. Love. You witches can't feel love. She stared down at him for almost a minute. The bleached hair was growing out dark at the roots and curling once more into ringlets, especially at his neck, she saw. I feel what I feel, she said, and your water is ours, Duncan Idaho. Seeing the effect that these ancient Fremen words had had on Duncan, Odray turns and leaves the room. She looks upon the worm they had captured, the last pearl of Leto's awareness. They had freed him. Shiana would be trained as a Bene Gesserit sister and eventually lead the project to breed new worms on Chapter House. Leto II, the God Emperor, the Tyrant, had helped the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood find their noble purpose. 10,000 years since Leto began his metamorphosis from human into the sandworm of Rakis, and historians still argue over his motives. Was he driven by the desire for long life? He lived more than ten times the normal span of three hundred standard years. But consider the price he paid. Was it the lure of power? He is called the tyrant for good reason. But what did power bring him that a human might want? Was he driven to save humankind from itself? We have only his words about his golden path to answer this, and I cannot accept the self-serving records of Dar es Balat. Might there have been other gratifications which only his experiences would illuminate? Without better evidence, the question is moot. We are reduced to saying only that he did it. The physical fact alone is undeniable. Next in this series, we will cover Chapter House Dune, the final book in Frank Herbert's original Dune saga. Chapter House picks up several years after the events of Heretics, as the Sisterhood awaits for young worms to rise out of the newly formed deserts of Chapter House. Duncan Idaho has visions of a mysterious man and woman who watch him from some other place. 
Consider supporting this channel on Patreon if you enjoyed the video, and please subscribe for more Dune videos, and check out the Dune playlists on this channel for more videos on the lore of the book series. Those who would repeat the past must control the teaching of history, Bene Gesserit Coda. Throughout the corners of the old empire, the Spider Queen's web runs. Great Honored Matre Dama seems hell-bent on the destruction of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. Many of the Sisterhood's planets have been discovered, the remnants of the Sisterhood on those worlds scratched out, burned away, the surfaces scorched by the Honored Matre Obliterator weapons. Millions of those under the protection of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood had already fallen to the wrath of the Honored Matres. But the Spider Queen was still searching. She knew that it mattered not how many arms of the Sisterhood she cut off if she could not find their center. The dwelling place of Mother Superior, Darwi Odraid. A secret world which the Bene Gesserit called Chapter House. It has been some time since the destruction of Rakis. What Miles Tag did, not on Rakis, but before on Gamu is what had set the rage of those terrible Honored Matres upon them. Something had been awakened in the Atreides' bloodline. It had been latent prior to the Honored Matre probe, which had acted akin to a spice agony. The pain of the probe, and the intense physical and psychological need for survival, combined with the Atreides' genes, which, for countless generations, had been tampered with by the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, and by the god Emperor Leto II, opened the doorway for abilities beforehand not seen. There are stories out of Gamu, Duncan. He stared at her. Gamu. He could never think of it by any name other than the original, Gidi Prime, Harkonnen Hellhole. She took his silence as an invitation to continue. They say Teg moved faster than the eye could see. That he probably started those stories himself. Some sisters don't discount them. Part 1. Odraid and the Axe Wielder In the opening of Chapter House, the very first Gola of the Bene Gesserit Axolotl tanks is born, Miles Teg. Odraid hopes to once again put Teg's brilliant military mind to use, and perhaps discover what strange powers had been awakened in her father, whose Gola, in a strange twist of destiny, would now call her mother, as she raised him there, on the world of Chapter House. The planet Chapter House was itself changing. A single worm had been brought to this world from Rakis the only worm in known existence. It had been forced back into its sand trout form and released on Chapter House. The planet was slowly being terraformed to accommodate the coming of more great worms and the desert continued to grow. Chapter House would eventually be a mirror of what Dune had once been. By this time, he had already begun learning about the giant sandworm the Sisterhood had spirited from Rakis. Death of that worm had produced creatures called sand trout Sand trout were why the desert grew. If they could manage to produce sandworms, this would be the Sisterhood's only steady supply of spice, unless they could find a way to get the secret of spice production within Axolotl tanks from Cytel. The deadly seriousness of the Sisterhood's predicament was not lost on Odraid. The Honored Matres drastically outnumbered the Bene Gesserit. They had been expanded exponentially by their venturing out into the scattering, and they were ruthless. Odraid knew it was only a matter of time before they located the hidden location of the planet Chapter House. She also knew that if the Honored Matres did eventually discover the location of the planet and attempt to invade, they would collect nothing of use from Chapter House. Odraid's plan, if such events occurred, was to release as many Bene Gesserit cells as possible into the scattering, carrying with them millennia of Bene Gesserit teachings and traditions along with a store of sand trout. 
Eventually, the different selves of the Sisterhood, now themselves scattered, could perhaps produce countless dunes out there in the infinite universe. The temporary homeworld chapter house, the Bene Gesserit would annihilate themselves. The honored Matres would find no more than charred ruins on chapter house. The Sisterhood could never risk its deepest teachings falling into their hands. Odraid was of course descended from Paul Atreides, whose bloodline had been tampered with by the Sisterhood for generations, finally before it culminated in him, the Kwisad Tadarak. His son, Leto II, would eventually become the Worm God Emperor of the Imperium, subjecting the universe to 3,500 years of authoritarian rule. When his tyranny was broken, the Sisterhood continued to make use of the Atreides genes, though they were wary of any form of prescience. There had been attempts made to erase prescience from Atreides genes entirely, however the success in this had been limited. Odraid's Atreides blood gave her the gift of limited prescience, and she only used it with great caution. She knew that what she did in the coming months would determine either the survival or the destruction of the Bene Gesserit. In the last novel in the series, Heretics of Dune, Odraid received a message from the God Emperor, a message left behind in the past only to be revealed to her at that specific moment. Odraid believes that she understands the message that the God Emperor left for her at Siege Tiber on Arrakis. All things die, but the Bene Gesserit could not die before the completion of its purpose. The same ominous vision had repeatedly come to her in her dreams. She walked across a chasm on a tight rope, and someone, she dared not turn to see who, was coming from behind with an axe to cut the rope. She could feel the rough twist of fiber beneath bare feet. She felt a cold wind blowing, a smell of burning on that wind, and she knew the one with the axe approached. Each perilous step required all of her energy. Step, step. The rope swayed and stretched, her arms out straight on each side, struggling for balance. If I fall, the sisterhood falls. The Bene Gesserit would end in the chasm beneath the rope. As with any living thing, the sisterhood must end sometime. A reverend mother dare not deny it. But not here, not falling, the rope severed. We must not let the rope be cut. I must get across the chasm before the axe wielder comes. The rope she walked was destiny. She was the sisterhood, and behind her approached the mystery adversaries, who or whatever they might be, intending to cut the rope, ending the sisterhood forever. At this point in time, something in her prescience seems to warn her. It was an ache she could not touch. It appeared to her in the form of Sea Child, an echo of her childhood self. When Odraid was young, before the reverend mothers of the Bene Gesserit had such sway over her life, she had gone on sea excursions with the man and woman she had called Mama and Papa. Those were some of her happiest times, when she felt the most connected to her essential self. Adrift amongst the gentle waves, she found a place of stillness. Lift and fall of ways, the sense of unbounded horizons with strange new places just beyond the curved limits of a watery world, that thrilling edge of danger implicit in the very substance that supported her. By allowing her mind to drift back into that place, Odraid can connect with her basic self. It gave her the ability to maintain her selfhood when confronted with unexpected waves. At this crucial time in Bene Gesserit history, her mind in the form of Sea Child drifted to Lampadis. Lampadis was one of the most valued planets in the Sisterhood's network of worlds. It was probably second only to Chapter House. The largest chunk of the Bene Gesserit military force, led by Bersmali, the protege of Miles Teg, protected the world. Lampadis also contained the Sisterhood's most prized school, where the best of them were trained in the Bene Gesserit way. The Sisterhood's most premier students resided on the world. The Library of Lampadus was said to be unmatched, a storehouse of knowledge likely dating back thousands of years. The Reverend Mother Lucilla, also an Atreides descendant and cousin to Odraid, now held the position of Vice-Chancellor of Lampadus. Because of Odraid's minimal prophetic ability, she could not determine the specifics of the threats to the Sisterhood by prescience alone. 
But before she has time to act on any of it, the bloody waters of her sea child vision come to reality before her eyes. Lampetus is attacked by the honored Matres. Odraid felt her chest tighten as she saw the look in Belle's eyes. The Redulian records went slap as Belanda threw them on the table. Lampetus, Belanda said. There was agony in her voice. Odraid had no need to open the roll. Sea Child's bloody waters had come to reality. Survivors? Her voice sounded strained. None. Belanda slumped into the chair dog she kept on the side of Odraid's table. Tamerlane entered then and sat behind Belanda. Both looked stricken. No survivors. Lampetus had been fully destroyed in the attack by the honored Matres. The rabbi, a spy of the Bene Gesserit, from a mysterious secret society residing on the world Gamu, had informed them of what happened. The axe wielder, Odraid knew, was now closer than ever before. Part 2 Lucilla and the Secret Sect Odraid, before sending her cousin Lucilla to Lampetus, had commanded that if ever so a time came where Lampetus was in danger, she was to collect as many of the sisters as she could, store them within her other memory by their process of sharing, and escape with the precious lives and knowledge of Lampetus stored within her mind. Odraid informed Lucilla of the mysterious people who could help once she escaped the world. That secret society on Gamu, they're Jews, aren't they? You may have need of special information because of where we are about to post you. Extremely casual. Lucilla sank into Belanda's chair dog without invitation. Odray picked up a stylus, scribbled on a sheet of disposable, and passed it to Lucilla in a way that hid it from the calm eyes. Lucilla took the hint and bent over the message, holding it close beneath the shield of her head. Your surmise is correct. You must die before revealing it. That is the price of their cooperation, a mark of great trust. Lucilla shredded the message. Odray used eye and palm identification to unseal a panel on the wall behind her. She removed a small Redulian crystal and handed it to Lucilla. It was warm, but Lucilla felt a chill. What could be so secret? Odraid swung the security hood from beneath her work table and pivoted it into position. Lucilla dropped the crystal into its receptacle with a trembling hand and pulled the hood over her head. Immediately words formed in her mind, an oral sense of extremely old accents clipped for recognition. The people to whom your attention has been called are the Jews. They made a defensive decision eons ago. The solution to recurrent pogroms was to vanish from public view. Space travel made this not only possible, but attractive. They hid on countless planets, their own scattering, and they probably have planets where only their people live. This does not mean they have abandoned old age practices, in which they excelled out of survival necessity. The old religion is sure to persist, even though somewhat altered. It is probable that a rabbi from ancient times would not find himself out of place behind the Sabbath menorah of a Jewish household in your age. But their secrecy is such that you could work a lifetime beside a Jew and never suspect. They call it complete cover, although they know it's dangerous. Lucilla had succeeded in following Odraid's orders. Before the world of Lampadus had been destroyed, Lucilla fled, with the memories of the lost sisters stored within her mind. She sought refuge on Gamu once called Yidi Prime. She knew that it was there that the secret sect of Jews hid. Because they kept their old traditions, they would be at least somewhat susceptible to the Bene Gesserit techniques involving manipulation through religion. Lucilla speaks with the rabbi on Gamu. The knowledge that she carries within her mind is valuable and must return safely to the sisterhood. The rabbi knows that he owes a debt to the Bene Gesserit. The sisterhood had helped them in many times of need but he informs Lucilla that he does not think that there is any way that she can get off Gamu. Gamu at this point in time was under the rule of the honored Matres. Escaping this world and avoiding capture would be near impossible. But he also knows that the most valuable thing is not in fact her life, but the information that she carries. And he has a way at least to preserve that. Initially, Lucilla insists that he does not understand thinking that he must believe that her information was on crystals and not stored within her mind, but he understands far more than she realizes. He then reveals a secret, a secret that the Jews have never revealed to the Bene Gesserit. From behind the only door in the room, in stepped a woman named Rebecca. Her eyes were blue within blue. 
a wild reverend mother. Lucilla knew that through her, the wisdom of Lampadis could be saved. As the Fremen of ancient Arrakis had done, so had this sect. Some cultures, like the Fremen of old Arrakis, had the ability to sometimes spontaneously produce women with some of the abilities of the Bene Gesserit, but without official training. Lucilla agrees to share memories with Rebecca, in the Bene Gesserit way. They leaned toward each other, until their foreheads made contact. Their hands went out and gripped the offered shoulders. As their minds locked, Lucilla forced a projective thought. This must get to my sisters. I promise, dear lady. Lucilla knew that her chances of living much longer beyond this point were slim, but she was willing to die if she could aid in the survival of the sisterhood. Part 3. The Golas and the No-Ship Since the destruction of the planet Rakis, the Honored Matres have all but eviscerated the Tleilaxu race. Saitel, the captive of the Bene Gesserit, is the only known Tleilaxu master to remain in existence. He, as all Tleilaxu masters had been, was merely a single Gola in a line of Golas stretching back eons. In exchange for the protection of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, Saitel gave them the knowledge of how to produce Golas from axolotl tanks. And though the process which involved the use of living female flesh disgusted them, it was a necessity of the trying times. A gola is, of course, an exact copy of a person made from the cells collected from their body after death. A gola could eventually regain the memories of the original person up until their time of death. The Bene Gesserit had made use of golas in the past, but for the first time ever, now had the secret to gola production themselves, without fear of Tleilaxu tampering. The pragmatic ability to accept things which disgust them in order to achieve an ultimate goal is one of the key reasons that the Sisterhood has survived up until this point. On Chapter House, years go by, and the days blur together as the ecological transformation of the world continues. The artificially controlled weather of the planet had to be controlled carefully in order to not upset the balance dramatically. Miles Tag continued to grow, and already began to show signs that he still possessed the mine which had made the previous Miles Tag possibly the greatest Bashar in Bene Gesserit history. Odraid intended to have his memories reawakened eventually. That way they could continue to use his abilities. By the looks of things, they may have to awaken the Gola sooner than planned. Technically, Teg was not a Gola, but a clone. A Gola was made from the cells of a person specifically after they had already died. Odraid herself had collected the cells from her father while he still lived by using fingernail scraping. The now young boy version of Teg was precious to her. You are a special child, Odraid said. We made you from cells taken from a very old man. Odraid owed the existence of the young Teg to the Tleilaxu master Saitel, who resided within the ground at Noship, which had brought the last great worm to Chapter House. Saitel had given the Sisterhood the information which allowed them to create their own axolotl tanks. He was essentially a prisoner on the ship, and still despised the Pawinda witches. It was his belief that the dark side of the magical universe belonged to the Bene Gesserit. Within his body, he held a secret device which contained information to make several golas. Both Paul and Chani were there, and a new kind of face dancer, said to be better than any before. Face dancers which could truly become another and not be detected even by a Bene Gesserit. Duncan Idaho is also a prisoner on the No Ship, along with Mirbella, the former honored Matre. Mirbella had grown much more loyal to the Sisterhood, and was on her way to becoming a Reverend Mother. The inhabitants of the No Ship were under constant surveillance. If escape was ever attempted, the No Ship had been rigged with mines by the Reverend Mother Belanda. The Sisterhood could prevent any living thing from leaving the No Ship, no matter how fast. The ship had been deactivated and was now grounded. Mirbella and Duncan now had several children together. They had bound each other by way of mutual sexual dependency. Duncan had also trained other Bene Gesserit males in the same techniques to reverse Honored Matre's sexual enslavement. The Sisterhood had originally intended to use Duncan to control Shiana by bonding, but now intended to study his children with Mirbella. The Sisterhood had long known that the Tleilaxu had done something to this particular Duncan Idaho Gola, 
Many in the Sisterhood feared that he may be another Kwisatz Haderach. Duncan himself was beginning to understand something of what he was, though he did not know how they had done it. Perhaps the Tleilaxu had hidden it within a secret gene. This Duncan had more than the memories of the original Dune Duncan. He possessed the memories of countless Duncan Idahos. He knew that the God Emperor Leto II had killed him more times than he could count. His other lives had often spoke out to him, coming up from the void to warn or suggest. Within the no-ship, in the chamber where they had first brought the worm from Rakis, it still smelled of spice. Many times when he entered this place, it would trigger a vision. He would see what appeared to him as a kind of net, shimmering, beyond the net would be a man and woman, who would always notice him. They would speak of danger, and that would always snap him from the vision. Eventually Duncan realized that they looked like face dancers, who had been the servants of the Tleilaxu for many eons. But Duncan could also tell just by looking, that the pair he saw here belonged to no one but themselves. No one truly understood the Holtzman effect. They used his formula because it worked. It folded space from point A to point B. Not even guild navigators claimed to know the reason why. Duncan Idaho was a Mintat, a gift from one of his other lives, and the accumulation of enough data ultimately led him to an involuntary Mintat projection. Someone out there has found another way to use Holtzman's theories. It was a full Mintat projection. His Mintat powers lead him to believe that these honored Matres did not simply come back into the old empire by choice. They fled something. They fled the ones he saw in his vision, the ones who saw him back. Who were those people he saw, strong enough to drive out honored Matres? He knew it for a projection datum. He then realized part of Odred's plan, to send cells of the Bene Gesserit out into the scattering. He saw nothing but failure in the plan. Of all the sisters that had gone into the scattering, not one had returned. Only the Matres. How could they expect otherwise? Something changes fundamentally out there in space. Existing outside of the bounds of the old empire forces change, forces adaptation. The divided cells of the Bene Gesserit Odrade sent out would cease to be truly Bene Gesserit the moment they go off into the new scattering, just as they did before. Duncan intends to escape the no ship, but not in the way the Sisterhood expects. But first, he will allow Odrade to use him. Part 4 Shiana, the Heretic. Shiana, who had been born on Rakis, was thought to be dead by most of the human universe. As a girl on Rakis, the planet once known as Dune, Shiana discovered that she had the ability to control the desert worms. She was the Sand Rider, said to have been predicted by Leto II himself. Because of her powers, the priesthood on Arrakis had worshipped and watched over her, believing her to be the daughter of the divided god. It is not clear why the pearls of Leto II's awareness that resided in the sandworms of Rakis in the era following his death responded in the way they did to Shiana. But whatever the reason, the Bene Gesserit knew that this girl was important. They watched over her carefully for years before finally making her one of them. Now she resided on Chapter House, and even in death, she was still worshipped as a goddess by a countless number of humans. Shiana led the Desert Watch program, watching the new deserts of Chapter House for signs of spice blows, which would indicate the arrival of new worms. If Shiana retained the ability to control these sandworms, as she had the ones on Rakis, then the eventual process of spice collection would become less hazardous. But there was also the distinct possibility that the worms would never develop. It had been tried many times before to create another dune. None of those previous attempts by others in the Imperium had ever succeeded. The worms simply would not take to the new worlds. Perhaps Shiana's presence here could make a difference, but there was no guarantee. Shiana was now a full Reverend Mother of the Bene Gesserit, but she, like many Reverend Mothers who had come before her, was a heretic. She was Bene Gesserit, and yet she defied them. The Sisterhood's Missionara Protectiva was always at work, 
and they had plans for Shiana. Once the worms returned, they would release Shiana unto the unsuspecting universe. She would become a myth made real, as Paul Atreides had once been. They intended to create a new religion surrounding her, to make her a living goddess, and they intended to do so using Duncan Idaho's help as a Mentat. The Bene Gesserit had always used religion as a method of control, and they knew that the Honored Matres too paid lip service to the worship of the God Emperor in his variant name of Guldur. This would at least, in some way, also influence them. Shiana, however, desired none of this, and intended to escape them. The Sisterhood did not suspect it, but she knew the way to disarm Belanda's mines aboard Duncan's no-ship, as well as the way to reactivate the ship itself. The other sisters also did not realize that she and Duncan had begun to form a secret bond, sharing in their descent for the Sisterhood. Shiana knew that she would be forced to test that antique thing to its limits, probably breaking it, and that Black Pla's form seeking outlet from the wild place within her was the only element of this that she knew she had to do. Call it rebellion. Call it by any other name. The force she felt in her breast could not be denied. Shiana was determined to be independent of the Bene Gesserit, to be free to shape her own future as she saw fit. Every ounce of her being resisted conformity. Part 5. The Honored Matres the Honored Matres possessed little of the Bene Gesserit skills of emotional control. In fact, they were prone to fits of blind rage, which in part could be contributed to the spice substitute they became accustomed to within the scattering. The substance provided them with some, but not all of the benefits of spice, and also gave their eyes an eerie orange glow. Outwardly, the Honored Matres feigned superiority to the Bene Gesserit, but the Bene Gesserit could see that something in the Honored Matres felt regret for the ways they had lost while in the scattering. The Honored Matres also did not possess the precise control of internal chemistry that was key to many of the Bene Gesserit abilities, such as the ability to resist poison and disease, the ability to slow aging, and the ability to unlock ancestral memories. The Honored Matres had, of course, been the remnants of Leto II's fish speakers as well as some of the Bene Gesserit sisters who had disappeared into the scattering 1500 years ago. Likely a necessity of survival outside the bounds of the old empire. Still, something had drawn them back into this domain. That too was an indication that they were not as powerful as they would hope to appear. Lucilla is eventually captured by the Honored Matres and brought to the world of Junction, a world in the Gamu system. They brought her before the great honored Matre, Dama, the Spider Queen herself. They wheeled her into the honored Matre's presence in a tube-like cave, deadly sharp sugar wire netting preventing her from leaving the center of the tube. The great honored Matre tells Lucilla that the cage is in fact for her own protection, for the honored Matres were conditioned to kill instantly if the Bene Gesserit power of voice is tried on them. Behind the great honored Matre sat a cage containing another being, almost human, but not quite, a futar. Futars were cat-like humanoid creatures, born out of the scattering. Initially, they had been created as a weapon against the honored Matres by the ones of many faces, who the honored Matres had apparently warred with in the scattering. The cry of a futar could be deadly to an honored Matre. Futars were said to be controllable only by their handlers, but somehow the honored Matres had managed to tame and control some Futars. Lucilla figures out that the honored Matres somehow make themselves poisonous to Futars. If a Futar attempted to eat one of them, they would taste of bitter burning poison that would scar the inside of the Futar's mouth. Lucilla remains captive for many days and she is interrogated by the Spider Queen several times. As she remains captive, of the Honored Matres, Lucilla begins to feel the coming on of spice withdrawal, which she used the very best of her Bene Gesserit abilities to suppress. The Bene Gesserit had excellent timekeeping abilities, so Lucilla knew exactly how long she had been a prisoner of the Honored Matres. This was just one of the Bene Gesserit abilities that troubled the Honored Matres, for they recognized that the Bene Gesserit skill set was astronomical. How do you know what time it is? Sinking back into her chair, but eyes still flaming. 
All Bene Gesserit have this ability. We can feel the rhythms of any planet after a short time on it. A strange talent. Anyone can do it. A matter of being sensitized. Could I learn this? Orange fading. I said anyone. You're still human, aren't you? A question not yet fully answered. Why do you say you witches have no government? Wants to change the subject. Our abilities worry her. The Honored Matres had powerful skills of their own. For instance, their combat skills surpassed that of the Mini Gesserit. They moved extremely quick, often using their feet to kill. The Honored Matres were extremely aggressive and bound to fits of deadly rage. Lucilla would eventually become the subject of the Great Honored Matre Dama's rage, and it was there that she met her end. I told you not to speak! You dare call me Dama! She was out of her chair in a blur. Lucilla's cage door slammed open with a crash against the wall. Lucilla tried to dodge, but the Shigawai confined her. She did not see the kick that crushed her temple. As she died, Lucilla's awareness was filled with a scream of rage. The horde of Lampadis, venting emotions it had confined for many generations. As Lucilla died, so did the precious lives contained within her mind. If Rebecca failed in her task to re-deliver those inner lives to the Bene Gesserit, then they would be lost forever. Part 6. A Merger of Man and Machine On Chapter House, Audrey begins to use Duncan Idaho as a Mintat. He has also been put in charge of training and eventually reawakening the Gola Miles Tag's memories. He has also forced Audrey to realize that her plan to send individual Bene Gesserit cells would likely be futile. Some on Chapter House consider Odrade's employment of Duncan as exceedingly dangerous. The Reverend Mother Belanda is one of them. Belanda is also a Mintat and believes that it is necessary for Duncan to be eliminated. When Odrade leaves Central on Chapter House, Belanda uses her opportunity. She enters the no-ship with the intent to kill Duncan which she very well would have been capable of doing. She discovers Duncan within a chamber of the No Ship. The Gola Boy Tag is there as well. Hello, Bell. Been expecting you. He touched his console field and the door opened behind him. Young Tag entered and took up a position near Idaho, staring silently at Belanda. Idaho did not invite her to sit or find a chair for her, forcing her to bring one from his sleeping chamber and place it facing him. When she was seated, he turned a look of wary amusement to her. Belanda remained taken aback by his greeting. Why did he expect me? He answered her unspoken question. Dar projected earlier. She told me she was off to see Shiana. I knew you'd waste no time getting to me when she was gone. Simple Mintat projection, or... She warned you. Wrong. What secrets do you and Shiana share? Demanding. She uses me in the way that you want her to use me. The Missionara? Bell, two Mintats together. Must we play these stupid games? Belanda took a deep breath and sought Mintat mode. Not easy under these circumstances. That child staring at her, the amusement on Idaho's face. Idaho calmed himself when he saw that Belanda had entered Mintat mode. He tells her that he has known for quite some time that she has wanted him dead. She realizes then that she has been transparent in her intentions. He explains to her that they have mutual goals. Put yourself in my place, Bell. I'm a Mintat caught not only in your trap, but in that of the Honored Matres. Is that all you are? A Mintat? No, I'm a Tleilaxu experiment, but I don't see the future. I'm not a Kwisatz Haderach. I'm a Mintat with memories of many lives. You with your other memories. Think about the leverage that gives me. By the end, Belanda recognizes the extent of why Odraid valued this Duncan. The God Emperor had reawakened the Gola again and again throughout countless generations for a reason. Belanda's Mintat awareness recognized this. Duncan begins to speak to her of the Ixians and the potential for technological progression within the Scattering. When Leto II died, the human empire expanded exponentially. None could say what strange technology might have risen out of the Scattering. Nothing is out of question in the Scattering, but not within our present capabilities. Do you have something less ambitious? Review the genetic markers in the cells of your people. Look for common patterns in the Atreides' inheritance. There may be talents 
you have not even guessed. Duncan throws much at Belanda at once, even hinting at the genetic patterns which led to Teg's actions on Gamu in the previous book, where he moved faster than the human eye could see. Duncan then suggests that there was a thread of Leto the Second's plan previously unseen. Ixians have not penetrated Holtzman's unification concept, he said. They merely use it, a theory that works even when you don't understand it. Why does he direct my attention to the technocracy of Ix? Ixians had their fingers in too many pies for the Bene Gesserit to trust them. Aren't you curious why the tyrant never suppressed Ix? he asked. And when she continued to stare at him, he only bridled them. He was fascinated by the idea of human and machine inextricably bound to each other, each testing the limits of the other. Cyborgs, among other things. Didn't Idaho know the residue of revulsion left by the Butlerian Jihad, even among the Bene Gesserit? Alarming, the convergence of what each human and machine could do. Considering machine limitations, that was a succinct description of Ixian short-sightedness. Was Idaho saying the tyrant subscribed to the idea of machine intelligence? Foolishness! She turned away from him. Duncan suggests that Leto II believed that the future of mankind was tied to machines. This makes sense considering the God Emperor himself had used many Ixian devices which pushed the bounds of the Butlerian Jihad's limits. The Bene Gesserit initially is averse to this idea. They believe that the Butlerian Jihad left too great a mark on humanity for this to be true. Belanda leaves the no-ship without attempting to harm Duncan. Odrade intends to allow Mirbella to undergo the spice agony in an attempt to become a reverend mother after Mirbella's latest child with Duncan is born. Duncan feared that once Mirbella undertook the agony, that her allegiance to the Bene Gesserit would be complete. She would no longer be his, but a creature of the Sisterhood. Odrade also intended to have Tag's Gola memories awakened very soon through sexual imprintation, which she planned to have Shiana perform. The imprintation would also make him controllable by the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. Odrade meets with Saitel and employs her Bene Gesserit skills in another attempt to gain all of the secrets of the Axolotl tanks. He continues to resist and does not fully trust her, no matter what she does. He continues to demand that he must have his own face dancer servants and Axolotl tanks before he would release his secrets to the Bene Gesserit. During the meeting, Odrade receives a message from Shiana. A spice blow has occurred in the desert of Chapter House. There are thousands of young sandworms. Odrade tells Saitel that the Bene Gesserit have been the shepherds of his prophet. The last remnants of Leto II, the divided god worshipped by the Tleilaxu, were cradled by the Bene Gesserit. Saitel realizes that the Bene Gesserit no longer need his secret of how to produce spice melange within Axolotl tanks. They now have their own continuous supply. The celebration of this victory is cut short, however, when Odrade receives the news that the Bene Gesserit pilot Clarby was mortally injured in a Thopter crash. Odrade knew they could not afford to lose Clarby at this point. Only one option remained, an option which would leave Clarby as something other than human. Duncan had suggested that Leto II believed that humanity's future was inextricably tied to machines, and considering this situation, perhaps he was right. The only thing that would save Clarby would be machine augmentation. The thought of it made the sisters of the Bene Gesserit shudder, considering the Butlerian Jihad. The drastic times, however, called for drastic measures. Clarby would become the Bene Gesserit's first ever cyborg. First the axolotl tanks, now this. Necessity said they could not afford to lose specialists of Clarby's caliber. They had few enough as it was. Spread thin did not describe it. Gaps were appearing. Cyborg Clarby though, and that was the opening wedge. The souks were prepared, a precautionary arrangement should it be required for someone irreplaceable such as Mother Superior. Cyborg was one of those potpourri words, too. Where did mechanical additions to human flesh become dominant? When was the cyborg no longer human? Temptations intensified. Just this one little adjustment, and so easy to adjust until the potpourri human becomes unquestioningly obedient. But Clarby? 
conditions of extremists said, Cyborg him. Was the sisterhood that desperate? She was forced to answer in the affirmative. Odraid knew that no objection from any other sister in the sisterhood could change anything once she had made her decision. Whatever she chose, the sisterhood would follow. The Butlerian Jihad had been fought and won. Now a new conflict began, but Odraid knew that they had no one to replace Clerby. She made the decision to cyborg him. A merger of man and machine. Part 7. The Two Sisterhoods Collide Odraid knew that in order for the Bene Gesserit to survive, it needed to change its ways, and she knew that Mirbella could potentially be the one to guide them into that change. The Bene Gesserit were slaves of habit, and habits had predictable patterns. She knew that this was how the Ardent Matres would eventually locate them. Pride. That was what Odraid saw when she looked at her sisters and their places. Dignity was only a mask, no real humility. Instead, there was this visible conformity, a true Bene Gesserit pattern that, in a society aware of the peril in patterns, sounded a warning klaxon. Mirbella will soon undergo the spice agony and is at a crossroads. She is caught in between her love and obsession for Duncan Idaho and her loyalty to the Bene Gesserit. Mirbella knew that her love for Duncan was in a way a prison, but she was incapable of letting go. Odraid knows that the Duncan Idaho Gola has been attempting to undermine them in the mind of Marbella, prompting her to study the life of Jessica, who thousands of years ago had betrayed the sisterhood, leading to the eventual birth of the tyrant Leto II. Duncan had prompted Marbella to study Jessica's life, hoping to thwart us. Hollows of his performance had ignited severe analysis of records. An interesting person, Odraid said. Love, after all of your teaching, your conditioning. You did not think her behavior treasonous? Never. Delicately now. But look at the consequences. A quiz at Tatarak. And that grandchild, the tyrant. Argument dear to Belanda's heart. Golden path, Mirbella said. Survival of humankind. Famine times and the scattering. Are you watching this, Bell? No matter. You will watch. Honored Matres, Mirbella said. All because of Jessica? But Jessica returned to the fold and lived out her years on Caladan. Teacher of acolytes. Example to them as well. See what happens when you defy us. Defy us, Mirbella. Do it more adroitly than Jessica. Odraid had suspected long ago that the Bene Gesserit were wrong in their denouncement of love. Even so, Odraid knew that for Mirbella, to truly become a sister of the Bene Gesserit, she would have to let go of Duncan. The Bene Gesserit is all to a reverend mother. You will never be able to forget that. As quickly as it had come, the dream sensation passed. Mother Superior's next words were cold and immediate. Prepare for more advanced training. Until you meet the agony, live or die. When the time comes, Shiana attempts to use sexual imprintation to unblock the memories of Miles Tag's Gola, but it goes slightly wrong. When the attempt is made, Tag's memories are reawakened, but his long-dead mother, who had been a sister of the Bene Gesserit herself, had taught Tag Bene Gesserit secrets, and also through the method of hypno-induction was able to prevent the imprintation of her son. She had done this without the knowledge of the sisterhood. His memories were reawakened, but he would be no controllable pawn of the sisterhood, not in the way they'd hoped. Tag had always been loyal to the Bene Gesserit, however, and they did not expect that to change. Once his memories had been restored, Odraid asked him the question she had been waiting to ask all this time. What exactly had occurred on Gamu, the day he set the wrath of the Honored Matres upon them? Had he truly become a blurred specter of death, moving faster than the eye could see? I cannot explain what happened to me on Gamu. My physical and mental speed defies explanation. Given the size and energy, in one of your heartbeats I could be clear of this room and well on my way out of the ship. Oh, hand upraised. I'm still your obedient dog. I'll do what you require, but perhaps not in the way you imagine. Odraid saw consternation in the faces of her sisters. What have I loosed upon us? We can prevent any living thing from leaving this ship, she said. You may be fast, but I doubt you are faster than the fire that would engulf you should you try to leave without our permission. I will leave in my own good time and with your permission. 
Teg, now reawakened with the skills of the Bashar, comes up with the tactical plan to defuse the Honored Matres before they locate Chapter House. Odraid arranges a meeting with the Honored Matres on the world of Junction, a former spacing guild world in the Gamu star system. In true Bene Gesserit fashion, they have managed to convince the Honored Matres that the place of meeting had been their own idea. They will meet in 100 standard days. The Sisterhood believed that the Matres had chosen to wait so long so that they could reinforce their defenses on Junction. The Honored Matres have promised Odraid safe passage in and out of Junction, but they are not to be trusted as they have shown no honor even in diplomatic situations. Dortujla, who had been sent to organize this meeting with the Honored Matres, now looked as though she had been tortured, and they had killed the other sisters in her party. They conducted experiments on me, but that's not important. The arrangements are. For what it's worth, they promise you safe passage in and out of Junction. Don't believe it. You are allowed a small entourage of servants, no more than five. Assume they will kill everyone who accompanies you, although I may have taught them the error in that. Dortujla tells Odraid of what she had seen of the Futars, the humanoid creatures that the Honored Matre seemed to keep as pets. The creatures have very simple speech and did not seem to be as intelligent as humans. The Honored Matres had fed the bodies of her sisters to the Futars. A Futar came to the bars of its cage after their banquet? It looked at the Spider Queen and it screamed. I have never heard such a sound. Chilling. Every honored Matre in that room froze, and I swear to you they were terrified. Shiana touched Dortujla's arm. A predator immobilizing its prey? Undoubtedly. The Futars appeared surprised that it did not freeze me. Sometime after Mirbella's child is born, she finally undergoes the spice agony, and afterward Duncan can sense that Mirbella is pulling away from him. Mirbella is an honored Matre, and yet she is also Bene Gesserit. Within her, the two sisterhoods are joined and merged. Mirbella's purpose had grown beyond Duncan, and to some degree, they both knew it. Part 8. The Battle of Junction Before leaving for Junction, Odraid addressed the entire sisterhood one last time. Actions have been taken that require me to meet on Junction with Honored Matre leadership, a meeting from which I may not emerge alive. I probably will not survive. That meeting will be partly distraction. We are about to punish them." Odraid waited for murmurs to subside, hearing both agreement and disagreement in the sounds. Interesting. The ones who agreed were closer to the stage and farther back among new acolytes. Disagreement from advanced acolytes? Yes, they knew the warning. We dare not feed that fire. She pitched her voice lower, letting remotes carry it to those in the high tiers. Before leaving, I will share with more than one sister. These times require such caution. Your plan! What will you do? Questions were shouted at her from many places. We will faint at Gamu. That should drive the Honored Matre allies to Junction. We then will take Junction, and I hope to capture the Spider Queen. Odraid gives details of her plan to the Sisterhood. Bashar Miles Teg will lead the attack in disguised ships equipped with lace guns. Odraid, on the ground, will transmit her observations to her attackers. They plan to englobe Junction with the devices designed by Duncan Idaho. They would reveal the location of Honored Matre no ships. No one knows, however, that Miles Tag has the ability to see hidden no ships, even without technology. It was part of what had awakened in him on Gamu when the Honored Matres tortured him in the book Heretics of Doom. Duncan himself would remain on the no ship on Chapter House during the attack. The Bene Gesserit sisters Tam and Dortujla would accompany Odraid on Junction. The other sisters of the Bene Gesserit were eager to know who she had chosen to share memories with before she leaves. This is the most pressing political question because after she dies, one of those people would become Mother Superior of the Bene Gesserit. Odraid announces that she has chosen both Mirbella and Shiana to share her memories. Proctors form little consulting groups, shouting suggestions from group to group, but no names were submitted. Someone had a question, though. Why Mirbella? Who knows Honored Matres better? Odraid asked. That silenced them. Mirbella would be present during the attack on Junction as well. Her job would be to discover the Honored Matres' Achilles' heel. After sharing with both Mirbella and Shiana, 
Mirbella was Odraid's personal choice. But if this venture to Junction failed, then Shiana would still be a potent candidate. Odraid knew that if her plan in fact did fail, then the survivors in the Sisterhood, if there were any, would hold her in contempt. When Odraid finally arrived on Junction, there could be no mistaking that it was in fact a former guild world. It seemed to have been changed little since the Honored Matres came to rule it. So this was like other Junction planets. Somewhere in guild records there doubtless was a serial number and code for it. So long under guild control before the Honored Matres that in these first moments of debarking, getting their ground legs, everything around them could be seen to have that special guild flavor. Even the playing field, designed for outdoor meetings of navigators in their giant containers of melange gas. The buildings of the world wrapped around space in a way that conserved the maximum amount of energy. The paths of the world were direct and there were very few sidewalks and no plants. There was a dull grayness and the place was compounded with Ixian technology. For the guild, endurance was preferred to luxury or eye appeal. Odraid was piloted down to the surface of the world by the now cyborg Clarby. The pilot touched a yellow field on his board, just the way the Basha said they would. A gloating sound in his voice. He lifted the hood off his head and turned. Odraid was shocked. Cyborg! The face was a metal mask with two glittering silver balls for eyes. We enter dangerous ground. They didn't tell you, he asked. Waste no pity. I was dead, and this gave me life. It's Clareby, Mother Superior. And when I die this time, that will buy me life as a Gola. Odraid is taken in by the Honored Matres on Junction, while at the same time Miles Tegg leads the assault against the Honored Matre forces, attacking the world of Gamu with tremendous force. During this time, the secret sect of Jews hidden away on Gamu took refuge within the Bene Gesserit forces. Marbella immediately recognized Rebecca, the woman who Lucilla had shared memories with before dying, as a Wild Reverend Mother. Marbella made an instant identification. A Wild Reverend Mother. Not since Dune's Fremen days had one of these been known. Rebecca carried with her all the lives of Lampetus, precious cargo. She shares her mind with Mirbella. The Battle of Junction would be the last conflict between the Bene Gesserit and the Honored Matres. On the world of Junction, Odraid comes face to face with the great Honored Matre, the Spider Queen herself, though the woman was not quite as Odraid had expected. Spider Queen's appearance was more than a surprise. Until this moment, no physical description of her had ever been achieved by the Bene Gesserit, only temporary projections, imaginative constructs based on scattered bits of evidence. Here she was, finally, a small woman, expected stringy muscles visible under red leotards beneath her robe, face a forgettable oval with bland brown eyes, orange flecks dancing in them. During the meeting, however, the great honored Matre Dama is poisoned by one of her own, Lagno who then takes over as the Great Honored Matre herself. She intends to activate the Honored Matre's hidden weapon. Technology brought forth out of the scattering, a powerful weapon of bloodless death. I am not Lagno's target, not yet. She has taken this opportunity to make her bid for power. There was no need to look at Dama. The moment of the Spider Queen's death was visible on Lagno's face. Turning, Odraid confirmed it. Dama laid in a heap under being unknown. You will call me Great Honored Matre, Lagno said, and you will learn to thank me for it. She, pointing at the red heap on the balcony corner, intended to betray you and exterminate your people. I have other plans. I am not one to destroy a useful weapon at the moment of our greatest need. With Tag's tactical skills at full use, they are able to gain control of the star system, and Bene Gesserit victory seems certain. They realize all too late that they have walked into a trap, as the Honored Matres release their weapon of bloodless death, altering the course of the battle. Odraid is captured. Part 9. Mirbella's Purpose. Shiana's Escape. Mirbella and the others are alerted to the fact that the Honored Matres have taken Odraid, but they do not know what is to come. The weapon kills without touching. It kills without gore. The Bene Gesserit have never seen its like before. When he returned to his examination of the scene, he saw another disturbing thing, a basic oddity his eyes had tried to report. Very little blood on those fallen figures in Bene Gesserit uniforms. You expected battle casualties to show that ultimate evidence of common humanity, flowing red, 
that darkened on exposure, but always left its indelible mark in the memories of those who saw it. Lack of bloody carnage was an unknown, and in warfare, unknown had a history of bringing extreme peril. He spoke softly to Odraid. They have a weapon we have not discovered. Odraid, however, had given Mirbella instructions for a last desperate gamble should their attack go wrong. Mirbella does what she can to save as many Bene Gesserit soldiers as she possibly can, as the Honored Matres unleash their weapon. The survivors set a course for Chapter House, while she then pilots a shuttle down to the surface of the World Junction. She announces herself to the others as an Honored Matre, claiming to have escaped the Sisterhood. Mirbella is brought to the Great Honored Matre, Lagno, and uses this opportunity to tempt her into rage. Mirbella's plan works, and Lagno attacks Mirbella, but Mirbella is far too quick. She kills Lagno at striking speed. After the commotion Odraid is seeing lying on the floor. As Odraid lies dying, having been mortally wounded by the Honored Matres, Mirbella shares memories with her, one final time. Examining the scene without breathing hard, to show how easy it was, sisters. Mirbella experienced a sense of shock and recognition of the inevitable. Odraid lay on the floor in front of Elpik, who obviously had chosen sides without hesitation. The twisted position of Odraid's neck and flaccid appearance of her body said she was dead. She tried to interfere, Elpik said. Having killed a reverend mother, Elpik expected Mirbella, a sister after all, to applaud, but Mirbella did not react as expected. She knelt beside Odraid, put her head against that of the corpse. Staying there an interminable time, the surviving honored matres exchanged questioning looks, but dared not move. What is this? They were immobilized by Mirbella's terrifying abilities. When she had Odraid's recent past, all of the new added to previous sharing, Mirbella stood. Odraid, as Teraza, Lucilla, and many others throughout the millennia had done, had given her life for the sisterhood. A part of her would always remain within Mirbella, warning her and guiding her down the right path. Perhaps some bit of Sea Child would remain as well. The Matres, awed by Mirbella's fierceness and power, have no choice but to accept her as their leader, as is the way of the honored Matres. But the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood is divided on their acceptance of Mirbella as their leader. Mirbella essentially has made the first step in the joining together of the two sisterhoods. She was both Honored Matre and Bene Gesserit, and because of it, the sisterhood would never be the same. They would not be Bene Gesserit, they would not be Honored Matre, but something else. Back on Chapter House, Shiana's plan has come to full fruition. Joined by Duncan Idaho, she escaped on the no ship before Mirbella had a chance to stop them. They take with them the young Miles Teg, Saitel, carrying the DNA of Paul Atreides, Jessica, and others, and the sect of Jews. But as they make their escape, they encounter again those Duncan had seen in his visions. Part 10. The Ones of Many Faces Shiana and Duncan had escaped on the no ship, or so they thought. They did not know that the others were still watching. The man and the woman Duncan had seen through the net. It is not clear who these two are, or what their purpose is, but Duncan had seen them many times. This is where it always happened to him. Will it happen today? Without warning, the sense of being in the great hold would vanish, then the net shimmering in a molten sky. He was aware when the vision came that he was not really seeing a net. His mind translated what the senses could not define, a shimmering net, undulating like an infinite borealis. In the vision, Idaho saw what he could only describe as a net, but he could not exactly say what it was or where it was. Through the net, he would eventually see a man and woman dressed in old clothing. How ordinary they appeared, and yet extraordinary. A grandmother and grandfather in antique clothing, bib coveralls for the man, and a long dress with headscarf for the woman working in a flower garden. Idaho knew that during their time in the scattering, the honored Matres had been hunted by some power in the far reaches of the cosmos. He knew that the couple were likely to be face dancers, who over their time in the scattering had become independent of the Tleilaxu masters. 
Using his Mintat skills, Duncan projected that a Tleilaxu group and the Scattering must have engaged in genetic alteration, creating the Futars, the human-feline hybrids brought out of the Scattering by the Honored Matres. The two he had witnessed in the vision could be the ones who had created the Futars. Futars, of course, had the ability to seek out and destroy Honored Matres. They could use their voice to immobilize and render them defenseless. Throughout the book, Chapter House Doom, the Matres continue to reference a mysterious group they encountered in the Scattering, known as the Ones of Many Faces. And it was also implied that the Ones of Many Faces had in fact been the ones who had created the Futars as a weapon against the Matres. And the Ones of Many Faces cursed them through eternity had caused the disaster, them and their Futars. The Ones of Many Faces are almost certainly the remnants of free Tleilaxu face dancers. And these two who had attempted to trap the inhabitants of the no-ship are obviously representatives of them. They called themselves Daniel and Marty. You deliberately let them get away, Daniel. The old woman rubbed her hands down the stained front of her garden apron. It was a summer morning around her, flowers blooming, birds calling from nearby trees. There was a misty look to the sky, a yellow radiance near the horizon. Now, Marty, it was not deliberate, Daniel said. He took off his pork pie hat and rubbed the bushy stubble of gray hair before replacing the hat. He surprised me. I knew he saw us, but I didn't suspect he saw the net. And I had such a nice planet picked out for them, Marty said. One of the best, a real test of their abilities. Daniel said that he never thought Idaho actually saw the net. The usage of the term net itself further indicates that some kind of trap was being set and it seems that the inhabitants of the no-ship at the end of Chapter House just barely escaped. The one called Marty mentions that they had intended to test their abilities, and that they had a planet picked out for them, implying that to these two, the events of the Doom Saga have simply been some great experiment. How long have these two been watching? How long have they been there? The fact that Daniel and Marty are able to watch Idaho and his companions, the nature of their vessel, and the fact that they had planned to test them suggests that these two possess technology far greater than any seen in the novels prior to this point. The fact that Daniel and Marty are face dancers of the Scattering who had freed themselves continues to be heavily implied in this passage as well. They had a Tleilaxu master with them too. I saw him when they went under the net. I would have so liked to study another master. Don't see why. Always whistling at us. Always making it necessary to stump them down. I don't like treating masters that way and you know it. If it weren't for them. They aren't gods, Daniel. Neither are we. I still think you let them escape. You are so anxious to prune your roses. What would you have said to the master anyway? Daniel asked. I was going to joke when he asked who we were. They always ask that. I was going to say... What did you expect? God himself with a flowing beard? Daniel chuckled. That would have been funny. They have such a hard time accepting that face dancers can be independent of them. I don't see why. It's a natural consequence. They gave us the power to absorb the memories and experiences of other people. Gather enough of those and... It's personas we take, Marty. Whatever. The Master should have known that we would gather enough of them one day to make our own decisions about our future. And theirs? Daniel and Marty became independent of their Tleilaxu Masters after absorbing enough memories. As the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood can share the memories of others, so can the Face Dancers. But these Face Dancers had absorbed the memories of numerous Bene Gesserit Sisters even, which would mean that they may possess more knowledge than any single Reverend Mother. For eons, the face dancers had been the slave class of the Tleilaxu. Somewhere in the scattering, this pattern had broken. The insouciant nature of the couple's behavior implies that they are detached from what is happening in the main Dune story. They appear to have been doing whatever it is that they are doing for quite a long time. Have they tested other children of humanity throughout the universe in this manner? If so, how many? And if they are indeed as powerful as they seem, they will undoubtedly catch up with the no-ship. And when they do, what might they have planned for the inhabitants? Chapter House ends as Daniel and Marty watch as the no-ship makes its escape through space. Part 11. The Lessons of Chapter House In this novel, the Sisterhood contends with problems from within and without. 
much of it set in motion by the God Emperor Leto II. The God Emperor had indeed been prescient. The Sisterhood did not deny it. It was Odraid's view, however, that Leto II didn't predict the future so much as he created it. He had looked into the possible futures, chose what he saw fit, and then locked them on that path. The rabbi of the secret Jewish sect seems to possess a similar position to Odraid, saying this, He had Satan's own powers. I share their fear of that. He was not so much prescient as he was a cement. He fixed the shape of what he saw. Of course, the God Emperor of Dune, in his mind, subjected the universe to thousands of years of tyrannical rule in order to save them from themselves, teaching them a lesson of why it is a bad idea for a society to put itself in a position where it can be ruled by a centralized leader. One of the key arguments in the Dune series, which becomes clear in God Emperor of Dune, and is emphasized in Chapter House Dune, is an argument against centralized bureaucracy. It is making an argument that bureaucracies always become aristocracies, after they attain commanding power. Chapter House Dune uses the Honored Matres as an example. They had once been the Bene Gesserit. 1500 years earlier, splinter cells of the Sisterhood were sent off into the Abyss, never to return. The necessity for survival in the scattering must have brought on certain changes within the groups. It was known amongst the Bene Gesserit that if you delegate too heavily, only to the same people, you fell into bureaucracy. This is why no one was replaceable within the Sisterhood, not even Mother Superior. This must have changed within the scattering, reduced numbers leading to a dependency on fewer individuals, planting the seeds for the formation of bureaucracy. The Honored Matres had arisen from an autocratic bureaucracy. The early Honored Matres had, according to the Honored Matres history given to the Bene Gesserit by Marbella, conducted experiments over their populations, researched to gain sexual dominance over the ones they ruled over when taxation became overwhelming to those they governed. They developed the belief that they had the right to rule. The ultimate flaw in a top-heavy bureaucracy was that the bureaucracy becomes its own inhuman entity. It expands well beyond the capacity of the system to maintain itself. A top-heavy bureaucracy, the electric cannot touch always expands to the system's limits of energy. Steal it from the aged, from the retired, from anyone, especially from those we once called the middle class, because that is where most of the energy originates. The Bene Gesserit knew the flaw in bureaucracy, because other memory had shown them the truth of it. But the Honored Matres long ago had lost the Bene Gesserit power of other memory. The Bene Gesserit knew that hierarchical bureaucratic systems were always in danger not because absolute power corrupts absolutely, but because power attracted the corruptible. The Bene Gesserit being the ultimate pragmatist say conservatism is akin to death. Continued growth, progress, and evolution were necessary, certainly where laws were concerned. Yet we believe there is a morality above any law which must stand watchdog on all attempts at unchanging regulation. Odraid further emphasizes this point. Honored Matres have forgotten that clinging to any form of conservatism can be dangerous, Odraid said. Have we forgotten it as well? They continued to stare at her, but they had heard. Become too conservative, and you are unprepared for surprises. That was what Muad'Dib had taught them, and his tyrant son had made the lesson forever unforgettable. An authoritarian, conservative, bureaucratic system such as the one in which the honored Matres evolved would also stagnate scientific progress. Science must be innovative. It brings change. That's why science and bureaucracy fight a constant war. When the Bene Gesserit discovered that the Ixians had aligned themselves with the Honored Matres, they came to the realization that Ix was dying. The Ixians believed that political and economic requirements determined permissible research. Mark them well. They are the products of a dying society. It is naive to expect any bureaucracy to take brilliant innovations and put them to good use. When bureaucracies were put in charge of such systems, they considered things such as who would be blamed for potential problems? Will the structure of power be shifted? Will jobs be cost? Will some other governmental department become more important? Politics blocks the way of science. The motives of bureaucracy are in direct opposition to the need for adapting to change. Adaptability is a prime requirement for life to survive. The Honored Matres could not see how their system was ultimately destructive to them and the ones they governed they disregarded the truth. To them, their right to rule 
was everything. It did not appear to Audrey that these women insisted on such a right. No, they assumed their rightness must never be questioned. Never. No decisions wrong. Disregard consequences. It never happened. And here lies one of the most fundamental differences between the Bene Gesserit and the Honored Matres. The first rule of the Bene Gesserit democracy was no laws restricting juries. The Honored Matres operated under a policy of a right to rule. And that is why, even if they had succeeded in destroying the Bene Gesserit, they never could have maintained rule over the old empire and ultimately would have died off themselves. Part 12, and into Doom. Frank Patrick Herbert Jr. was born October 8, 1920, and died on February 11, 1986. Chapter House Dune had been intended to be the penultimate novel in what would have been a seven-part Dune saga. He died before he had the chance to complete his magnum opus. Even so, Frank Herbert's impact on the science fiction genre has been enormous. Countless science fiction works have been inspired by and borrowed from the Dune Saga. Nearly five years ago, I invited you all to explore the Dune Saga with me, as I created the most comprehensive breakdown of the Dune Saga on the internet. I wanted to share my love for the saga with the world. I wanted people to feel what I felt when I first read Frank Herbert's incredible books. Over the last five years, my audience and the Dune fandom has grown tremendously, and I couldn't be more grateful. If you like the music in this video, then you can check out the full album by James Dahl, linked in the description. All of the music in this video was created specifically for this ultimate guide to Chapter House Dune. You can go check out the Chapter House Dune album and all of the other incredible music that he's made for this channel over on his channel, link in the description. Thanks everyone so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed going on this Dune journey with me. And if you haven't already, check out all the other Dune videos that I have in my Dune lore playlist on my channel.